Good morning and welcome to today's virtual open day. I am Tom from the communications team and thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to guide you around Kiel virtually. Uh, so first things first, we'll get everyone up to speed and make sure you've got all of the right links for today to make sure you get the most out of today's virtual open day. So if you signed up for today's virtual open day, hopefully you've received an email this morning uh, with all of the information in it. But if you haven't, it's not too late to sign up. You just head to keel.ac.uk forward slash open days and you'll find this page here. And if you scroll down, uh, you'll see that today's open day, the Saturday, the 14th of August is still there and you can still book your place onto that open day as well. So click on that link, you'll fill in a quick form and then you should get sent all of the information via email. Now, just to say, today's open day is uh, information for those looking to enter Kiel in 2022. But if you are here and you're still looking for a place through clearing and you're looking to enter through September 2021, this September, uh, lots of the information today will be really, really useful. So uh, feel free to stick around and make the most out of today's virtual event. Um, there's just a slight difference in your hub pages, which I'll go through in just a minute. So for those who signed up for today's open day, in your email, you'll find the applicant hub page, which is um, here. And this just houses all of the information um, with links throughout the day to all of the live events happening and all of the pre-recorded talks as well. Um, and this is the only difference. So if you're September 2022, this is the page for you. Uh, here's all the information for you. But if you're looking to start this September, there's a slight difference in links. So if you go to keel.ac.uk forward slash applicant hub 2021, all one word, that's keel.ac.uk forward slash applicant hub 2021. And you'll just find this year's information as well. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, if not, drop a message in the chat and, and one of the team will be happy to help you. Uh, if you're Again, if you're looking to start in 2021, uh, we can point you in the right direction. But again, information will be relevant to both. Um, there's just some very slight differences. So this is the Applicant Hub page. And if you scroll down, there's lots of useful uh, information on here. And again, don't feel like you have to get through all of this information today. There's, there'll be a lots and lots happening today, um, but this page will stay live uh, for at least the next seven days. So you can come back and watch from the talks in your own time. Uh, there's a welcome from our professor, um, our vice chancellor, Professor Trevor McMillan. You can watch that. Uh, and then we're split into three different sections today. So we've got our, our live uh, events happening. So it's not just live here on Facebook and YouTube. We're also live um, in Teams as well for some other subject talks. Uh, we've also got general information talks, which are pre-recorded, on-demand talks that you can watch in your own time, and then also the virtual tour. So first of all, let's have a look at general information talks. Uh, and on this page, there's just some great, lots of great talks and information around areas such as accommodation, careers and employability, global opportunities, international students. So just to have a browse through this page in your own time because there's loads and loads of good information uh, to get more insight into what it's like to be a student at Kiel. But the thing to make the most of today is the live talks because again, these are live and happening today, uh, which you can get involved in and ask questions and have them answered uh, straight away by uh, myself or Georgina and wh whoever else joins us on stream today, uh, or in your subject specific talks by an academic or member of staff at Kiel. So if you're interested in a subject, you can find all of the live talks taking place today on this page here. So if I'm interested in nursing, I can see that they have a live talk at one till two, uh, and then also at half 10 till half 11, and you can join them there. Live talks take place on Microsoft Teams. Don't worry if you've not got an account, you can join as an authenticated user, which is just a guest. Uh, you'll still be able to ask questions and make the most out of um, those live streams as well. So you don't need a Teams account. If you have got one, great. You'll join, uh, you'll join as an authenticated user um, to those. So either way, you should be able to make it into those live talks. Then we've also got the virtual tour, which is uh, here on the page. And this is just a self-guided virtual tour around Kiel. Uh, so you click, let's get started. And this is split into four different areas. You've got our academic expertise and Kiel investments, Kiel campus and student life, accommodation, and then also facilities as well. So if I go on Kiel campus and student life, I can take uh, a tour around campus myself. Uh, so let's look, let's look at Kiel Hall first. And in this tour, there's just lots of 360 photographs. There's lots of still photographs, videos, and, and other information that pop up as well throughout the tour. So that's great because you can do it in your own time and that's available 24 seven. So that's virtualtour.keel.ac.uk and have a self-guided virtual tour around Kiel. And then also the most invaluable resource is keel.ac.uk forward slash chat. And this is our Unibuddy page and it's where you can chat to staff and students one-to-one -one and ask them any questions about life at Kiel. You pop in your level of study, Pop in your area of study, 
let's go for today. Let's go for psychology. Um, and I can chat to Nadia uh, and talk about anything to do with life at Kiel. I can also do the same for staff. So I can look for um, people in different roles across the university, even chat, chat to some of the lecturers. And you never know, you might actually be, eventually be taught by some of the people you, you chat to on Unibuddy. Um, so it's really, really useful to just have a one-to-one -one conversation with someone on there. And there's also some great blogs as well uh, with lots of tips if you're looking to come to university, tips on revising, um, finding accommodation. Uh, and these blogs are all written by students as well. So it's really, really useful. So that's keel.ac.uk forward slash chat. So that's all of the information that you should have had uh, via email. And then on stream today, we'll have a look at what, what what's taking place for us. So let's have a look at our schedule, which is here. Now we're starting off today at quarter past nine um, with our live Q&A, and that's for international students. So if you're an international student uh, looking to come to Kiel, 9.15 is for you. And then we start our accommodation tours at 9.45. First of all is our Barnes accommodation tour. And the way the accommodation accommodation tours will work is it will be myself, a student who's uh, lived or knows that accommodation block uh, well. They'll be touring us around and then also be joined by one of our members of staff from the accommodation team who can answer any of those questions that you have around pricing, what to bring, what not to bring, uh, all that sort of stuff. Then at 10.30, we go to support at Keel live Q&A. 11 o'clock, we have our other opportunities at Keel Live Q&A. At 11.30, we have our second accommodation tour, which is Lindsay. Then at 12 o'clock, we have our student money live Q&A. At 12.30, we've got our Horwood accommodation tour. At 12.55, we've got our careers and employability live Q&A. At 1.25, we have our Holy Cross and the Oaks accommodation tour. And then at 1.50, we're gonna take a, a tour around our beautiful campus and we'll start at the top of campus. We'll have a walk around from start to finish. Basically, we'll see pretty much all of campus and that'll be guided by some ambassadors as well. So we'll have a look around pretty much all of our campus virtually. And then finally today, uh, we wrap up um, with at 2.50, our social life at Keel live Q&A, and then at 3.20, our chat to our students live Q&A. And that's an open Q&A with some of our students at Keel uh, to ask any questions that maybe didn't get answered previously in the stream or just any new questions that you've thought of as we go through today. So we are live, we're live until uh, around about 4 p.m. So please do make the most um, of everyone who comes on the stream today. It's great to see some of you saying hi in the chat. Hello to everyone who said hi. Um, please do keep commenting. The chats is, is your place to ask the questions. So make use of them, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, wherever is easiest for you. Pop up any questions you've got in the chat as we go through today's stream. And whoever is hosting, it'll either be myself or G Georgina, who's going to be joining us in a second for that international, um, international students live Q&A. We'll ask them to whoever's on stream at that point um, and hopefully get those answered for you. So the chat is your space to ask questions. So make, make use of us throughout the day um, and hopefully you'll enjoy what we've got on offer. But first things first, I'm going to hand over to Professor Trevor McMillan, who's going to tell us a little bit more about life at Kiel. Hello and a very warm welcome to Kiel University. I'm Trevor McMillan and I have the great privilege of being the Vice Chancellor here. Thank you for taking the time to visit our site today. We do recognise how big a decision it is for you to choose your university. I want to just spend a few minutes giving you some of the background about the university before you get into that detail. Kiel is built around academic excellence and a fantastic student experience sits alongside world-class research in a combination that you won't see in all universities. We were formed in 1949 as a university with a very strong focus on innovative education and a strong student experience. And that was to sit in a university with a very clear social conscience that addresses research that is important to society. We are also a university that has a strong sense of community, as well as having an important role in the communities outside the university that we partner with, both locally and indeed around the world. You can imagine that when we were formed, it was important that the university rose to the challenge of needing to support students in very uncertain times, providing opportunities for students from all backgrounds and preparing them for a rapidly changing employment situation where the number and nature of the jobs available wasn't clear. Our predecessors did take on that challenge and it is a legacy that we hold onto very strongly and it's probably more relevant now than it has been at any point since that post-war period. We strive for a very student-centered approach to our education, 
and that has been reflected in strong performance in assessments of our teaching, including gold in the Teaching Excellence Framework, an unparalleled performance in the National Student Survey over nearly a decade, and graduate employment figures that show that the vast majority of our students get jobs that do require a degree level education. Within the campus, we have done a lot in recent years to enhance our facilities. Recent examples include over 400 new bedrooms, a new home for the Kiel Business School, an extension to our medical school, a new vet school is currently under construction, and we've invested heavily in new teaching laboratories for the sciences, including the David Attenborough Laboratories, and it was a great pleasure to see Sir David on campus last year to open those facilities. While he was here, we talked a lot with Sir David about Kiel's approach to the environment and sustainability, in which we have, for example, turned our campus into a living laboratory to evaluate new ways to both generate and to use energy. We've recently ranked in the top 25 in the world in a global world rankings table looking at the green agenda. Creating a sustainable future is one of the key global challenges that we are addressing here. That is alongside, for example, social inclusion and global health. You can see the relevance of all of this to the current specific challenge we are all facing at the moment. And Kiel has responded in a variety of ways to address this. From looking at the biology of COVID-19 to the social implications of the pandemic, from the work our staff and students have done in the NHS to the production of hand sanitizer in our laboratories, we truly have had a big impact in the last few months. The pandemic has also brought out innovation that I mentioned earlier in order to continue to deliver our courses safely, but with social distancing in place. That will be using a blend of digital and in-person learning in line with our published five-stage plan. The last few months have emphasised even more than usual to me how much effort we put into supporting our students when things get a bit tough. And I have to say that it is one of the things that I am proudest of about Kiel. When students do have difficulties, whether with their health, with finances, relationships or other things, we have many ways in which we can help. We have excellent support teams in the university and the student union, as well as, for example, a medical practice and a pharmacy on campus. Ultimately, our ambition for you is that you stand out from the crowd and go on to be successful and make a real contribution to society. A degree at Kiel won't just give you a certificate, but countless other skills needed to succeed and to stand out in your chosen field. Our degrees are designed to make sure that you have breadth as well as depth in your knowledge. And we help our students prepare for employment in all sorts of ways, including by providing volunteering opportunities or placements and internships, some of which are within our integrated science and innovation park here on the Kiel campus. It might seem like a long way off, but your graduation will come upon you all too quickly and we will make sure that you are as prepared as you can be for whatever comes next for you. And the 100,000 alumni we have around the world will provide a network that you will always be part of as an integral part of the Kiel community. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this. We hope that you will get to visit our beautiful campus in person soon. But in the meantime, you can hear what our students say about studying at Kiel, chat to our academics, and find out everything you need to know at our virtual open day today. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to this live Q&A session for international students running as part of today's virtual open day. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm George and I'm really pleased to be joined by Jackie and Basant for this session. We're going to be here for the next 20 minutes or so to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, just before we get started, a quick note to say that neither Facebook or YouTube streams are restricted today and you will be able to go back afterwards uh, and re-watch this content, so, so nothing to worry about there. Um, before we get started, I'll just hand over to Jackie and then Basant to introduce themselves. So over to you, Jackie. Hi, thanks, George. Uh, I'm Jackie McIntosh and I'm based in the international office. So um, I'm here to answer any questions you have for being an international student, any about how to apply, the scholarships that we have, those types of questions. So happy to help. Thanks, Jackie. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Basant and I come from Egypt and I'm happy to answer any of your uh, questions about how my life is as an international student and how I had to cope with everything. 
Thanks, both. Thanks. So, Basant, we'll come to you first, but just before we do, just um, a quick shout out to Zara, who's who's watching us on YouTube, who has accepted her place to study at Keele through Clearing. So, um, not quite sure what to expect. Um, so, hopefully, you're going to grab uh, loads of information from these sessions um, and get a really good idea of how we do things here at Keele. Um, so, Basant, let's start with you. Um, could you perhaps tell us a little bit about the course that you're studying and perhaps your journey to sort of Keele and what made you choose Keele in the first place? Yeah, sure. So I'm studying medicine and uh, for me, Kiel was a very attractive choice because of the small cohorts, especially in medicine because compared to other unis, our, our cohorts quite small, we're only like 150. But when I came here also to do my interview, one of the fir first things that attracted me was the fact that how, how diverse Kiel is. Like a lot of people don't expect it, but that Kiel is actually very diverse. You see a lot of different cultures, a lot of different backgrounds, even a lot of international students. So I remember the person who was the student ambassador who was giving us the tour was Canadian. And it was pretty surprising for me because I didn't expect it at all. I thought everyone's going to be British. Um, but yeah, I met quite a lot of international students on the tour, on the open day tour. Um, and that attracted me as well as the campus. The campus is quite greenery and as they say, it's the Kiel bubble. Everyone knows everyone's like a little community. It gave me that sense of community and I felt like I'd be, it'd be home away from home. That's literally what it felt like. Brill, brill. And Basant, we've had a question from Rosie. Uh, you just obviously spoke about the campus and that, that was sort of one of the things that drew you to Kiel. Rosie's just asking, do you enjoy the greenery at Kiel and have you got any favourite spots on campus? Oh, definitely. Cam the campus is quite green and it's got a lot of beautiful scenery. But my favourite place, as well as a lot of people, is definitely Kiel Hall. It's so beautiful and it has like eight lakes, so <laughs> you can't get enough of it. But there are also some little spots here and there, like the Lindsay Farm, where you get all the little ponies and all of that. It's quite a street. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is so lovely. It's so lovely. And Basant, let's uh, let's just stay with you for a second. So, what would you say you've enjoyed uh, the most so far about your time as sort of an international student at Kiel? Uh, there's a lot of things, but definitely I did enjoy my course. So last year was my first year of placement, and I think that was the yeah, I had fun the most, uh, but I did. En I do enjoy a lot of things. I think. I think also the vast societies I'm in. Um, I'm in in several societies, so like basketball, uh, Islamic society, Arab society. So I think I just enjoy meeting new people as well. Yeah, all part of all part of that experience, isn't it? Of just meeting. Yeah. New people throwing yourself into new opportunities. Um, and Jackie, let's come over to you um, for a second. Could you talk us through sort of the application process for international students and whether that perhaps differs depending on where students are from? Uh, just a bit of an overview. Yeah, no worries. So in terms of um, international students applying to Kiel, if this undergraduate student, it's, it's pretty much similar to what the UK students would do uh, through UCAS. Um, some students will also could use uh, one of our representatives that are based in country. So on our website, um, we have country pages. So if you find your country where you are from, on that country page, you will find a list of our representatives that are based uh, overseas. So they are there to help you with the application process. They can help with your visa, they can help you get your documents together. I mean, most of them will not uh, charge for the service, but um, it, it's, a really good, um, it's a really good way for you to get your applications through and to get all the assistance all the way through right up until you enroll. Um, so yes, it's quite similar, but the, the difference is you, you can get assistance in country if you need it. Because I know a lot of students do use agents when they're applying um, for a UK university. Brilliant. Thanks, Jack. And we've had a question um, sent in by Hiruni, who um, understandably, obviously, there's been quite a lot of uncertainty on the build up to over the last couple of months about sort of coronavirus and, and, and the sort of feasibility of studying um, as an international student. So Haruni's asking um, if by any chance um, a student was unable to arrive in the UK due to coronavirus, what kind of steps would be taken and what sort of support could a student expect to receive from Kiel? 
Yeah, so, I mean, this happened uh, last year, obviously, when it all started. We were very supportive with our students. So we understood a lot of them could not come for whatever reason. They couldn't get flights, uh, oh, you know. So um, what Keel does, if you let us know as soon as you're not able to come, uh, we will give that support where you can actually start your studies online. And then as soon as you're able, as soon as you get a flight, or um, whatever the, the issues were, then you can maybe come to campus within the second semester and continue the studies there. But just bear in mind that it, it just depends on what course uh, you are doing. For some courses will have like placements that you'd have to do, or they have a certain uh, percentage of face-to-face -face time. So you, it just depends on the course. So the best thing to do is if, the situation arises let us know as soon as you can and we can give you the options and all the support that you need we are we are open we're flexible so you just need to let us know and we will help you and guide you and could you give us a bit of an overview of our international support package and sort of what might be included in that and what a sort of a student could expect to receive so the support package is for students that are starting this year. Um, so if you're looking for 2022 entry, uh, it might look a little bit different depending on how the coronavirus is. But this year for the students that are arriving, and this is similar to, to last year as well, we offer, if you book accommodation, for example, on campus, we offer free accommodation for 14 days. So, so you can do your isolation, quarantine, depending on which country you're from. At the moment, obviously, you know, they've got the red, you've got the amber, you've got the green countries. So each will look a little bit different in terms of what happens when you arrive in the UK. For example, if you're coming from a red country, uh, at the moment, you would have to quarantine in a government hotel. Um, and then if you're coming from an amber country, you can quarantine on campus. If that's the case, then we will provide free accommodation. We will offer you a student buddy and that buddy can bring you food and drinks uh, while you're quarantining on campus. You'll get an iPad so you can actually start doing some work while you're on campus or you want to contact your family as well. Um, also, if you're coming from the red um, country, we are offering a, a refund of that quarantine package as well. Um, as long as you bring your receipts. And also, if you're coming from an amber country, we will also refund the cost of the COVID test that you have to do. It's all on our website. Um, if you look at the International Student Support Package, everything is there. But this, just bear in mind, this is the 2021 entry. If you're looking at 2022, it could look slightly different depending on how our coronavirus is at that time. As you know, we just don't know what, what in store for us in the next year or so. So we are very flexible, very supportive, and we will help as, just as long as you let us know what is happening. Great, thanks Jackie. Um, Bassant, let's come back over to you. Um, could you give us a bit of an overview of sort of how you found settling into Kiel um, as an international student and sort of perhaps the steps you took to sort of really get yourself settled in? Yeah, I think it was quite scary moving away from home. Like I was pretty anxious to begin with. Um, especially on my first day and I remember my mom came with me just to see the campus and all of that and then we had the international week which I'm not sure is happening this year or not uh, but it, I think that was one of the best ways for me to settle in because you meet a lot of other international students and just understand that they're going through the same thing we're all in the same ship kind of thing so you kind of calm down a little bit as well as the activities they do host a lot of night outs, a lot of comedy nights and all of that, which kind of makes you ease a bit and just make yourself at home. But obviously after the international week, it kind of reality hits and you realize that, okay, you're kind of in the real world now. So I think one of the things that really helped me was keeping in touch with everyone back at home. So my family and friends and all those back at home, but at the same time, kind of immersing myself in the now. So get into a lot of different societies, uh, enjoying, just enjoying my time at Kiel and trying to make the most out of it without thinking too much about home. Real, real. And the song, we've had a question from Kay, um, who's asking how easy is it to get off campus and, and get into the local town? 
So uh, it's pretty much uh, easy to kind of go to the town and the nearest town to us is Newcastle under Lyme. So that's about 25 minutes on the bus. Uh, it's about 20 to 25 minutes on the bus and the bus runs every 10 minutes. It's the 25 buses, one bus direct to town. And there is also the other town, which is Hanley, which is a bit further away. I think it's 30 minutes, but you take the same bus, it's 25. And it's pretty easy to be honest because I know a lot of people live um, in town and they commute every day to campus because of the uh, how easy it is. And could you give students who obviously are not going to be familiar with the local area an idea on sort of what is in the surrounding areas and what students can expect to be able to get involved in outside of their studies? Yeah, sure. So. Q has everything on campus, to be honest. So we've got the pharmacy, we've got um, little shops, so, so Costa, we've got co-op now, and we've got a uh, little the library, we've got everything, we've got the bank, um, and we've got as well uh, restaurants and food places. So you kind of, you've got everything on campus, but if you don't like it, or if you want a change of scenery, you can obviously go to town where you get more or less restaurants, you get, uh, there's more entertainment. So you, you get the museum, you get the um, monkey forest, you get a lot of things, you get the cinema, um, and it's a lot more variety. Uh, you also get more shopping options, so like Aldi, Asda and all of these. But um, yeah, every, you've got everything on campus, but if you do want to go off campus to live in town, there is, a, there is that option as well. Well, best of both worlds, so there's loads of stuff to do on campus, lots of all the sort of amenities that you're going to need, but equally really easy to get off campus and sort of enjoy the local area. Um, Jackie, let's come back over to you. At the start, when you introduced yourself, you mentioned um, bursaries and scholarships. Um, so are you able to give a bit of an overview of what's available for international students um, for 2022 entry? Yes, but unfortunately for 2022, we've not published any of the scholarships as yet. But just to give an idea, for 2021, um, students, all they need to do is exceed their entry requirement. Um, so the entry requirements are all published on the website. If you exceed it by even like 1% or one grade, automatically you will get £2,500 per year off your tuition fee and that's for all courses other than the medicine the undergraduate medicine course um, you, there's no application process it's done automatically so as soon as the admissions see your grade then on your offer letter it will say that you've got the keel excellence scholarship the other scholarship that we have is the developing country scholarship so also on the website there'll be a list of um, countries that um from the World Bank. And if you're if you're from one of these countries, then again, automatically, you'll get an additional 1,000 pounds per year of your tuition fee. So you potentially, you could get 3,500 pounds off your tuition fee. Um, so that's really good. So we're hoping for 2022 entry, it will be similar. If, if it's gonna be different, um, it might be a little bit more, but, um, just to say that we will have scholarships, we will always have scholarships for international students. Well, I guess, I guess the best to look out for those is on our website. Correct, yeah. Real, real. Um, shout out to Ed, who's joined us on Facebook and is watching from Ghana. So hi, Ed. Hope you enjoy uh, this stream and get all the information that you, that you need. Um, and Jackie, just staying with you for a second. We've had um, a question from Sharma, who um, is just inquiring about um, the CAS. So are you able to give us a bit of an overview of, of how that's issued and how it works? Um, Sharma has actually applied for one of our uh, postgraduate programmes. Um, so can you just give us an idea? Because obviously it's, it's related to undergraduate as well. So just oh, a yeah, bit of an idea of how that process works. Yeah, it's, it's the same process, whether it's UG or uh, PG. So uh, basically, once you've confirmed your offer, you've got it unconditional, you've, you've accepted it, then um, within the email that you will get from admissions to confirm your offer, the next will be the next steps. So the next step is to pay £2,000 deposit and that £2,000 will secure your place. Then after the money has been received into our account and we can see it, you'll be issued a, a pre-CAS, it's the CAS checklist. 
In the CHICAS checklist email, it will have a list of things that you need to show, uh, financials and, and things like that, bank statements. You send all of that to the CAS team with the CAS checklist. Uh, and once that's all approved, um, you will then be issued a CAS letter. And with that CAS letter, that's what you use to actually apply for your visa. Okay, um, so the process is quite easy. As soon as you've paid your deposit, everything just kicks in and you'll get email confirmation about what to do next. Okay, brilliant. Does anybody who's familiar with the term CAS, what does CAS stand for? Oh, you've just put me on the spec. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's essentially the, it's essentially the process that a student would take, isn't it, to then be able to apply for their visa? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like a confirmed admission statement. It's like we've, we've confirmed that you've got a place. Yeah, uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Jackie. I won't put you on the spot again. Don't worry. You can relax. <laughs> Um, Bersan, let's come back over to you. Um, obviously, moving uh, to university is a big step anyway, but then obviously moving to a university in another country is is a, is a massive thing uh, for students to, to do. Um, did you always know that you wanted to uh, study in a different country? And sort of what do you think the benefits have been for you um, as an international student as opposed to perhaps staying in, in your home country? Yeah. Um, to be honest, until the last minute, I was planning on staying home in Egypt and just going to university there. But then I got the offer and my parents kind of told me like, think about it because it's de definitely an opportunity that not a lot of people get. But at the same time, it's quite scary. And uh, I spoke with my brother because he he went, he studied in the UK as well and he, he enjoyed his time here. So I was like, might as well. Um, and for me, so the experience is quite different because obviously traveling broadens your mind. It's just you see a lot more of the culture, you immerse in it. And it's quite different because if actually in Egypt, I wouldn't be this independent coming here and staying here alone and doing everything on my own with no family support or anything made me more mature and made me independent as well as it told me a lot of skills, so like soft skills, like communication skills. So, um, things like how to introduce yourself, how to make friends easily, which back at home is it's not quite a challenge, but coming here and trying to connect with people from different culture and backgrounds um, is, is different and learning how to do it was quite a skill which I had to learn. So I think coming here and experiencing university here told me a lot of things which would be really beneficial for my future, um, not just in terms of studies, but also soft skills. And as well as you know, the university experience itself is quite different because in Egypt, I know the cohorts are quite big, so you don't know everyone, but here at Kiel, you, it, it is a bubble, so you kind of know everyone in your course. And even from other courses, if you go into, if you join societies, you kind of just know a lot of people, and then you meet them in the SU again, and then you just become friends. So, so um, it, it is, it gives you a sense of community, which I don't think I would have had in Egypt. Yeah, that's so good to hear, and I'm sure a lot of uh, students who are watching will find that really reassuring. Um, Lauren, thank you. Uh, CAS stands for Confirmation of Acceptance for Studies. So there you go for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> anybody who wasn't quite sure, um, Confirmation of Acceptance for Studies. Um, Jackie, we've had a question uh, from Usama, who is asking um, whether our admissions are still open for international students for September 2021. Yeah, we're still open, but you just need to bear in mind the length of time it's going to take you to get the CAS and your visa, which could take about a month. So um, but while we, yes, we are open and we don't tend to publish um, like deadlines or closing days, but there will be eventually a CAS cut up date. So if you've got everything together, like all, if you've got all the, all your papers, like you've got your transcripts, you've got your certificate, you've got everything, then there's a chance that you probably could um, be able to get placed for September. But um, yeah, just bear in mind the length of time it's going to take you and not to delay your application. Yeah, I suppose the other thing just to say on that is we are still open, aren't we, for September 20th? Yeah. Um, but obviously it would depend as well what course um, Islam is interested in studying because some courses are are now full. Um, so that was just also another consideration. Um, 
Jackie, if we think sort of further down the line, uh, when students actually get here and arrive on campus, um, what happens when what happens when international students arrive? What can they expect? What sort of enrolment like and what kind of support do we offer in those very, very early days? Yeah, so um, at, even from like, when you arrive in the UK at the airport, what we're offering is a pickup service from you can actually book it online from Manchester, Birmingham and London East Road. Um, with COVID, obviously, it's going to look a little bit different. We, what we usually have is like a bar, so we've got all the student ambassadors and we'll go down to the airport, we'll wait for you and then we'll pal onto the bus and we, and we go to Kiel. But obviously, because it's um, of COVID times, what we're offering is individual taxis. So there will be an online booking form um, on the Welcome website within the Kiel web pages. So if you go to the Welcome pages, you'll find information there. You can book a taxi and the taxi will take you. If you're from a red country, it'll pick you up from the quarantine hotel that you're going to be at. Or if you're coming in from an amber, amber country, we can pick you up directly from the airport, bring you to Kiel. And then once you get on campus, you'll have student buddies to help you. You can They will help you move in, unpack your bags, show you around the local area, uh, where you can go and get food, go shopping, show you where the supermarkets are, and like open, how to open a bank account, how to register with the doctors that we have on campus. Um, so once you register on arrival, you can then see a doctor free of charge um, if you are sick while you're, whilst you're on campus. Um, so you'll have all of that support to help you. And as um, Basan mentioned as well, you'll also have that International Welcome Week. We will have it, but again, it'll, it'll probably look a little bit different because of COVID. So there might be a lot of lot more virtual stuff that you can do, maybe quizzes and, you know, just stuff that you can get together. And like, like she said, you're all in the same boat. You've all just arrived. You might not have even left the country before. You might not have left your parents before. So it's, it's it's a way of getting you connected with other students in the same boat, all international students. You get to know each other. You make friends ready for when the UK students come onto campus the next week and Freshers' Week. So you get all that support all the way up. And then within Freshers' Week, there's lots of support as well, because then you'll be, you'll be meeting the UK students. So you can maybe buddy up with them and get to know about the UK students, UK culture, and, and share your culture with them and you can join lots of clubs and societies and then studies start and you're free to go <laughs> but not to say that we don't support you after that point the support is available the whole time that you are here we have international student support team and that's what they're there to do they're there to support international students whenever you need it because they understand you, you need different support to the UK students yeah. as well. So absolutely anything, go and speak to them. There's always someone on campus to help you with anything. Well, I'm sure she's just trying that quite with joy. And I think the key take home message there is that support starts even before you join us as you sort yeah. of go through that application process. Well, that does bring us to the end of this session. Um, so thank you very much for joining us for this live Q&A. Thank you, Jackie and Basson. And Jackie, apologies for putting you on the spot, but there we go. We all know what it's has happened. It's fine. <laughs> we all know now what has. <laughs> um, apologies if there were any questions that we didn't get to. Uh, we've, got, we've got staff and students available on Unibuddy all throughout the day and they're on... Uh, um, you, know, you can speak to them on our website um, whenever you need to. Um, coming up in around five minutes time, we have our first accommodation tour, which is showing a shared flat and an ensuite superior room in Barnes Hall. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the rest of our virtual open day. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello and welcome back and welcome to the first of today's accommodation tours. First of all, we're going to be heading around Barnes, which is our largest accommodation site on campus. And I'm joined by Emily and Deb. So we'll get you guys to introduce yourselves first. Uh, Emily, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us what you study at Q? Hi, um, my name is Emily. I am currently studying studying human rights law. Um, and I currently live in Holy Cross, but I lived in Barnes in my first year. Amazing. And Deb, do you want to tell us who you are and what your role is at Kiel? So I'm Deb and I work in the student accommodation team. So we deal with the allocations of the accommodation. Fantastic. So as I say, we're going to be taking a look around two accommodation blocks in Barnes. We're going to have a look around Barnes Y, which is uh, Deb's the ensuite superior, ensuite, is that what it's called? Yeah, Barnes ensuite superior. And then the shared flats and houses, which the official name is? Yeah, shared flats and, shared flats and houses. houses. Perfect. Um, so as we go through, any questions you've got for Emily or Deb? Again, Emily has lived in Barnes, so knows what it's like to actually um, stay here full time. So any questions you've got, drop them in the chat and we can ask them as we go. What we'll do is we'll start by just showing you where on campus Barnes is in relation to everything else. So this is a top down view of uh, Keele and we're currently over Union Square, which is where that blue pin uh, is in the centre. That's kind of the centre of our campus. Uh, and then Barnes is just here, uh, surrounded by that blue outline there. And actually the newest accommodation blocks in Barnes still aren't on Google Earth yet. Uh, they're at the top uh, of the of the site, just over here. That's where the new Barnes blocks are, um, which we're going to have a look around first. Um, so yeah, Emily, it, it's kind of quite near the centre of campus, isn't it? You've got quite a lot surrounding you, haven't you? Um, both the tops, top end of campus as you enter, then also the sports centre and things, haven't you? Yeah, Barnes is in a pretty good location for everything, really. Yeah. So we'll have a look around the exterior. Um, so yeah, Emily, do you want to show us, show us around the outside of the Barnes accommodation blocks? Yeah, so... Like I said, Bond is in a lovely location. Um, it's right next to the sports field. So if you're a sporty kind of person, um, then Barnes might be a good accommodation for you. But it's also a really nice view, just looking over the fields and the trees. Um, and if you've got training in the morning, then it's not far to walk. Um, this little hut here is our Islamic centre. Um, so I think you can apply online if you want access to this. And again, like it's very handy. It's just really close to, to Barnes. Barnes is really lovely. It's just surrounded by like greenery and fields and trees and stuff. It's just very really nice. And which which block did you actually live in then, Emily? Where were you at Barnes? Uh, I lived in Z blocks. That's one of the new ones that isn't on Google Maps. Google Maps needs to up its game because every <laughs> time it's not there. Um, so yeah, I lived in one of the new ones, um, and they're really nice. And they're about the new ones are about a couple. Of, was it twenty eighteen? They were first opened. Ooh, yeah, about 18, yeah, yeah. probably two, two or three years ago, yeah, yeah. They've still got their sparkle. Um, and in front first... of us is actually the second block, isn't it, that we're going to have a look around. These are the shared flats and houses. Yeah, these are shared flats and houses, yeah. You say you were the first cohort in the new barns, were you going to say? I, mean? I was, yeah. Everything was oh, brand okay. sparkling new. <laughs> when I, I hope I you left there. them looking brand sparkling new as well. <laughs> I will not take responsibility for the other people that I lived with. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a mixture, isn't there, of barns? And it's kind of, um, there's the whatever whatever room type fits your needs and budget, you've kind of got it there, haven't you, Deb? There's, there's, yeah, there's yeah, a there's, wide variety. Yeah, there's three types. There's uh, classic rooms at barns. Uh, the poor chair, sorry, the barn shared flats and houses, which we'll see. And then the barns on suite superior. So there's uh, three types. You know, Emily, that vary in price. Yeah, and actually, I'll, I'll ask you that in just a sec. So we're going yep. past two new bit buildings now, aren't we, Emily? So what are these in, in front of us here? So um, we have Barnes Bar and then we have the Common Room. Um, so I think we look at the Common Room first. Um, the Common Room is called the Sty, and I don't know why it's called that, but it, it's much nicer than it sounds. <laughs> um, it's just sort of comfy sofas. Um, it's really nice if you've got like sort of a big group of friends or you want to get out your accommodation. Um, you can just go and it's it's just really chilled out place. Um, and yeah, like I say, you've got a big group of friends that you don't want to squash into your accommodation. It's really nice to have that that really close to your accommodation. Um, and then we just saw Barnes Bar. Barnes Bar is really nice to have um, right next to your accommodation. Um, we used to go there for like birthday parties and um, some socials in there. Or if you want pre-drinks or anything like that before, before going to the SU, um, Barnes Bar is, is really handy. So I was there quite a lot in my first year. <laughs> and they're, they're great on the... So 
some of the halls you've got barns and Lindsay that have their own bars don't you yeah. that's right yeah. um hallwood's kind of got the kpa attached to it which we'll have a look at later um but the, so they're kind of almost mini bars aren't they because you've got you've got the student union which has got the main kind of the, uh, its own bar and an event space the big ballroom but you kind of then have barnes bar and Lindsay cafe and bar which are kind of these smaller are they a different vibe emily to the to the student union bar um yeah i think so like you could anyone can go in there you don't have to be live in barnes to to go in barnes but i'd say mostly barnes people go in barnes so it's it's almost like your own little community bar it's it's quite nice it's quite cozy and um yeah whereas the SU is obviously really big and and things like that and you get all the students in there so um so yeah i'd say it's a little bit cozier and maybe if you just wanted like a quiet drink then maybe you'd go to the bars um, and if you wanted a bit more of a night out then um you'd go to the SU or something it's like the village pub <laughs> in, your, in your in your bar <laughs> in your accommodation block <laughs> <laughs> and then in terms of laundrette so we can't we, there's there's a laundrette is it attached to it's around the back of the behind common room isn't it yeah it, yeah, and, yeah then, um, um, and then there's also one inside new barns isn't there so how, how do you kind of what, what's it like to do your laundry as a, as a student at keel um so all accommodation have a laundrette pretty much within two minutes walking distance you're never going to be going far um and it's really good. Um, we used to get everyone together and we used to sort of do our laundry as a flat because the, the washing machines are absolutely massive. So you can fit so much in there um, and it's a lot cheaper to do it that way. Um, and yeah, you're never far from the laundrettes and on the Keel app, it tells you if the lawn, uh, if the washing machines and the tumble dryers are free. So you don't have to trek down there um, to find out that there's none free. Um, you can check that before you go, which is super handy. And then also, Deb, that I found out the other day that the accommodation office has actually moved because it yeah. used to be in Barnes Y. Used to be and in now Barnes it's gone Y. To Tawny, hasn't it now? Yeah, we yeah we moved to Tawny building. Yeah. So that's where you will find the accommodation team now. Um, and then, so I'm guessing I'm sure something will happen. I'm, I'm guessing they'll turn that front bit into a seating area or something, won't they? Yeah, I, I'm not sure what the plans are, you know, at the moment. But uh, yeah, we, we've completely moved from there now, so you'll find us in Tawny. Um, but that is there's also a laundrette in there as well yes yeah perfect so what we'll do now is we're going to head into the block that's in front of us here into barnes y which is not where you lived emily you lived in z but they're pretty much identical aren't they in terms of these room types uh so yeah let's have a look around inside so do you want to show us around what would have been uh your flat emily <laughs> i was actually in flat 12 which is the one you're showing that's but in the other block so yes exactly the same um, so yeah, this is standard corridor. Um, Barnes is six to eight people. I think most of them are eight to be fair. Um, so yeah, and then your kitchen is at the end, which we'll go in a bit later on. Um, but all of the flats are set out exactly in this layout. So. Um, and in terms of here. access then, Emily, and getting into your flat and things like that, how, how does all that work? So it's really, really secure. You need a keel card to get into the actual building. And then you need your keel card again to get into the individual flats. And then you need a door key to get into your um, bedroom. So um, it's really secure. You won't have people like wandering in and out that you don't know who they are. And um, everyone in the building should be, you know, friends or at least um, they should live there or be friends of people who live there. So all students, um, and then, like I said, you need your keel card to get into the flat. So there should be no strangers there at all. Um, and it's really safe and really secure. Um, this is a standard bedroom. Um, everything in here, you know, you get your bed, your desk, your wardrobe, um, all things like that are common standard. Um, got a nice little push pin board there. So you can put all your pictures up and, and notes and things like that, um, which is really nice. I had all my friends and family from home stuck on there. Um, there's loads of storage in these rooms um, they they really managed to maximise the space. So there's storage above the wardrobe, um, as you just might have seen, loads of shelf space. Um, there is under bed storage, um, so good place to hide all your junk and your suitcases and things like that. Um, so yeah, there is, there is loads of storage um, if you're like me and you decide to bring your kitchen sink with you. <laughs> what's one thing you you uh, you you brought with you that you shouldn't have brought that you should have left at home um just stuff that like clothes that i didn't want to like clothes that i've never worn that i thought oh i might all of a sudden start wearing this and things like that just stuff that i never used and thought oh that's really useful and then ended up 
getting my mum and dad to come up to visit me and giving them a load of stuff back. Just be a little bit ruthless. Think, how often do I use this? Um, and just try to be, just try to do a better job than I did. <laughs> there is like really good like lists on uh, Google. If you just Google like university, what to bring. And um, there is really handy lists and they tell you sort of the standard stuff that you definitely need um, and things that you're not allowed to bring. Um, and it's really handy to make sure you've remembered the essentials. There's also lists on our website that the accommodation team have done, Deb, isn't there, yeah. on like yeah. individual yeah, appliances to, to bring? Yeah, if you just uh, type to bring. in on the search engine, you know, what to bring, it'll take you straight to it. Um, so there's, yeah, lots of advice on there for you. Nice and we to get bring this question. Oh, go on, go on. Sorry, yeah, bring it's just nice to bring some conference. home conference. You know, some photographs, a cuddly teddy, um, your, you know, your favourite duvet or something. Um, you know, things like that to make the room sort of your own. Um, because, you know, it is your home away from home. So it's nice to make it your own. And we get this question quite a lot. You'll see on the back of the desk there, there's quite a lot of uh, power outlets and, and there's also some internet ports, but the internet ports, Deb, are actually obsolete now, aren't they? Yes, it's all, it's all Wi-Fi. It's all Wi-Fi, the campus inch, yeah. So if you've got any games consoles or PC or, you know, comp uh, custom built PCs or anything like that, just make sure they've got a Wi-Fi card in them and you'll have no trouble connecting them. And the Wi-Fi is all included, isn't it, Deb? It's just, yeah, you're yeah, on the, the university Wi network. Yeah, yeah, that's all included. Um, and then you just log in with your student student ID, don't you, to, to access the Wi-Fi? Yeah, the Wi-Fi is really good. You get it all over campus um, and you get it other places in the country and as well because um, it's sort of like a standard university one. So if you visit like um, other universities or I've got it in a couple of university hospitals, mm -hmm. um, and it's really handy because you just connect to the Wi-Fi. So it's very good. Um, so this is our bathroom, this is standard bathroom, you get a shower, you get your sink, you get toilet and stuff like that, um, obviously. Uh, um, so yeah, just make sure you're bringing, you know, your shower gels and your soap and things like that. Um, I think you get like a toilet roll when you get there, um, but things like that you have to supply for yourself um, most of the year. But it's really nice to have your own bathroom. Um, if, you, if you want a little bit of privacy, then they, these rooms are really nice. So Miriam's asked, how many people on average uh, are there sharing a flat? So let's go with this one first. So Emily, how many how many were you sharing with in Barnes? Um, in this accommodation, it was eight. Um, I think Barnes actually says six to eight, but I think most of them are eight people in a flat. Um, yeah, so that'll be eight people in your kitchen. Sorry. The, the majority in, in Y and Z are, are eight, but there is a few that have got seven and, and six. So that's why it's between six and eight. The majority are eight. Awesome. Uh, one for you, Deb. When can January intake students apply for accommodation? Uh, is it fact? Well, if it's a foundation year, because it's normally foundation year, um, that's looking at January. So, Not sure, but let's right. say let's say it is. Let's, yeah, let's so go with that. Yeah. So I mean, they can apply. They probably best just apply in sort of just after September, um, because obviously, well, beginning of September, because well, sort of probably. After, after the main arrivals of September, really, because obviously they'll get, you know, sort of joined up with the uh, September arrivals after. Um, but if they look on the website, there's a little section on on January starters, because like I say, it'll depend on what course they are doing. If it is FY foundation year, then there is a section on there. So if they just have a look, but if it doesn't answer the query, if they just drop us an email at accommodation, because it, it will depend on, on the course, whether it be in a January starter. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. So we're in the kitchen now, um, Emily, and this is, uh, did you spend a lot of time in the kitchen? Yeah, I'd say the kitchen is like the main social space um, for your flat. And um, so it's really nice um, when people are cooking and you can just sit down and have a chat with them. And Barnes is really nice because it's got the comfy sofa area at the end. And um, a lot of kitchens will have, you know, your dining table and your kitchen, but they don't have necessarily a sofa as well. And um, so Barnes is really nice that it has the sofa and it has like a little monitor as well. So you can like hook your laptops up to it, watch movies and stuff. Um, so yeah, um, in the kitchen, um, they will be tailored to how many people are in there. So if you've got, if you're sharing with a lot of people, the kitchen will be bigger. Um, most of the time it's one cupboard 
one fridge shelf and one freezer shelf. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot when you're used to like living at home with an entire fridge, but um, you know, it is just for you. So I've never had an issue with that and I don't find that other people generally do. So it is generally enough space. Um, so yeah, um, you get the kettle and you get, um, you know, your ovens and things like that, but you have to bring your plates, your dishes, your pans, your pots and things like that, tea towels and stuff. Um, so again, you can just check before you come what kind of things you need to bring. Um, you don't get things like a toaster, but I'd recommend getting one when you get there because you don't want to rock up and everyone's brought a toaster and then you have eight toasters. Um, it's just get one when you get there and if you split the cost between everyone, it's really cheap. Um, all flats come with a whiteboard, which is really, really nice. Um, you know, for a few weeks in, you'll have scribbled all over it and have passive aggressive notes to tell people to do the dishes and stuff like that. Um, but the whiteboards are really handy for talking to each other when you're not you're not there or whatever. Um, so yeah, the whiteboards are a lot of fun. And you could do artwork on there. Some people were saying yeah. they they used to do their own murals on there that, that kind of lasted the full cycle of their, of their course and kind of add to it as you go they are um, really they are really good to have um for whatever whatever you might want on that <laughs> so in terms of the, the kitchen so obviously you say you leave notes for people kind of um in your accommodation block which sounds strange because you live with them can't you just talk yeah. to them but actually are the kitchens get busy or do you kind of find that everyone has their own individual routines yeah, well, everyone sort of um, has their own routines anyway, but everyone will be in lectures at different times. So, you know, you don't all rock up into the kitchen dead on five o'clock to all start cooking your tea. That's not how it works. So they don't tend to get too cluttered or anything or too busy. Um, and yeah, I've, I've never had an issue with that when I lived there. And, you know, you'll make friends with these people fairly quickly. I'd like to think I was pretty much best friends with everyone on the first day so um you know everyone's really nice and understanding it's not like you're going to be cooking with complete strangers if that makes sense um so it is a lot of fun when you are cooking with other people and um, and it is like i said it does become quite a social space because other people will be cooking and you'll sit and you'll have a chat or you'll do your work in there together and stuff and um, so it does become like a really nice space and do you ever find that you're kind of fighting for a hub space or have you always kind of got space to make your food no you work together um and you know if you do find that oh there's a couple of people in there already making food you know you would wait or somebody else would wait or but I, like i said like everyone has their own routines not everyone eats at the same time and not everyone's in at the same time so generally um you find that it's fine and sometimes you might even cook for the whole flat um, all together you know you might have like a little flat meal which is really nice we did it at Christmas we had like a Christmas dinner and stuff so um you know you work together like I said these people will pretty much soon become your friends so um you know there's no like fighting over um hobs or sinks or anything like that <laughs> nice um, and in terms of appliances then so you kind of mentioned it um Deb what do you actually get in your kitchen then what what's provided in the kitchen for you in the kitchen, yeah. So you've got all your white woods, like your freezer, fridge, cooker. You need to bring your own pots and pans, uh, crockery, cutlery, uh, kitchen utensils. Again, just probably to start with, bring sort of the minimum, you know, with pans and that, because like Emily says, you know, you'll soon find that you'll, you know, make friends and sort of start, you know, joining together with things. Uh, like Emily says, don't bring a toaster because somebody else might have already brought one. Um, so yeah, you know, it's just really your basics, what you need. Plus, if you haven't got anything, you're very close to sort of Newcastle under Lyme where there's plenty of shops, Sainsbury's that, you know, sell all these things that you can get from there. So. And you know what? We were doing a, a stream the other day and Tom from the Students' Union, one of the officers this year, mentioned the Great Donate Scheme, which is, is awesome as well. So students who've lived in accommodation and are leaving, but don't need to take some of their appliances with them. Um, they donate them to the Great Donate Scheme and then they'll do pop-up stalls in the first few weeks where you can then go and, and get some of these appliances and kind of pass me down and they pass through the Keel Generations. Um, and he was, I mean, he got given, I think by the the, um, the catering team, he got given just a load of spoons. So cutlery and things like that. It sounds like they've got 
an abundance of. So um, always check out that out as well. So I think I think that's run by the Keylesu, so keylesu.com, and it's called the Great Donate Scheme as well. So you can al- always grab some stuff from there. Ever, yeah, ever seen the Great Donate? Yeah, coat hangers. Coat hangers. I got there, but all my clothes realized I didn't have any coat hangers, um, and I, they're dead cheap because people are just like getting rid of them. And um, so I bought like ten coat hangers, and it was like dead cheap, and it was so handy, and they have everything that you could possibly need. And um, so yeah, definitely check that out if you get to Kiel and realize you've forgotten everything. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the great donate scheme. Uh, a couple of questions before we move on to barns, shared flats and houses. Uh, we've got Liam has asked, are the flats mixed gendered uh, or would that be optional? Yeah, all, all the ensuite accommodation is mixed gender because you've got your own bathroom. So yeah, the mixed gender. So these that you're looking at, mixed gender. And can you select to be with the same gender, Deb, or is that... Uh, not, not in the ensuites, no. no. Not in the ensuites. Um Miriam has asked, is there accommodation available throughout your whole course or is there an expectation that most second and third years move out and live in nearby houses and flats? So Emily, one for you, Rick. So what, how, what was your kind of journey through uni in terms of accommodation? Um, so it is possible um, to live on campus in your second and third year, but generally they do sort of encourage you to move off campus. So for me, I lived on campus in first year and then, um, yeah, made friends with all my flat and we moved off campus as a flat um, into Newcastle and Lyme and we got a house together. There's lots of support with that. Um, Kiel have a really good website on recommended and previously used Kiel landlords and accommodation. Um, So you know that you're not going to be getting like a dodgy deal or anything like that. And these are all landlords that Kiel students have used in the past, um, which is really good. Um, and yeah, we lived off campus for second and third year. And then for my postgraduate, I moved back onto campus. Nice. Yeah, just, just picking up on what em- Emily said, normally of an undergraduate course, it is your first year and your final year uh, that you can apply. Um, second year, you normally do go off campus. If we've got availability, then we, we open it up sometimes to second years. But normally it is you're just your first and your final year. Um, and like Emily says, we run this website, it's called Kiel Student Pad, which advertises all the off-campus accommodation, you know, in the local area. And is there, is there a few guarantees, Deb, is that right? So if you're an international student, do you get, you can, yeah, you can stay on campus? Yeah, if you're an international student and apply by the deadline. Uh, also, if you've got a disability and you're registered with Student Support Disability Services, you know, and apply by the deadlines, then, you know, you can get campus accommodation. If you're a care leaver, you know, a strange student. So there is some different scenarios, which, again, if anybody wants to look, they're all on the website, on the accommodation page. But if you can, it's quite fun, isn't it, Emily, to move into the local area and, and kind of go off campus and experience that little bit more private living, is it? Is it a little different to on-campus accommodation? It depends. There's there's loads of different options. Um, so there's like... Um, you know, like Keel House and Orm Road, which are like sort of like on campus accommodation, but off campus. Um, and they have like their own little private rooms, but um, you live entirely with Keel students. And um, so it's sort of like on campus accommodation, but off. Um, and then there's like houses. So there's loads of different options off campus. Um, and there's benefits to living off campus and there's benefits to living on. So it is nice to experience both. And it's nice to be like most students would live in Newcastle or Silverdale and um, I lived in Newcastle and that's where all the shops are and um, so it is really handy to live close to all the shops and things like that um, and the bus comes um, every 10 minutes in term time and goes right through um, the campus to Newcastle and the Lyme so it is really handy to get onto campus it's it's not difficult. And you can also e-scooter to campus now using our on-campus e-scooters, which I'll never stop plugging because they're my favourite <laughs> thing on campus at the moment. Have um, you used them? Yeah, use, we, we used them the other day. Um, it, Zwings were very kind enough to let us have two for our live stream we did on Tuesday. Um, and we were whizzing around campus on them. Uh, but they're great because they get up the Keel Bank as well, so you can take them from campus into the local area. Um, so it's up to you how you travel to campus. New modern ways. <laughs> Um, but let's head now inside to Barnes shared flats and houses. So, um, Emily, you didn't live here, but you've kind of you, you know you know these quite well, don't you? Yeah, I have been in them. I had a friend who was in them, and I think they're really nice. Um, you live with four in this one, and it's like we're like a little family in your own little flat. It's really cute. Um, 
So these ones, you share your bathroom with the four and you share your kitchen with the four. So it is less than um, most accommodation on campus, but um, you do share the bathroom. So entirely what, you know, your preference is. Um, so the rooms are a similar sort of um, design, but um, single beds. Um, and yeah, that's quite nice because you get a bit more floor space. Um, but if you like to spread out like me, I wanted a double bed, but it's up to you. <laughs> um, but again, you get the same amount of like storage space and things like that. Um, and you get a bigger push pin board on this one. Um, so if you've got lots of pictures and notes and posters and stuff like that, lots of space to put them up. Um, but yeah, there's, I wouldn't say there's any sort of major differences other than the bedside um, for this one. And of course this one, so this one isn't en suite, this is um, shared shared bathroom facilities. Um, they're all shared kitchen, aren't they, Deb? Everyone shares a kitchen. Everywhere you share the kitchen. Yeah, um, um, it's just some differ in terms of bath. So the, these, are there any in barns that have a wash basin in their room, Deb? Um, the, yeah, the classic ones, barns classic. Uh -huh. So these ones, because you're kind of living with, there's only four of you in these, isn't there? So you, it's not, they don't get very crowded. And as Emily says, you kind of feel like you're a very small family in these ones. Um, so they, we'll see in just a moment with the bathroom, it's just literally down the corridor um, with a sink in there. But then the classic come with a sink in the room, which is quite handy, isn't it? For just doing your teeth in the morning or washing your face, things like that. And what, was, what I find interesting is, um, and some of all of these ones were kind of empty and vacant, so no one's living in these. Um, and they can look quite kind of sparse, can't they, Emily? But it's kind of this is they're like a blank canvas, aren't they? Of how, however you want to decorate your room. Yeah, um, it's nice when you can come on campus and do a proper on campus accommodation tour because usually you go in a room where someone sort of made it their own, you know, they've got their own bedding and they've got their posters up and their pictures and they've got all their stuff on their desk. And um, so, yeah, you do make it your own and <clears throat> you can bring your own stuff and make it all homely and cosy. And um, so, so yeah, they are a lot nicer when you get all your stuff in there. Sorry, my voice is gone. That's all right. <laughs> the, um, I've heard a few things as well. So if you, if you, you can obviously bring your own, uh, as you say, bed in and, and home comforts like that. But if you want to arrive to campus, you can buy things like posters, can't you, when you arrive here? Is there a plant sale as well? I think I remember you can buy a plant or something. Yeah, I, I have actually, loads of cactuses yeah. from there. You had cactuses? What, the easiest one to look after, Emily? They're actually, they died, unfortunately. <laughs> you can... I'm not a plant person. <laughs> that's, imp that's impressive to be able to, <laughs> to kill a cactus. Um, but yeah, or if a... you are, um, a, if you have a little bit more of a green thumb, unlike me, and um, we do have... Poster sales, plant sales, and um, we have loads of charity stuff going on as well in the uh, in the Forest of Lights and stuff. Um, we have like vintage clothes sales as well in like the SU, so there's always something going on. Um, always, yeah. So this is the, the kitchen for these. So again, you do get a, a, a seating area in these ones, but it's slightly smaller than the, barn, than the barns one, but you are only sharing with four as well. Um, so Deb, all the same kind of in terms of appliances that come with the kitchen and what you need to bring, all the same? Yeah, yeah, the, um, same, same in the, same in all the kitchens. Uh, basically, you know, your cookers are already there. Obviously, your fridge freezers, your beef brady with a kettle. Again, toaster. You know, wait, wait till you get there, sort of thing. If there isn't one, then you can club together and buy one. Um, bring obviously again your pots and pans yourself, uh, and your crockery and cutlery. And then. Emily, in terms of your food shop then, so was it the first time you'd ever done a big food shop coming to university? On my own, yeah, it was. Um, we used to, because most students will get like Wednesday afternoons off, so we used to all go as a flat together. And we used to get the bus down to Newcastle and we'd go, you know, Aldi or Morrison's, there's a Sainsbury's there. Um, so there's lots of options wherever you prefer. Um, and yeah, it was, you, you muddle through in the first couple of weeks, um, not everyone knows how to cook, not everyone knows what they're doing. Um, you would also. <laughs> it's like living in, if, <laughs> you can imagine it's like living in the wild at first. You're just kind of finding your feet with everything. What, did, what, what, was, your, that, what was your first meal, Emily? What was your first meal? I think it was like chicken nuggets and waffles. <laughs> that, was, that, most... that was my staple diet for like semester one. Oh, gosh. 
<laughs> well, what was your uh, what was your most elaborate thing you ever cooked in there? You said you did a Christmas dinner, didn't you, with the flat? Is that right? No, yeah, we used to do that like all the time. And um, even when we moved off campus, we still get together and do like Christmas dinners and stuff. I was not in charge of the cooking during that time. Um, in fact, even now when we do like Christmas dinners and stuff, they're like, Emily, you just sit aside. Um, I'm not, I'm not the chef of my friend group. Um, but you know, I've got through. Um, I, I can cook for myself now. I can make a, a proper meal that is nutritional and not just brown. <laughs> Um, so I've definitely improved in that since first year. <laughs> and just to say as well, so you, you obviously went off campus to do your shopping. Um, there used to be a supermarket on campus um, that kind of did small things, wouldn't it? but you couldn't really do a weekly shop in there. But now that's converted to a co-op, um, which is opening literally like I think two weeks or something. Um, and it looks incredible. It might They've taken part. So there used to be, there was the, the supermarket here and then there was also the bookstore and the coffee shop. So part of the books are in the coffee shop has now been turned into the co-op. So it's even bigger than it was before. Um, I've had, I looked through the window yesterday. There's a huge aisle of self-checkouts and all that. So you might actually be able to do a full shop uh, in the co-op. So you might never have to leave campus if you don't want to. Um, Amazing. We'll I'm yet to that. see it. Yeah, we'll 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 sure. I think I can't remember what it's opening. It's very very soon. Um, but we'll we'll I'll definitely have to go down and look. Online. That'd about be that. great. So, yeah. Um, but in terms of, so you should get, jump on the bus and do your shopping then. Did you, Emily? Yeah, um, the buses are great um, and they do like student e-deals and they do like um, weekly or monthly passes and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, the buses are really handy for getting about and they go to Newcastle. So they go to campus, Newcastle and Line and they go to the train station and they go into Hanley. So it's a really good route and it's got everything you need on it. And then supermarkets on offer. What What's in the local area, Emily? We have Aldi, Lidl, Morrison's, the Sainsbury's, a bit further away, the Tesco. So there's literally anything you could want. But I'd say Morrison's at Aldi and Lidl are like the closest ones and the main ones that students go to. Did you ever do, did you ever like all chip in and, and get it delivered? At the start, we did a couple of times, but we found that it was more expensive to do it. And we, we quite liked going and having a nosy round. Um, I mean, Aldi has the special buys aisle, which is just amazing. <laughs> I love looking down there. Um, but yeah, we found that we quite like going off campus each week, doing it all together. Um, and yeah, it was it was cheaper that way. So you do get a couple of delivery vans, but generally people go and just um, buy it. And if you've got someone in your flat with a car, it's very handy. Even better. <laughs> it sounds that's nice that you all went on a little trip to the shops together. Every week. Um, every every week. <laughs> Uh, question on YouTube for your first few days did you bring food from home or did you go food shopping immediately so did you arrive and then go to the shops or did you bring a few bits with you Emily um, a bit of both so I live about an hour away so it's a bit hard to bring like frozen stuff or like meat because obviously you're in the car um, so if you live far away you might find it it's difficult to bring like a lot of food um, so I bought you know like my uh, like pasta and lots of tins so I did bring a lot of food from home and my mom just did that so I didn't have to spend loads on food shopping um, initially. But I did have to go um, because, like I said, especially if you're coming from far away, if you've got like frozen things that you need or like meat and things, you're not really going to be able to take it in the, a nice warm car journey with you. Um, so, yeah, you find that um, we just went and I just went with my mom and dad and most students just do that. Um, but, yeah, there's always people who will be happy to go with you um, if you want to nip to the shops and um, usually there's someone in the flat at the same time as you so um if you know if you don't want to wait till you're all free there'll be someone who'll go with you and as i said if you're worried about arriving and not having anything to eat there's plenty of places on campus that you could quickly go to aren't there and, and grab some grab some food yeah there's loads of like fast food places and there's like the refectory which do like proper hot meals and then now i keep forgetting to talk about the co-op because i haven't even seen it yet but um, yeah, there is like the co-op on campus. So um, if you have just got a few bits that you need to get, then that would that's really handy to just walk two minutes to, to the co-op. So thinking about flatmates then, so obviously you, you it sounds like you got on like a house on fire going shopping with them all each week. Um, did you know who you're going to live with before you moved in, Emily? No, it's a complete surprise. <laughs> um, so yeah, you, I don't think, 
there's any real way to plan who you're going to live with at all um so and it won't be based on your course either generally you'll be you could be with anybody from any course um so it's quite exciting and um everyone's in the same boat you know everyone's coming to uni most people don't know anyone so everyone's like happy to make friends and really excited about their first day and stuff so everyone's in the same boat if the worst came to the worst and you really like hated your flatmates or something which is not something that I've ever experienced or I even know um anybody doing um you can request a rude move a room move if the worst came to the worst but um I know that it's like quite nerve-wracking people think that they're not going to make any friends but I promise you will you'll be fine um and like I said everyone's in the same boat so everyone wants to make friends and everyone feels like they're not going to make any friends um so yeah it's fine and it's fine was it nice to be living with people who are on completely different courses to you? Yeah, um, because, you know, you're going to see your course mates every day, pretty much, and you, you're already going to get to know them. So you live in accommodation with people that you might never usually bump into. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to be, as a law and politics student, I'm never going to meet a medical student. So it's really nice to be able to meet people that you wouldn't necessarily usually bump into on campus. Um, so it just sort of gives you two sort of friend groups um, immediately. What, what courses sense. were you living with? What, what courses spanned your block then? Uh, social work. I did have another person who was on politics and IR. Uh, what else did I have? I had pharmacy. Um, trying to go through the Oh, I had geography and business and marketing. Um, pretty much every area of the university. Uh, yeah. Pretty much, yeah. It's probably <laughs> easier to tell you the ones I didn't have. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's you get a bit of everyone and that's really nice. And we get this quite a lot because obviously Kiel is a campus university and everything's kind of, they call it the Kiel bubble, don't they? Um, and everything's kind of located in one space. But we often get people saying, oh, I'm studying, I'm studying politics. Which accommodation block should I stay in? And it doesn't quite work like that at Kiel, does it? Because you, there are, no, if you're no, a city university, you're kind of near, you might be near, an accommodation block not, might be near that sort of area of campus in the city, but at Barnes, everything's very, very nearby, isn't it? Yeah, all the all the accommodation is in walking distance to, you know, all, all the campus. So it doesn't really matter which, you know, area you're in, you'll still be close, you know, probably a maximum of sort of 10, 10 minutes, wherever you were, you know, to your lecture sort of thing, 10, maybe 15, depending on how fast you walk but yeah they're, they're all walking distance it's it's um it, it is great because then you can sort of look at what what room type suits you what um accommodation type you prefer isn't it deb so you can kind of don't worry about your course as much unless you're uh, the only ones are, are nursing isn't it deb that you uh, yeah there is, in... there is a couple of courses that we do allocate together so that's nursing and midwifery because they're on a different letting period that's on a 51 week occupancy um, and vet, veterinary, uh, that's slightly different. We keep those together. But, um, you know, other than that, like law, politics, you, you know, they're, they're all, you know, across the campus. So uh, really, it's a case of having a look which accommodation you prefer and selecting, you know, your, your preferences via that as opposed to, you know, which building law is in and trying to get near there. So a couple of questions that have come in uh, before we wrap up. Studying and working, so uh, kind of about jobs on campus then, Emily. Uh, you're an expert on this because you're currently doing one. Uh, but outside of your studies, is, is there opportunities to go and get a job on campus? Yeah, definitely. So um, I'm a student ambassador, um, so I'm biased. It's a really good job and I definitely recommend it. Um, but also all the shops and um, the SU on campus all hire students. Same with Keel Hall. I think you can work there too. Um, so there's loads of opportunities on campus, but also Newcastle has hundreds of bars, cafes, shops that you can, um, I'm sure they're, they're hiring. Um, so there's loads. So there's loads of opportunities to get jobs um, near campus or on campus. Um, in terms of like, in terms of like jobs for your academic course, um, the Keel Careers team send around like internship opportunities pretty much every week. And um, so there's loads of like opportunities for um, a job that's more related to your course as well. Um, so yeah, there's, you'll be fine. There's loads of opportunities awesome. if you want a bit of extra money. Um, and a question from YouTube. Do you ever study together in the social spaces or do people prefer to work alone in their rooms? Uh, we found that, yeah, we often study together. Um, sometimes if you have a bit of a, 
deadline you might go off into your room and get your head down or you might um go into like the silent study in the library um some people don't like working in their rooms because it's also like their, their relaxation space and they like to keep them separate but there's loads of places on campus to study um so most of the academic buildings have study spaces um, and you don't have to be in that academic building to use the study space and um, so my favorite is the central science labs and they have a really nice study space at the Good top choice. and i used to always go in there Good um choice. the library has loads of different study spaces so they have group study and silent study so whatever works best for you and yeah often your friends will just get together and work together and that's really nice Awesome. So, Deb, just before we uh, wrap up then, do you want to give us the prices for the rooms we just looked at? So, starting with Barnes Y, which is this ensuite superior. So, this is the, this year's prices. For next year, they're normally displayed on the website approximately January time, okay? So, um, the Barnes Ensuite Superior is £174 and two pence per week, okay? That's what, I love the pets. <laughs> <Thanks for> the <laughs> two pence. Yeah. And then the, the shared flat, so that's what we've seen today, where you share with the four, um, they're one hundred and fifteen pound and fifty-seven pence. Fifty-seven pence. One of them's one pence. I can't remember which one's the one pence one, but that that makes me chuckle. Um, nice. Well, thank you both. Uh, it was a pleasure. Deb, you'll be joining us for the rest of them. Yes. Uh, Emily, anything else you're joining us for today? Uh, I'm on politics and IR later today. Um, so politics and then IR are two separate so ones, but. Yeah. On the if you're teams, interested in any streams. of those subjects, I will be there. <laughs> Amazing. And you're also on Unibody, is that right, Emily? Yeah. So if you have any questions about accommodation, student life, or um, I do law at the moment and I did politics before. So if you're interested in that, um, you can ask me any questions on Unibody. Amazing. Keel.ac.uk forward slash chat. Uh, coming up in around about three minutes time is our support at Keel Live Q&A, where George will be joined by Emma and Hayley for that. So do stick around. Uh, but other than that, we'll see you on our next accommodation tour at uh, 11.30, which we'll be having a look around Lindsay. So see you then. Thanks both. See you later. Thanks, bye. today in an age of science, and we're dazzled by the vast technology it has created. But the elaborate paraphernalia of the scientist is nothing more than a tool for thinking.
Hello and welcome back to our live Q&A. We're going to be here for the next 20 minutes or so talking all things student support at Kiel. I'm George and I'm pleased to be joined by Hayley who is one of our student experience and support managers and also Emma who is our disability advisor here at Kiel. Student services are the one-stop shop for information, support and guidance for every single Kiel student. Whatever you need throughout the year, our team are here to support you. Before we get started, I'll just hand over to Hayley and Emma to introduce themselves. So over to you, Hayley. Thanks, George. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Hayley. Um, I'm one of the student experience and support managers here at Keele. Um, I'm based within the Faculty of Natural Sciences. Um, and our role is really to support you with everything you need external to your studies while you're here at Keele. Thanks, Hayley. And over to you, Emma. Hi, my name's Emma. I'm a disability advisor based um, at Keele University within Student Services. So my role is to put in adjustments for students who disclose a disability. Um, we can also signpost. We work very closely alongside Haley's team and everybody else in the school within Student Services. Well, thanks both. So I think that the best place to start perhaps is, is with you, Hayley. So obviously student services at Keele is covers a, a vast array of services and sort of different elements to it. So could you give us a bit of an overview of the kind of things that, that your team sort of supports students with? Yeah, so we do. We sit in inside a wider team um, of student services. So um, our team will help students with anything related to their course that they might need advice and guidance on. Um, so we can offer advice, you know, if, if it might be you're not quite enjoying your course and you're looking to switch um, or you need a bit of extra help with something, you can come to our team. Every school within the university has um, a designated student experience and support officer. So it would be that person that you would make contact with initially and then they can help you with that, advise you with anything you need and they can signpost you to other teams where necessary. So, for example, it might be that you would come and speak to us and we can then put you in touch with Emma's team. Um, and do you want me to talk a little bit more, George, about the yeah, wider student services team? OK. Yeah, yeah, um, that makes sense, yeah. So, yeah, so we sit within student services um, and part of student services. The wider team includes Emma's team, DDS. Um, we also have a chaplaincy for all students of, of all faiths and, and also none. We have a counselling and mental health team within our service. Um, a residence life team that will help all students in halls. Um, and loads of other things that so will support finance with financial advice um, and international students as well. Well, thanks, Hayley. And Emma, let's come to you. Um, can you give us some information about how we support students who do have sort of a diagnosed disability? Yeah, we do encourage students to disclose as early as possible uh, without a disclosure um, and then contacting us directly with um, evidence of their disability. We need to obviously then review the support. Each um, disability affects students on an individual basis. Um, there's a team I'm working full time along with my colleague Jane Wilkinson. Um, my other colleague Nicola Keeling works two days a week and then our line manager Michelle James. So we support students with putting reasonable adjustments in place and applying for what we call the disabled students allowances. So the Disabled Students Allowances is funded by the student's funding body, so say for example Student Finance England. And what that entitles a student to do is attend an assessment of study needs to determine what additional support that they need to complete their studies. So we don't want the student to be disadvantaged uh, due to their diagnosis, so we put in place reasonable adjustments. So they could be in the respect of um, additional time and exams, extensions to coursework deadlines. And, and obviously through the disabled students allowances, they can get recommended specialist equipment, specialist software, dependent on the diagnosis. It could be that they have a specialist mentor or a specialist study skills tutor to support them for their academic studies. So us as a DDS team, we will support the student with putting a full support package in place but we're also, as Hayley uh, said, we're also a point of contact and we work very closely with the rest of student services. Um, we've got a great new website called Health Assured as well. So if students don't want to come to us directly, they can go onto this website and it's all anonymous. It's there 24 seven. They can talk about a range of different difficulties that they're having, whether it's money, um, you know, forced marriages, just general disability, general counselling as well, if they want to stay anonymous. But we do encourage students to disclose 
early so that we can put the reasonable adjustments in place for them. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose, you know, if we don't know, then we can't put that support in place, can we? Um, yeah. And just staying with you a second, Emma, obviously we will get students coming who have already got a diagnosis of a disability, but we might get students coming um, and joining Keel who think they might have a disability, let's say something like ADHD or autism. Is there any support at Keel to sort of help students sort of seeking that diagnosis? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we work with uh, an educational psychologist, um, so we can do a referral for a student who thinks that they may have a specific learning difficulty. So under that umbrella, it may be dyspraxia, ADHD, dyslexia. Um, so for the student to be entitled to disabled students allowances, we have to have a formal diagnosis from an educational psychologist for a specific learning difficulty. And the students don't have to disclose early. They can come to us, say, for example, halfway through the first year. As long as they've got a minimum of six months left on the course, we can support them with putting adjustments in place. If the student feels that they have a diagnosis of autism, so say, for example, the students are going through their studies, they get feedback from the tutor, you know, you might want to contact DDS, you may have this diagnosis. Autism has to be a referral through their GP, so we can't buy a clinical psychologist. So at the university, we cannot assess for autism, but we can definitely assess for a specific learning difficulty. Any mental health issues that the student has, we uh, can support that as long as we've got the relevant medical evidence. We do have a form uh, that we can send for the student's GP to uh, complete that we can use as medical evidence as long as we've got the correct medical evidence if any students are unsure of what medical evidence is accepted we do encourage them to contact us directly if there are any questions at all from a student then they can book an appointment with a disability advisor directly um, or they can just drop us an email and we'll respond as soon as we can Great. Thanks, Emma. And Hayley, if we just come back over to you, obviously going to university um, and starting your degree is a, is a massive step and it's understandable that students will sort of feel slightly daunted by the process. But if students find themselves on their course and actually struggling with the course content itself, is that something that sort of the offices uh, aligned with the, with the schools could help with? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a range of different places that a student could could access for support. Um, all students will be given a personal tutor within the school, for example. So if it's something maybe to do with a specific piece of work, they can absolutely reach out to their personal tutor, but also they can speak to their student experience and support officer and, and they can kind of do that liaison work with them as well. Um, there's also externally to student services, a really good service within the university called Right Direction um, that offer academic support. So it might be that they run sessions to help with essay writing or referencing, for example. Um, and they're all available for students to access for free as well. Um, as we go into the new academic year, our teams will be looking at doing some sessions within schools to help students um, just navigate some of the university systems, but also just more practical advice around managing time, for example, um, making revision timetables, all of those things um, that hopefully will help manage those course pressures and, and areas of worry. Yeah and then I think another sort of natural worry that a lot of students who are perhaps moving away from home for the first time will be having is sort of moving away and standing on their own two feet sort of thing and getting used to sort of that sort of more independent living kind of thing. Um, so if students are worried about moving away from home especially given the sort of certain circumstances with uh, coronavirus how does Keel support students with that? Okay, so we run a range of different things. Um, we've got a pre-arrival event that will run from week commencing the 13th of September. So students can have a look on our web pages. There's a few different talks there that might be applicable and that you can register for and watch. Um, student services are also running a welcome buddy scheme this year. Um, and we'll also do that in subsequent years as well. So a student can register for a current Keel student buddy um, and they can ask questions of that student before they get here. And that support will be in place kind of as long as the students need it so we encourage buddies and, and mentees to, to meet up in welcome week for example and they can show you around um, but also likewise you can always reach out to our teams in advance if you're arriving at Keel so you can use the student.services at Keel email address um, you know any any question we can we can help with um, and there are there are no silly questions I think sometimes people are worried especially around the pandemic um, 
but there are loads of measures in place. We'll be running a range of different events for you to be involved with um, virtually and in person. Um, so hopefully there will be something for everyone. Can I just add on to that, please, George? Yeah, of course. Um, Go Hayley um, obviously mentioned the pre-arrival event that we've got. We've got a really, really good programme for the pre-arrival event. So transition to university, uh, five ways to well-being. We've staggered that over the week. So there's more than one workshop so that if students can't attend, say, for example, on the Monday, they can attend on the Wednesday. So this is why DDS encourage students to disclose um, any disability so that we can send them an invite out for the pre-arrival. We are also holding um, an early arrival um, on Wednesday the 22nd, where what we've called it in the past is our Connect event. So students who contact DDS um, with any mental health, um, autism, then we can send them an invite out for early arrival so that they can settle in before the mad rush on the Saturday so they can get familiar with the kitchen. And again, we're going to be on campus as a familiar faces just to help students settle in and a range of events as well. So this is why we encourage students to disclose as soon as we can so that we can support them with that transition to university. Brilliant. We've had two questions sent in, Emma, which I think are probably most appropriate for you. Um, so obviously we've been talking about um, the support that we offer. You, you mentioned sort of conditions around ADHD, um, autism and those kind of things. We've had someone just ask whether this support obviously extends to sort of mental health conditions as well. Yes, definitely. Under the Equality Act, um, the student can disclose a disability as um, if it's long term, over 12 months, it affects their everyday living routine. Yeah, mental health is definitely covered. So again, we can support the students with getting the relevant evidence from the GP. We can put interim support in place while the students are applying for the DSA uh, full pa support package. Um, so we do encourage students with mental health to contact, even a long standing chronic condition. We support students with IBS, etc. Um, so yeah, that's not a problem. Just ask the students to contact us directly and we can make an appointment and discuss what support's available for them. Well, thanks Emma. And then uh, Morgana has asked, um, if somebody's been given a, a diagnosis of a learning disorder, is there an expiry on that at all? Or is that sort of a, a lifelong diagnosis? If there's a report that the disabled students allowances changed their regulations it's very boring but back in 2016 they said that they would accept um, an educational psychologist report um, pre-16 years of age but it's got to have the correct tests in there if there are tests missing then the dsa won't accept it so again it'd be a matter of um, the student sending us a copy of the report we will then have a look over that to see whether it'll be accepted for the disabled students allowances um, if not we can ask the students to get retested and refer them to our educational psychologist okay thank you thank it you. depends on the content of the report george to be honest okay best thing to do is to just have that conversation with you guys isn't it reach out start that conversation and we'll sort of see what what level of support yeah what's acceptable okay. and what's not acceptable as evidence yeah definitely well well um you mentioned earlier, Emma, about reasonable adjustments, and I assume that these extend to things like accommodation uh, for students who might have like a physical disability. Um, so do your team work closely with our accommodation? We do. Yeah, we work very closely. So we can put the recommendations in place for accommodation, say, for example, for a student with, um, with mental health uh, difficulties or a wheelchair user so that they do require um, an ensuite accommodation. We can put the recommendations in place now. DDS do not allocate the room, so just managing students' expectations, whether you come in this September or next September. We will certainly work very, very closely with the accommodation, but we have to work with the infrastructure that we've got on site. Um, we can make adaptations, as in grab rails, ramps for wheelchair users. We have a number of um, accessible accommodations, so if they need a wet room or a shower seat, or things like that. We do have students who have contacted us with food allergies as well. So they've requested, say for example, a fridge in their room because of food cross contamination due to the food allergy. Or it might be that they need a medical fridge within the room. So if you're diabetic, you can store your medication within the fridge. So we do work very closely with accommodation um, with the reasonable adjustments. So 
if we haven't got that available for the students, say for example, we like I said, the en suites go really quickly. We've got single occupancy flats. Um, they go very, very quickly. Um, but if a student wants any adaptations, then they just contact us directly and we'll liaise with the accommodation and the estates team for the adaptations for them. Great. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. And Hayley, coming back over to you, I think one of the things that obviously we're really proud of at Keele is, is how diverse our student community is. Um, so could you just give us a bit of a sort of information on how we support that and things like the provision that we've got for students from different faiths um, and those kind of things that we can offer? Yeah, sure. So um, obviously we provide support and information and events for all students, um, but we do also offer specific support for some student groups. Um, so, for example, we'll offer tailored support for a care leaver or an estranged student. So an estranged student is someone that has no contact with their family um, and is supporting themselves through university. So we have dedicated contacts within each school. Um, we also have a care leaver and estranged student bursary to support those. Um, just really recognising the need and um, for financial support for those students. We also have um, specific support for mature students and students that are parents while they're studying, as well as students that may be caring for a relative um, as well. So I would say if you if you feel like you fall into one of those categories, then you can drop us an email and we can maybe talk you through the additional support that is available. Um, obviously, you mentioned Faith there. So we have um, a brilliant chaplaincy team within Student Services. Um, again, they offer support for all faiths and none. And there are specific areas for um, for prayer, for example, uh, you can contact those exactly the same way as us or if you want to have a chat with us and we can put you in contact with them directly that's also absolutely fine. Well, thanks Hayley. And um, we've had a question about um, someone who is, is looking to move away, uh, moving to Kiel, so be moving away from home um, and whether you've got any top tips for students who might be feeling homesick or just getting used to sort of you know living away from home for the first time. Yeah definitely and I think it's a question we probably get asked at, at every session um, the main thing is just to recognise that every single person coming to university at that point will feel exactly the same as you. Um, so take comfort in that you will all be feeling the same. Throw yourself into as much as possible. So get involved with all of the activities, you know, that we put on. There will be a range of different things, um, you know, from non-alcoholic alternative events to quiz nights. Um, and obviously the student union will be running events as well. Um, so just kind of get involved, go along to those, um, maybe register for a society. So we've got loads of different societies within the student union, all different sports and all, all different areas. I mean, I think right down to some sort, I think it's a, we've got a Quidditch team or something, you know, there's all <laughs> sorts of different mm -hmm. things. And if, if what you're interested in doesn't exist, then you can look at setting that up. There's, you know, there's, there's ways and means to do that. Um, you can sign yourself up for a welcome buddy from our team but also a lot of the schools uh, you know may have similar schemes so you can maybe get matched up with someone in, within your course area as well um, and seek support if you need it so if you are feeling homesick there will be resident advisors that are in your halls that you can contact that are current students as well um, as well as our resident advisor team um, but but seek support and we can always try and help with those things uh, we'll be running some sessions around managing homesickness and, and loneliness if, if that applies to you and giving some helpful um, advice and how to get involved with things and, and overcome that. But really, my main message is it's absolutely normal. Um, and I think once you've arrived and you've got got your stuff in and you start chatting to some of your flatmates, you'll, you will realise that and, it, you know, it, you will be fine. Yeah. Can I just add on to that as well, George, as um, a disability advisor is that of, through my past roles and things, students come on, they've got great expectations. And then it's sort of like you get like Hayley said, you get onto campus and then it's like, whoa, I'm here now. It's like, don't feel isolated. Reach out to the support that's available via student services. This is what we're here for. We want you to have a brilliant university experience. It's, even if you contact DDS, we can signpost you over to anybody within Haley's team or the other student experience support officers, counselling and mental health. Don't feel isolated. Reach out. And this is what we're here for. We've got like on our pre-arrival event, we've got things like what to bring to university. We've got cooking tips, basic store cupboard things to buy. Um, I watched a little bit of the live stream on the accommodation tour and 
Emily was um, really good at going, oh, what was your first meal? Chicken nuggets and waffles. Yeah. You know, it's amazing what you can do with a bag of pasta for 25p <laughs> from Lidl. So, but yeah, but don't feel isolated. Reach out to student services. We're a really friendly team and we can signpost students yeah. anywhere that they need to be. Then the other thing as well is to just acknowledge it's totally normal to feel overwhelmed. Yeah. Like, it's okay if you do feel like, oh my goodness, like what is, you know, this feels like a massive thing because it, it is. And it's like one of the biggest things that students will do in terms of moving away and having to stand on their own two feet. So if they do feel a bit overwhelmed, totally normal, isn't it? Um, yeah. We've had a question, um, Hayley, I think I think your best place to answer this one about specific support for, accom- for people in accommodation. Obviously, you spoke a little bit earlier about residence life. So could you just perhaps elaborate on, on what that team's remit is? Yeah, absolutely. So the residence life team are really the same as our team, but based within the halls. So the, we're kind of a two pronged support service for students. So we've obviously got the support within the halls and the support within the schools. But we all actually do the same job. Um, so each hall will have a designated resident um, manager and then within that team there will be resident advisors that are current students that live within halls. Um, we acknowledge fully that students generally would prefer to speak to another student um, so that's why they exist so they will come around they will do um, flatmate agreements with you they'll talk about what's acceptable as a flat what you know what might you need what what might others need to be respectful of um, but they also will be responsible for causing all of the fun things to do as well so for example um, we have things like wellbeing wednesdays at keel so we'll run maybe free sessions or things that you can get involved with um, so yeah i mean really it's just an, another layer of support for you um, and i think maybe our main message that me and emma are probably getting across is we are a, a really close team um, and you know it doesn't matter who you speak to we can all work together to to get you what you need so whether it is that you end up speaking to someone within the residence life team or within your school the support you'll receive is it's absolutely the same and we can all work together to to make sure you have a a really good time yeah absolutely and if anybody watching does need any more um, information about sort of the the residence life and sort of living in halls and the social side of things um at 250 we've got um another live session on on this stream all around sort of the social side of things so so make sure you stick around for that so we are coming to the end of this stream i'm going to put you both on the spot slightly and i'm just wondering what your top tip would be for students who um you know what they can be doing to prepare to come to university if if they're moving away or even if they're not moving away what is the thing that they can be doing to make sure that they're best prepared for their time at uni. Uh, Hayley, you go first. Okay, I think the first, oh, can I cheat and have two? I think I've got oh. two. Um, <laughs> my first thing would really be to get involved even before you arrive. So there will be Facebook pages, you know, different things that you can get involved with. Like I've said, the welcome buddy scheme and the pre-arrival. Get involved and, and engaged as early as you can. Um, ask any questions you need to so that when you arrive you feel prepared Um, and then when you do arrive I think my second tip is maybe bring a little door stop or something just to wedge your door open and have a chat and introduce yourself to everyone that walks past your door that first day Um, and I can guarantee by the end of of that day you will be feeling much better about about arriving. Nice thanks Hayley what about you Emma top tip? I don't think I can add on to that Hayley that was absolutely brilliant thank you. (laughs) I think just yeah just adding on it's like reach out if you need the support make friends uh, in welcome week I know that we've got a sports day event um, we've got a brass band and things like that so it yeah it's brilliant just make the most of it and enjoy enjoy being at university but also be prepared uh, one thing is that I've always said is managing uh, expectations so if you do need the support, it will be different from college, completely different. Yeah. So you do need to be independent, but we're doing laundrette tours. So, you know, how to use the washing machines, um, how to load up uh, money on your card, on your keel card and things like that. But like Hayley said, just enjoy it. And if you need any support, like Hayley said, any question, it isn't silly because it's all new to everybody. And students will be feeling the same. I think yeah. all first years coming over, but like Hayley said, get involved and reach out to us if you need the support. Do One thing I will say is do not feel isolated after, say, for example, two to three weeks, you're in your room thinking, I can't go out, I don't get on with my flatmates, but reach out to us and enjoy it. 
Keel campus is lovely. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's rural. Yourself in the experience and just go for it, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah, enjoy it. Yeah, well, well, thanks both. And thank you for joining us for this live Q&A all around sort of student support and services that we're offering as part of our virtual offer whole today. Thanks, Emma and Hayley, for your time this morning and joining us to answer the questions. Apologies if there were any questions that we didn't get round to. Um, staff are available on Unibuddy throughout the day. So um, if we didn't get round to your question, please reach out to us on Unibuddy. Coming up in around five minutes time, we're going to be looking at opportunities such as studying abroad um, that might be available to you um, alongside your degree. So thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of our virtual virtual open day. Thank you. On behalf of everyone at your students' union, I want to welcome you to Kiel. Our vision here at the SU is to empower every student to be who you want to be and to make a difference to the world. So you've decided to come to Kiel. Marvellous. Now with that in mind, you're going to be asked one specific question around 83 times over the next few weeks by your mum, Hello. auntie, Hello. second cousin, Hello. friend, Hello. dog. And that question is, where even is Kiel? Scotland? Germany? Antarctica? No. Keel is here, in the middle of England, 53.0034 degrees north, 2.2721 degrees west. 44 miles south of Manchester and 47 miles north of Birmingham, 3.8 miles from the M6, 3.6 miles from the nearest Nando's, and zero miles from the absolute best university in the land. Probably.
Hello and welcome to this live Q&A session about opportunities available to Kiel students alongside our degree programmes. Really pleased to be joined by Ella, a lecturer in languages, and Jake from our global opportunities team. Just to give a little bit of context before we get started, uh, the Language Centre offers a wide range of opportunities to study English and modern languages in a really welcoming and friendly environment. And we also offer modules leading to a certificate in teaching English to speakers of other language, otherwise known as TESOL, which is what you might have heard it as. Um, we also offer a module in uh, intercultural communication. And then Jake from our Global Opportunities team, uh, the team offers students the opportunity to spend a semester or year at one of our partner universities. And we also welcome students from our partner universities onto campus to experience uh, student life at Kiel. Uh, before we get started, I will ask Ella and then Jake to introduce themselves. So over to you, Ella. Good morning, everybody. I'm Ella Tennant, and as Georgina has explained, I'm a lecturer in languages at uh, in the Language Centre. So basically, in my role, I lead modules in English for academic purposes. Uh, these are modules that help um, hone, fine tune your study skills um, in an academic context and develop your academic vocabulary um, if you're an international student. Um, also, I currently lead module in intercultural communication, which is open to all students, as well as um, teaching Spanish levels one and two. So that's it really. So I hope I can see you in some form or another um, in the Language Centre. Thanks, Ella. And Ella, before we move on to Jake, Jake, I'm going to ask you the same question, so be prepared. Ella, where's your background? Because it's making me want to go on holday. It's been giving me those it's, holiday vibes. <laughs> it's Las Palmas de Gran Canaria. It's in front of the Hotel Madrid um, in Las Palmas, in the old part of the town. Yeah. Thanks, Ella. Jake, over to you. <laughs> uh, so I'm uh, Jake Leach. I am the Global Opportunities Assistant at Kiel, which means I support Kiel students who want to study abroad as part of their degree for a semester or a year. Um, my background is of the Toronto skyline that was sent to us by one of our students that studied in Canada um, in 2019-20 um, as part of our photo competition. So I just feel it's a bit more of a nice background than uh, my living room. So, um, but yeah, um, so I'm I support students who want to study abroad, um, and it's a fantastic way to not only to explore and see the world, but to develop yourself personally, academically, uh, to network with um, international contacts, and really. Uh, carve out a future pathway um, as a global citizen. Well, well, thank you both. So Ella, let's start with you. Obviously, uh, we offer languages alongside uh, some of our degree programmes. And just to say as well, um, for anybody watching, we'd obviously encourage you to check your individual course to see what opportunities are available to you, because there are there are some limitations on some of the courses, uh, just given sort of how the languages and, and study abroad options work. But Ella, what kind of languages do we offer here at Kiel? Well, basically, um, in terms of modern languages, this is in addition to the English language support for international students. We have Mandarin, Chinese, French, German, um, Italian, Japanese, uh, Russian, Spanish, French. And we also have modules in British Sign Language, which is proving to be quite popular. As well. And um, the modules, you can take them as electives. That means running alongside with your main subject area. Um, generally, you have space for that to take electives. You can also take under some circumstances, take them as an additional module. But um, basically, it's recommended that if you have space, taking them as electives. And if you progress all the way through uh, during your studies at Kiel, you can go on to have that on your degree certificate. So, for example, if you do um, if you're doing a BA honours in history and all the way through you're studying French, you could get um, on your degree certificate, it would be BA honours in history with um, competency in French. So um, that works with quite a few of the languages that we have as well. Well, and, and what do you think the benefit of that is, Alice? So if a student does take a language, you know, let's use history and French as, a, as an example, you know, studies French modules alongside their undergraduate degree. What do you think the benefit of that is in the long term? Well, I think the benefits are enormous because, you know, I mean, it goes without saying that um, being able to communicate in another language opens so many doors, uh, not only socially, culturally, but 
um, in terms of um, professional employability. Um, it shows that uh, somebody that this that you have an understanding, um, particularly, I mean, I just chose a, off the top of my head example of history, but, you know, in terms of uh, historically, uh, it shows that you would also have an understanding of French history, be able to communicate that to a broader audience as well, um, and being able to work in another language or just have the awareness of being able to communicate with people who aren't necessarily speaking, you know, the same language, English, that you have all of these other skills um, in terms of communicating uh, to a broader range of people in different contexts. And I think that is fantastic um, in terms of um, employability. Yeah, absolutely. And how are languages taught um, at Kiel, Ella? Because obviously they are these are additional opportunities alongside the degree. So they're not getting a degree in the language. It's something that they're doing alongside it. So how, how does this work with, let's use history as the example. If a student is studying history, how does it work? Well, type, the language would be timetabled as an elective for a two hour block once a week for one semester. So for example, if somebody was beginning in French level one, you don't have to begin in French level one if you have some previous uh, knowledge, you know, you would be assessed to see which level was appropriate for you. But for example, if you take um, level one, that would be the first semester uh, enrolling at the end of September, right through till Christmas. And um, twice, uh, once a week, sorry, it would be a two hour block where you would have those uh, that either face-to-face um, -face classroom um, contact where you'd have a, a seminar session with other students and you'd have input from the lecturer and then you'd have time to practice and communicate, you'd have homework tasks. Currently this has been online uh, but we still have the two-hour block so that you have one hour online with your tutor and you have time before the session and after the session to do a lot of the work yourself to be able to be prepared for that one hour focused on communication and practicing the things that you will have checked and learned um, beforehand and basically at the end of the semester there's an exam uh, a written exam short written exam and spoken interaction exam oral and um, if you're successful in those then you'd move on to the next level the next semester so that would go side to side with your main history subjects uh, for the two hour block um, whether it's face to face uh, currently hybrid sort of online and you doing your own work as well but whichever way it is a fantastic learning opportunity and you are also required to put in the effort not just the two hours um, you know being able to seek out yourself different opportunities to practice and do all of the work for that. Yeah absolutely and we've had a question from Kai um, who um, their program um, includes placement, so they're not sure if they're going to have the the opportunity to do um, a language alongside their program. Is there any other way that they can engage with the language centre um, throughout their time at Keel? Yes, I mean it is a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, not every subject does have space. There are um, subjects, particularly those um, is sort of professional degrees with placements, where the time might not be. Um, suitable for that but it is always possible to take it as an additional um, module but you would just need to make time that you, make sure that you do have time that you're not overloading yourself because obviously your main subject does take priority there yeah. um, but there are ways around it so I would say check your timetable and see whether it is actually feasible to do that but we welcome everybody no matter what you're studying yeah. everyone's um, welcome to study a language with us yeah just might be that the format is slightly different depending yes. on the course that they're offering so kai if if you do want any more information perhaps reach out to the, the language center directly um and they could they could advise um miriam you're asking about um whether most courses are compatible with learning a language have a look on your specific course web page um, because it will tell you on there um whether those opportunities are available so have a little look there um brill jake let's come over to you um Study abroad um, is obviously uh, it's a 
fantastic opportunity that we offer here at Keele. So could you just give us a bit of an overview of, of how the study abroad options work um, and just give us a little bit of information about it? Yeah, so um, when you study abroad, you essentially spend time at one of our partner universities overseas. So instead of studying at Keele, you study at one of our universities overseas. So uh, the main two options are the semester abroad and the international year. So the semester abroad takes place in your second year of study. Um, so you'll either take the um, the first semester, so September till December-ish, um, and studying abroad, and then the other semester at Keele, or you'll spend the September semester at Keele and then study abroad in around January till anywhere like June. And so you, you have to be, in, so you apply for that in your first year. Um, we, we have a whole Global Opportunities Week that we send out to the entire university. We send loads of emails around. So um, when you get here, you can have a look at um, what we offer. And then if your subject's eligible, then you can study for that. Um, the second option is the international year. So that's a whole year and it adds another year to your degree. So um, you'd spend years one and two at Keele then spend a year studying overseas and then return to Kiel for your final year. Um, they, they, that's really that's really cool because uh, there's less restrictions on the modules that you can take and then if it's a pass fail year. And so it's quite, it's very much focused on the experience. And then if you pass the international year, you add with international year to degree title. So you get the enhanced degree title. And then if you've got language competency as well, then you've got quite a Cool extended uh, degree title um, and it's, it's, it, the study abroad programs are really about immersing yourself into new culture, uh, meeting you know an international network of contacts and friends, um, you know exploring new avenues of, of subject areas that perhaps aren't covered in as much detail as you'd like at Keele or perhaps you know something completely new that you want to try um, and it's a really good way you know to develop yourself personally academically uh, really good for, for employability you know study abroad is only something that I think about seven or eight percent of UK students do and mm -hmm. so it's a really good way to stand out to employers um, and the, the soft skills that you gain from that um, you know whether it be you know to improve your language competency because you're spending time in a, in a new country developing your language skills or you're just going to you know a completely new education system you can learn from that um, so it's a really really cool way just to you know to have fun but also to develop yourself um, and really make you much more employable when you when you come to leave Kiel. Okay and if a student let's use France as an example. Mm -hmm. If a student goes to study in France for their international year, do they need to be able to communicate in French? Will they be taught in French? Yeah, so all of our partners teach in English, um, so you're not expected to, you don't have to know the language. Um, what, what we do suggest is that it helps to um, learn the basics when you're there because the locals always appreciate it when you make an effort. Um, but you know, we, we send students to Japan that don't know any Japanese um, and then, but that that placement there kind of inspires them to do it and um, and you know if, if you then thinking right I want to go to France then you might then think okay let's take an elective in that but there's absolutely no, no language requirements and lots of students do go to um, you know places like the Czech Republic and Hungary which are very difficult languages to learn uh, and they have a great time um, you know they learn the basics and again you're at a university that teaches you English so a lot of your classmates will know English um, and you'll be fine. Yeah. We've mentioned a few places, but and I appreciate this will depend on the kind of course that you're doing and sort of might differ year by year just as we yeah. develop the scheme kind of thing. But where can students go to yeah. study? So I, th we, I think we have 25 countries in which students can go. Um, so we've got US and Canada, Australia, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, I think China, um, Malaysia, loads of places in Europe so Scandinavia all, all of those countries um, France Germany Spain um, and then we've got like Hungary Czech Republic um, Luxembourg um, yeah there's a lot of choices it's, it's all on the website and you, you can if, if you if you go on the study abroad website you can search by your subject um, and then each there'll be a list then of all the countries but yeah, there's just there's, there's 25, I think there's about 90 partners. Wow. So lots of choice. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Um, and we've had a question from David, um, Jake, who's asking um, whether these kind of opportunities are available for postgraduate students as well. So is this just sort of something that we do undergraduate or is there opportunities to travel with postgrad? 
So the study abroad is for undergraduate. However, if, if you're interested in postgraduate opportunities abroad, speak to your school because sometimes they they offer like work placements. Um, but also then if you if you students are able to do summer schools independently as well. So our partner universities send us details of uh, summer programs they, they run, which is say say a couple of weeks in Germany, for example. Um, and, and some of those are targeted at postgrad, and we'll put those on our website as and when. So, um, although you can't do the study abroad, and if, or if your school then also doesn't do work placement options, then you know you are more always welcome to do like summer schools. And our partner universities are a good place to start because they sometimes offer discounted fees, or um, mm. you know they'll they'll send us the information for that. So, um, it's 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 a bit trickier, but it's definitely not impossible. OK, well, we've had a question from Kai um, who's saying, um, does student finance fund an international year? Yes. Yeah, yeah. so, so support. yeah, that, that continues. So the tuition fee for the year abroad is 15 percent of the usual fee. So if you're a home student, that I think 15 percent of 9,250 or whatever the going rate is when yeah. you're here. Yeah. International students think it's 15 percent of that. Um, for the semester abroad, you just pay your, your flat rate as normal and then you're eligible for um, your maintenance loan or maintenance grant um, as, as applicable. Um, it's normally slightly higher because um, the student loans company appreciate that it's, it's a bit more, there's a few more expenses in, involved yeah. with going abroad. Um, but w what you can normally expect if your household does, income doesn't change uh, over two years, then you can expect at least what you got a keel and then a bit more. Um, what student finance also do, which is pretty cool, is that if, if you are, if your household income falls below a certain threshold, they have what's called a travel grant. And so that uh, funds up to three return flights a year um, and anything to do with like the travel. So things like visas, travel towards the embassy and stuff like that. So that's reimbursed. So as long as you can pay that up front and I think you think they expect you to cover the first like three hundred and three pounds and then the rest of that you can then claim back um, through through student loans company. So um, if if that's something that would be really beneficial to you, you could contact a student loans company and say, hypothetically, if I was to go abroad, is this something I'd be eligible for? Um, otherwise, they'll just let you know uh, when you apply uh, the year before you go abroad. Well, thanks, Jake. Ella, coming back to you, um, we've had a question about whether it's possible to do languages if a student's studying a combined honours programme. Of course it is, yes. Um, combined honours, um, I would have thought that um, when you look at the electives available to you, um, certainly in humanities, social sciences um, and some other faculties, uh, the language will come down in the drop down menu of the electives that you're able to take. Yes. And, you know, that adds to the sort of interdisciplinarity as well of the skills that you're developing in studying sort of a couple of different areas and applying and broadening um, your knowledge base. So language is certainly compatible with that. Yes, and we would encourage you to study a language. Thanks, Ella. And we've had a question from Amanda. I appreciate this is quite specific and you might not know the answer off the top of your head. So if you don't, Ella, that's absolutely fine. But Amanda's just wondering how many um, teachers we have that, that teach German. Um, at the moment, there are two. Well, there we go, short and sweet. Yeah. At Thank the you. moment, there are two. Um, previously, the head of the language centre also taught German. So um, she's um, currently, uh, we now have a new head of the language centre who doesn't teach German, but we have um, two different teachers. So yes, it's quite a popular language. Yeah, brilliant. And it goes right up to the highest levels. Uh, level 10, I think, is the final one. Mm. And, and do students already have to have a bit of like a working knowledge of a language or can they be a complete novice when they when they complete start? beginner um you know you can if you have a working already a little bit um of communication skills or you've done an o level or anything like that you don't have to go into level one you can go into the level that's appropriate um for uh your ability 
Um, but certainly, I mean, I teach level one Spanish and, um, you know, from this coming semester, my students, I would assume they have no previous knowledge at all of speaking Spanish. Everything is completely new and it's very exciting and interesting. And, uh, you know, all of the tutors, whatever language, French, Spanish, Japanese, we do our best to engage you in that learning process so that it's fun, it's exciting, but at the same time, you really will be surprised at how much progress you make. Um, across kind of most of the languages, I would say it's a common theme in the first semester in that level one. You know, you just learn a little bit to be able to talk about yourself. You know, that's sort of basic and usual personal information, your name, what you study, uh, where you live, all of this kind of thing. And then that means that even with a very small knowledge of the language, you know, just a few sort of phrases, you can speak to someone, you can communicate. So if you do have the opportunity to go somewhere, uh, you can still sort of develop that further because you've got ability to answer questions and speak to people that already opens those doors to communication. Yeah, absolutely. And we've uh, Amanda's asked another question. And I again, I appreciate this might change depending on uh, the language and that kind of that kind of thing. But Amanda's asking how many um, students are, you know, on on these courses and how many um, are in sort, you know, how many might be studying German at the same time, how many be, might be studying a different language. Sorry, can you say that again? Yeah, how many students we can, yeah, of course, how many students can we normally expect to be in a class studying a language? Uh, well, it depends on the situation. Um, basically, we have a cap. Um, if we're face-to-face -face teaching um, in a seminar room, um, up to 20 students okay. in one group. Um, in the current format that um, has been um, taking place during this year where we've been uh, doing it through an online kind of um, uh, online situation then we've had a cap on eight students in each group um, so we've obviously had more groups smaller groups um, it depends on what the situation is really going to be but either way whether it's going to be sort of online or in situ, face to face in a group of people. Um, you have smallish class sizes, the possibility to be able to practice in groups, in pairs, and you know, develop that in a way that you can actually communicate with other people in the sessions. Yeah, yeah, real, real. Um, Jake, just coming back over to you. Um, Obviously, pre-pandemic, we also had uh, Brexit, which, you know, in terms of sort of the international climate, had quite a big impact. Um, has Brexit had any impact on how keel has been able to deliver sort of study abroad opportunities? Have, have we had to sort of think about the way that we're able to do that? I, th I think the main... So, as, as of yet, it's not affected things too much, other than when you study in Europe now, there's, there's visas, okay. which there wasn't before. Yeah. Um. I think with with Erasmus, I think we will end. Well, our our participation will end in, I think, in May 2022. So there will be European mobility may may change, in, mm. in the, but then with the Turing program, we don't know how long term that's going to be. So I, th I think it, it's not really affected things too much mm -hmm. as of yet, or other, other than the visa side of things however uh it will be interesting to see what happens over the next couple of years as, as we transition from yeah as almost to Turing. um but you know we're, we're sending you know a, a decent number of students to europe this year um and so yeah I, it, it's, it's difficult to tell at the moment because we're still technically yeah. in erasmus but yeah um it it's certainly not sapped the the, the desire for European students come to Kiel and Kiel students go to Europe and then overseas. So, yeah, yeah, it's yeah which is great. One. Bit of a watch this space kind of thing, but yeah, obviously, yeah, yeah, the team that's sort of there to, to help. Brill. And um, just to end, we're just into the final minute. Jake, I just want to ask you something that I asked Ella at the start. What would yeah. you say is the sort of the biggest benefit of engaging in, in sort of opportunities like study abroad or your international year? Um, I, I the biggest benefit for me is is that it really will make you stand out and learn you know a lot about you as a person and, and to 
help you define exactly what it is that you want going forward. Um, it, it, it's quite a unique thing to study abroad and to have lived in another country, to have, have learned from their, their academics, to learn the new way of life. Um, and what, what is one of the best things about this job is that you, you see students from the point of application and then when they come back, how much they change, how confident they are, like students that, that were so you know, that, that need a lot of support, we're really, really quite, you know, shy, not really sure what to do. And they've gone out there and been in the, you know, this situation and they've come back so confident, you know, if, if they if they miss their play and they know exactly what they've got to do. Um, and, you know, just the, you know, the, the, the employability benefits of it are, are huge. Um, and so it's, you know, it's we're getting to a point where, you know, degrees themselves aren't as don't stand you aside as much so you need to find something to do that so studying abroad is just a fantastic way to do that because it's a lot of fun um, and yeah. you learn so much from it. Brilliant thanks Jake thank you well that brings us to the end of this session so thank you very much for joining us for this live Q&A um, and thank you to Ellen and Jake for joining us to answer any of your questions mm -hmm. sorry if we didn't get a um, chance to answer any of the questions but um, we've got staff available on Unibody throughout the day so you can always chat to us there as well coming up in around five minutes time we've got our second accommodation tour of the day which is viewing a classic and an ensuite plus in Lindsay Hall enjoy the rest of our virtual open day thank you to creating lasting memories and have amazing experiences during your time here at Kiel. Kiel SU is run by students for students and every year the student body elects five officers. We represent you and your interests to ensure that you get the best support during your time at university. Hi, I'm Holly. I'm your Union Development and Democracy Officer. It's my job to make sure that the student union responds to the needs of students by acting as a voice on campaigns and issues you care about, whether that be at university, in the local community or nationally. KLSU offers support, representation, activities, entertainment and value for money services. We ensure that you feel part of an inclusive community where you can grow in confidence and be yourself. My name is Dan Lay and I'm your Wealth and Diversity Officer. My role is to ensure that you feel included and have a great experience at Kiel. I'm responsible for voicing students' issues to the university and helping them improve support services on offer. Alongside this, I'll highlight the importance of accessibility and inclusivity alongside running student campaigns throughout the year. There are over 100 societies that you can get involved in at Keele University. All clubs and societies are student-led and they exist to reflect the interests and hobbies that you have. My name is Tom Gilbert Newell and I'm your Activities and Community Officer. It's my job to represent your views to the university and whether you would like to do some volunteering or join one of our wonderful societies. I will make sure that you get the most out of your time here at Keele. The Athletic Union, also known as Team Keel, is responsible for overseeing and supporting all student-led sports clubs. We give you the opportunity to compete in any sport regardless of your ability or experience. Hi, I'm Lucy Whitehouse and I'm the Athletic Union and Sports Officer. It's my role to get you involved in sports and physical activity in non-competitive and competitive ways. At Keel Students Union, our vision is to empower every student to be who they want to be and to make a positive change to the world. My name is Jack Medlin and I'm your Education Officer. I'm here to provide changes to university processes and support you throughout your studies, ensuring your voice is heard by representing you on projects such as the Student Voice Reps.
Hello and welcome back and welcome to the second of our accommodation tours today. We're going to be taking a look around our Lindsay accommodation blocks on campus and I'm joined again by Deb from the accommodation team and Isha who is a student and has lived in that block so we'll just get you to introduce yourself just in case anyone new has, is joining us. Uh, so Isha do you want to introduce yourself and tell us what you study at Kiel? Um, hi I'm Isha Sharma and I'm currently a law graduate Amazing. And Deb, just in case anyone new is joining us. Yeah, I'm Deb. Deb and I work in the student accommodation team. So we Brilliant. deal with the lettings. So again, as we go around these blocks, it's your chance to ask either Isha or Deb any questions as we go. So please feel free to drop anything in the comments uh, around accommodation um, and staying on campus at Kiel. And we'll be happy to answer those as we go. But we'll start, as usual, by looking at where Lindsay is based in relation to everything else on campus. So we'll start over the top of Union Square, which is the center of campus. And Lindsay is just over here, surrounded by the blue outline there. Um, so yeah, so Isha, Lindsay, Lindsay, what's it What's it near? What, what do you kind of like about where it is on campus? Um, it's pretty easy to get to, um, like the cost cutter, uh, usually only takes me about three minutes to walk there. Um, and also Lindsay has like a cafe and bar so you can like buy your milk from there instead of you know going to the centre of campus but it's quite easy to get to lectures as well um, so if you're in Chancellors like I was for law um, it takes about five minutes to get there. It's nice it's kind of it's quite quiet as well isn't it because it's kind of away from the centre but also very very close to it isn't it and you've kind of got your own little mini community um, inside Lindsay which seems quite nice um, just to say Isha it's now it's now a co-op cost cutter is oh right sorry <laughs> it's all right but it's, it'll be changing very very soon um, cool so what we'll do is we'll have a walk around the outside of Lindsay um, and here we go now Deb actually Lindsay is completely uh, blocked off at the moment isn't it because it's going through some refurbs is that yeah, right there's some refurb on some of the blocks so um, and I think on s and and some at Lindsay Court, um, Lindsay Court. So lots of work taking place over the summer. Yeah. Ready for students to arrive in September, I'm guessing. That's it, yeah. I'll be ready yeah. for then. So Isha, which block were you actually in then on Lindsay? So for my first year, I stayed in um, the block that we just passed, S Block. And then for my second year, I stayed in Lindsay Court, which is the building we're just approaching. And there is a variety of rooms, isn't there? So Isha, you stayed in, they were both on suite, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. But Deb, um, room types of Lindsay, what, what yeah, have we got? You've, you've got uh, traditional, which is, your, you know, your, your, the cheapest accommodation, sort of more in your traditional blocks. Uh, you've got classic uh, plus, um, ensuite plus, which is Lindsay Court, which I think we'll go into shortly. So again, there's a variety, you know, meeting different people's, uh, you know, financial side. And personal needs as well, yep. So so this is Lindsay Court. So yeah, Isha, you stayed in Lindsay Court, did you say? Yeah, yeah, during my second right. year. Which bit was your favourite bit to stay in, actually? Was it was it the court? Um, it was, yeah. Um, it's just nice, isn't it? So you've got kind of this courtyard in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Um, S Block was nice as well. I just, I think like, because I went from being in S Block and then to Lindsay Court, it was kind of like an upgrade. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, yeah, I think the rooms are really spacious in Lindsay Court as well, and the ensuites are really big. And then this courtyard here, you can I'm guessing you kind of use this as a social space, can you? Yeah, yeah, you can. They've got like um, some barbecue facilities, you can just um, stay out there with your friends and have a barbecue. Did you ever, did you ever do that? I didn't. I found out afterwards. You didn't? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then arguably, what people always tell me about Lindsay is the, the other social spaces so that it's got, uh, well, I'll let you explain. So what, what kind of facilities, is it, other than obviously your accommodation, have you got uh, on Lindsay? So there's, uh, we're just approaching the hexagon, which is like the common social space for Lindsay. Um, but you don't just have to be from Lindsay to use it. Um, you just need your keel card to get in um, to the building. So that has like a piano and sofas, a pool table and vending machine. So you can just go there with your friends to like play a game or just to go somewhere quiet really. And then you've also on, so we're just heading around to the hexagon now. Um, then you've also got the Lindsay cafe and bar. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So they also have pool tables in there and you, um, can order hot food, hot drinks. Um, they also have like quiz nights there. 
um, which I attended as well, which is quite good. Uh, and they have the shop in there as well with like food and drink. So what's the difference between the common room and the bar then? Um, so when you say the common room, you mean the hexagon? Yeah, the hexagon, sorry, yeah. So the hexagon's kind of like a quieter space. It's not really packed. So there's usually just a few people in there. So that's more kind of chilled out, whereas like the bar will be, you know, um, quite loud and you can go for drinks for your friends. And also, as Mustafa, another student ambassador, always tells me, it's open half an hour later than other shops on campus or something like that. So if you miss the opening times of other shops, you can run to Lindsay Cafe and Bar. Um, and he likes to go and grab Ben and Jerry's or something like that. So it's, it's quite it's quite nice. It, it, uh, people tell me a lot about Lindsay Cafe and Bar, that it's got good food and it's just a nice place to go. Yeah, the curly fries are really nice as well. <laughs> nice. Do you have them with cheese? I haven't tried them with cheese, no. I've only just had it. Just a, so. I, I'm with you. Just a standard curly fries. Nice. Um, so, yeah, and then the blocks kind of sit around the centre of those uh, those kind of common rooms in the bar, doesn't it? There's just accommodation blocks all the way around, isn't there? Yeah. 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 And then there's also the farm. You're right next to the farm, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. There's usually some horses there that you can see. I've yes. seen them in the past. So we didn't catch them on when I walked around here, but in that field there, you can sometimes, on your morning walk to a lecture, you can walk past the horses, which are very friendly, I find, when they're, when they're right near the fence. It's quite nice. Uh, so a question's come through. So um, someone's asked, for en suites in S block, how many people share the kitchen? Deb, do you know? At the kitchen in S block is... Um approximately 17 in the kitchen now it, it it isn't it isn't a block that's got a lot of en-suites what it is it's it's more of a traditional block in the classic plus rooms then a few of the rooms in there are, are en suite so um you've got your own facilities but then you share the kitchen with the other students all the sharing ratios as well are on the website you know if anybody wants to look after so what we're doing here is we're going to go inside lindsay court and take a look at the en-suite in lindsay court and then I think we go into S or I think we do go into S, it's either S or T. Um, and we'll have a look at the, the shared facilities. So the one we'll look at in S block is actually uh, shared kitchen and bathrooms in there. So we'll look at those in just a moment. Um, Lucinda's asked a similar question. Did you answer that, Deb? How many people share a kitchen, did you say? In S block, uh, it's approximately 17. And then in court, in Lindsay Court? In Lindsay Court. The, how how it works you sort of go in the kitchen and it's four and four and then the diner area is eight up. so it's like eight of you in the diner area but you'll see one of the kitchens when yeah. we go in that, yeah that might sound a bit strange but you, you, it makes sense when we have a look at it um and deb are the kitchens cleaned for you or is it down to you to clean the kitchens the communal areas um are cleaned once a week and obviously you know the students are expected to keep them you know tidy and you know they wash their own pots and everything but all communal areas are cleaned once a once a week so like bathrooms kitchens communal areas fantastic so what we'll do we'll head into lindsay court which is where isha actually stayed at one point and have a look around the block here so yeah um first of all isha talk about access so how do you get into your halls in lindsay um you don't need the key or card actually, which you do need for some accommodations. Um, you can just, you don't need anything to get in. Like, yeah, you just need your key obviously to get into your door. Um, otherwise like the, yeah, it's key, easily- The key to the main entrance. You get a key to the main yeah, entrance and then you've got a key to your room. But it's the same key that um, you use to get into your room. So yeah, there's like nice. a three quarter bed, um, which is quite nice. And you also have a storage space underneath the bed, so you won't struggle at all. You can keep a lot of things under there. And we also have a bedside locker cabinet with drawers. Um, and there is a light switch um, next to the bed, which is quite handy because you can just get into bed and switch the light off instead of going to the door. Um, so it has quite large cupboard space as well. Um, I managed to fit everything of mine in there, which was good. I did store a few things under the bed, but I didn't feel like I was struggling for space. Um, then on the side of the cupboard, they've got shelves. So I stored my dry food on there because um, it just created more space in the kitchen if everyone kept like, you know, their pasta and stuff, dry food there. You also have magnetic notice boards. Um, so I always stuck my like precious posters on there so I could see which events I'd want to go to. 
Um, there's a mirror. There's also another one in the bathroom. And then you have the corner desk, which I quite liked because it's right by the window. So, you know, you can just look out as well and appreciate the view. Um, yeah, so you don't always have to go to the library to study. You do have the option to study in your room. That's the view out. That's the courtyard there. Did you, what, what was your view? Mine, um, it was just like, trees and grass because i was on the other side so you know like the path that you walk down from um, oh so you're facing out yeah and yeah. away towards the farm side yeah yeah um so yeah as you can see the ensuite's quite spacious there's a really big mirror in there as well you don't struggle for mirror space at all <laughs> and counter space as well that's huge yeah, yeah it is really big um i found that the shower was quite spacious as well so yeah, you've in Lindsay. Obviously, we saw the barns ones earlier, which the ensuites are lovely. But I think in Lindsay and Hollycross, you get a bit bigger in terms of your ensuite, don't you, Deb? In terms of yeah, floor, I, think, floor space. I think you know when you look at them, they are slightly bigger. The bathrooms are in, in uh, Lindsay Court. Nice. So as we head to the kitchen, we've got a few questions that have come in. Lots of questions coming in actually. So uh, thank you for those. Keep them coming. If you spot anything you want to ask. Um, Deb, one for you. For classic in T block, how many people do I share a bathroom and kitchen with? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd have to. Well, if if you go onto Keel University website, go onto the accommodation page, then you can click on all the halls of residence, and all the sharing ratios of every block are on there. Um, if you, awesome. Go on, I'll try. I'll try and have a look for it, Deb. Yeah, I think it's possibly. Um, S and T, I think, is 17 for the kitchen, uh, 7 for the bathroom. But like I say, just double check on the website. Perfect. So, Isha, yeah, we're in the kitchen now. Do you want to show us around the kitchen? Yep. So, um, there's cupboard space in the main area and also in the two separate rooms, which you'll see in a minute. So, it's there's two separate rooms on either side. And then there's four people in sharing the one room and four people sharing the other room. So, then you have, like, your sink in there and your cupboard space. And then everyone eats at the table in the middle. Um, so yeah, I found that the kitchen was quite spacious. And um, you've got all of your fridge freezers in the main area of the kitchen as well. Um, there's a notice board if you want to, you know, write anything on there for everyone to see. Um, yeah, you didn't struggle for cupboard space because you have it in both the rooms and the main section of the kitchen. So this is what Deb was explaining. So it's. Or was it Deb four? Was it four yeah, to each side? Four and four, and then eight in the middle, sort of share the diner. So, and Isha, I, I know you kind of assigned a side, but did you always stick to that, or did if someone was using the right side, would you go and use the left side? Um, no, everyone just stuck to it. To be honest, it worked quite well. Oh, nice, perfect. Um, just found out. So, uh, S and T, forty-eight rooms per block, with seven per bathroom, yeah. and then seventeen per kitchen which we'll have a look at in just a minute. So yeah, so Deb, just remind us appliances that come with the kitchen and then stuff that you should bring yourself. Yeah, you get your, your kettle, um, obviously your fridge freezers and cookers are in, um, toasters. So you might, I'd wait till you get here for your toaster because you might find somebody else has already bought one or there may be one already in the kitchen. If not, then you can club together, you know, and get one. Don't bring a toaster, everybody, because you'll end up with too many. Obviously, you need to bring your own sort of pots and pans, crockery, cutlery, you know, to use in the kitchen. Um, probably, again, just sort of bring the basics to start with. Then you can always go out and get more, you know, as you need it. Nice. Uh, so someone else has asked, what's the ratio of people to bathrooms and showers? So it, it does vary depending on where you are. So the one we're currently looking at now, you have en suite. Yeah. Uh, so Lindsay Court is private bathrooms and then four per kitchen. So as you just saw, each wing and then eight in the dining area. S&T, which we're just going to have a look at in a second, is seven per bathroom and then 17 per kitchen. But then if you go on the website, so it's keel.ac.uk forward slash accommodation. Uh, because there's quite a few different room types in Lindsay, you can find the breakdown of sharing on the website in, in more detail there. So I hope that helps. Another question is, what problem for you, Deb? Is there any family accommodation at Kiel? Not really on campus, no. If if the email into accommodation at Kiel, then we can give them help, you know, looking for off campus. We run a website, you know, which advertises accommodation in the local area. 
so um, you know they can contact landlord via that 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 way. If they but just again, drop if you us want... an, yeah, drop us an email, and then we can give them more information on family accommodation. Smashing, and again, if you're looking for accommodation so let's say you're, you're coming here and your parents or, or parents guardians want to come with you and stay with you for the first couple of weeks they can't stay in your room can they deb but there is a hotel on site yeah they've just, yeah, the just built a hotel so um, you know the details are on the website if you want to you know contact them and, and book in there uh another one for you deb does any accommodation have people sharing rooms no no uh, no you've got your own room i mean um in previous years, uh, we have done um, temporary shared accommodation. We haven't, obviously, this time because of COVID, you know, so I don't know what moving forward. But no, at the moment, it's you've all got your own room. Um, Isha, is there any under the bed storage? Yes. Yeah, there is. Um, uh, that's Sorry, that's just in Lindsay Court, not in uh, Lindsay Hall. Perfect. Uh, what we'll do is we'll head, we'll head have a look, just because we're we, otherwise we're going to run out of time. We'll have a look at the Lindsay shared uh, facility. So this is Lindsay S, similar to what you lived in, Isha, but you just had on suite inside here, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So again, is it the same again? You get one key which accesses the block, is that right? Yeah, it's the same. Um, so in this room, we have a single bed. Um, you have the desk again. Um, and I quite like how the desk is positioned because here it's kind of in front of the window. Um, so it's not quite nice to look out, you know, when it's snowing and everything. Um, you also have the bedside locker with drawers. Um, I find that the view is really nice um, for S Block because it's just trees in front of there. So like, you know, when all the flowers are growing in spring and summer, it's quite aesthetically pleasing. Um, yeah, so you also have like, you can either use it to store food or as a shoe cupboard. You'll see in a minute as it goes round. Um, what did you use it for? I used it to store food because I bought my own shoe cupboard because I had a lot oh, of nice. shoes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so then you've also got like the wash basin and a cupboard there and the mirror. So, you know, you can like wash your face there in the morning and brush your teeth. Uh, yeah, so I stored my food there, but you can store shoes if you want. Then cupboard. It's quite a lot of space. I've managed to fit everything of mine in there. So again, and I think, so you've got storage on top of the wardrobe as well. And I think there is storage under the bed here. Is it, are the ones in court, are they the Ottoman beds each where you lift the, yeah, lift the mattress up? But I'm not, I don't think there's storage under the bed in S block. I think, are these, I... are these like, are these beds kind of just off the ground? Is that right? That you could kind of fit I'm small not, things under. I'm not sure if they're metal like if they're a frame if you yeah, know i'm not sure you can't <laughs> store under these beds but you can in lindsay court amazing so then um, we head to the kitchen just as before we do that let's try and get a couple of questions in uh mary has asked do you help guide students uh with accommodation outside of campus in case they prefer that so deb yeah we do don't yes we, we yeah can... we run the website i mean they can go on and have a look at it now it's just www.keelstudentpad.co.uk uh, we only recommend that side because that side because all the landlords have to be accredited with the local council to advertise you know on there then they can just you know have a look through there and then contact the landlords direct just to bear in mind if they are looking off campus student the students union ask and the students union will check a contract over you know, for a student before they sign, you know, and give them, you know, put a guidance there. So it is worth just bearing that in mind. Because obviously once they sign, it is legal, you know, a legal contract. And then, so now having a look at the bathroom and kitchen side. So these are the shared bathrooms, aren't they, Easter? So I know you didn't kind of live in these, but I'm sure you knew friends who, who had um, the shared facilities. Yeah, um, they said that it didn't really get busy. Um, so there's only seven people sharing them, but people wake up at different times. So they're like, they'll use the showers at different times. Um, yeah, so it worked quite well um, from what I've heard. So there's two toilets, two showers. So yeah, the showers are quite spacious as well. And again, Deb, in terms of cleaning in the, the bathroom the communal, facilities? Yeah, communal areas once a week. So these, these get clean once a week. But obviously it is advised to kind of do your own yeah, bits and bobs here and there. Other people it? are using it, so it's nice to leave it, you know, nice for the next person sort of thing. 
into the kitchen then. So this kitchen, remind me, Deb, was this shared by? Uh, approximately 17. Yeah, 17. And the kitchen space, then, issue, did you find it got kind of crowded or were you always kind of okay when you were cooking um, the food? Well, as I said, like people, they have lectures at different times. They wake up at different times. So it never, I found that there was never really more than three or four people in the kitchen at the same time, which is quite good. Um, yeah, so you've got, uh, there's a lot of cupboards in there. I find that there is a little bit less cupboard space in Lindsay Hall than there is in Lindsay Court, but that's just because there's more people sharing the kitchen here. Um, yeah, so you've got, you know, your fridge freezer space, cupboard space. Um, but this kitchen is really tidy in this video. <laughs> they, 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 they were people living in it. It was, this is a working kitchen with students, so fair play to them. They had no uh, no idea we were coming either, so it wasn't like they uh, they cleaned it up for us. This is just how they like it. Was yours not that clean, Isha? No, it wasn't, but I can tell that they keep theirs clean by the stickers on the fridge. Yeah, so fridge space, did you kind of assign each other shelves? Was that kind of how it works? You kind uh, of had a drawer? Yeah, yeah, so like you share, yeah, there's not enough for one drawer each. You had to, We did have to share, like two people share a shelf, two people share a drawer. Um, but yeah, but everyone was assigned. Nice, uh, so a couple more questions. Um, one for you, Deb, on health and safety then. So do all appliances need to be tested for safety, even small devices such as a wall light? Well, we, we do, we run uh, pack testing. So normally towards this, probably in October time, um, we have a pack testing company and, you know, the students take their items to get pack tested. If they've got a new item, then that doesn't normally need to get tested, providing they've still got the receipt. But they'll get information about the pack testing, you know, once they've arrived. Yeah. So if an item's under 12 months old, it doesn't need to be pat tested. Uh, you, you're covered for the first 12 months under its warranty. And then from there, you can kind of... It's just for peace of mind, isn't it, Deb? If you've, yeah, yeah, if you've yeah. got an item. I'd say the, 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 uh, normally, I mean, it was slightly different last year because of COVID again, but uh, in normal circumstances, they have the, the company in and doing all the pat testing. And then we get different dates that they go along and take their items, just get them tested. But also have a look at your plugs. If there's any, If they look a bit worn probably don't plug them in isn't it if there's if there's if the cable's frayed or anything like that isn't it deb just kind of play it safe a lot of it's common sense um lucas said are you allowed to have visitors over at all as in family or friends not from keel if so how long so deb this is kind of two-pronged isn't it because we've yeah. got pre-covid and then kind of COVID yeah i mean pre-covid uh, then you, you could uh you could book a visitor in and they could stay up to a maximum of three nights um you know, you could arrange for a camp bed as well, you know, for a charge. But at COVID and at the moment, then visitors aren't allowed overnight. The, the best just keeping a, a check on the website for updates, you know, anything related to COVID. Because, you know, obviously, as we move out of, you know, these strange times, then things will, you know, restrictions will, will get lifted. But, uh, you know, the information, there's a lot on the website about it. Uh, so a great question here because I know a lot of students like to put fairy lights up in the halls. Um, so Deb, there's a certain type of fairy light that they're allowed, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, they've got to be LED and with the kite mark on. But um, if they have a look on the on the website, it, it says there, but it's LED lights they, they can have, um, provided they've got the kite mark on. And just be careful on, uh, so some LED strips have really adhesive backs to them, yeah. don't they? So just yeah, be careful, be careful where you careful stick what them. you're doing because, you know, if you damage anything in the room, you know, if you're sticking things on the wall and that, then you are charged, you know, at your deposit. So, uh, you know, just be mindful of what, you know, what you're sticking on your walls and, and things. Uh, so another question. So what we'll do is I'll just replay this. So someone's asked what uh, what kind of appliances are in your rooms in S&T. So Isha, what did you get in your room? Um did you get like a lamp or anything like that? Um, there wasn't a lamp, no. I did have to bring my own. Um, yeah, it's basically everything that you see um, in the video, really. There is a light, a light above the mirror there. But if you want one next to your bed, then yeah. just bring bring a small one yourself. Yeah. And you need to bring your bed in and your duvet and, you know, your pillow and your home comfort sort of thing, you know. Um, I brought like um, kind of like drawers just for like extra storage space. Um, so I kept, you know, a lot of things in there which helped as well. Extra drawers. It's a lot of a lot of storage you need. 
Yeah, that's just me because I always, it was the first year, so I bought way more than I needed, probably twice as much as I needed. So at the end, when you had to move out, it took hours to get everything <laughs> from my room to the car. Nice. Uh, so Deb, just before we go, oh, are you going to say something there, Deb? I'm just going to say there is information as well on the website about what to bring, you know, and what not to bring. If they just put that in, uh, you know, which will just, you know, jog people's memory what in case they forget things. So just before we go then, uh, do you want to give us the pricing of each of these rooms then, Deb? So we've got Lindsay yeah. Court first. So Lindsay Court, the the other one, it's um, £166 and four pence per week. And four pence, the, nice, got it. Got the it. one that you've just seen, the classic at uh, Lindsay S, that's £107, 73 pence per week. Now these are this year's prices starting in September. Obviously for next year, um, they're normally on the website sort of January time. Brilliant. Well, thank you both for that. Isha, are you joining us for anything else today? Anything else in the terms of this tour? No. No, all done. Are you on UniBuddy, by the way? I'm not. You're not. But either way, if you need to chat to any students or staff, you can head to keel.ac.uk forward slash chat and you'll at least find the accommodation team on there. I know Deb's team are, are on UniBuddy mm -hmm. as well as other people as well. Uh, but Isha, thank you so much for giving us a tour around that. Uh, coming up in about three minutes' time, we'll be heading to our student finance Q&A with George and uh, she'll be joined by Abby from the student finance team. But other than that, thank you both. And Deb, okay. I'll see you, see you shortly. Yeah. Thank you, bye. Bye. Hello and welcome to this live Q&A session about student finance running as part of today's virtual open day. Really pleased to be joined by Abby, who is our financial support manager here at Kiel. Um, as part of our student services team, we have financial support specialists who can help you get to grips with money and finances whilst you're studying. We're going to be here for the next 20 minutes or so to answer any questions you might have about student finance and budgeting, um, as well as information about bursaries and scholarships. Um, so if you've got any questions, please do pop them in the chat. Before we get started, I'll just ask Abby to introduce herself. So over to you, Abby. Hi, like George said, my name's Abby. I'm the Financial Support Manager here at Keele. Um, our team works really closely with our other specialist teams across student services to make sure that we can put the most appropriate support in place for our students. 
Brill. Thanks, Abby. So could you perhaps start by giving us a bit of an overview of the financial support that is available to students whilst they're studying at university? So first and foremost is our information, advice and guidance service. So while you're a student at Keele, you'll have access to our financial support team if you have any queries or issues relating to finance. So whether that's an issue with your student finance application, an issue with um, budgeting and you're not quite sure on how to start with this, or if it's just um, that you're facing a little bit of financial hardship and need a bit of support. So anything you've got, um, any questions you've got about money or fees, funding, anything to do with finances, just please get in touch with Student Services while you're at Keele and we'll be able to help you with that. Um, we also have support in place for students who are facing financial hardship in the form of both emergency short-term loans and our hardship funds. So any student at Keele is able to apply for our hardship funds if you are facing financial difficulties and our hardship funds can award up to £1,500 um, per academic year to students. Um, it's a case-by-case -case basis but we make sure that when we're reviewing applications um, we take into account your individual circumstances so it's quite a tailored service. Well, thanks, Abby. And what about the support that's available through Student Finance England? So let's assume that, that people um, have no idea sort of what financial support they can access. Can you just give us an overview of, of the this, this financial support that students can uh, access throughout their time at uni? So if you're a UK student, you'll be able to apply for Student Finance. Um, you can go along to the Student Finance website. Um, there's different websites depending on where in the UK you live. Um, so if you live in England, for example, you would go to Student Finance England. If you live in Wales, you would go to Student Finance Wales. And it's important you go to the right, um, the right web pages because there is slightly different support available um, for students depending on where they come from in the UK. So you can have a look on their web pages. You should be able to find an entitlement calculator which will be able to show you how much student finance you might be able to get. Um, so you can access both a tuition fee loan, which goes direct to the university and covers the cost of your tuition fees. And you can also access a maintenance loan, which is intended to be a contribution towards your living costs. So while you're at university, there might be a variety of different living costs that you in, um, encounter. And so the maintenance loan is intended to contribute towards those costs. Depending on your individual circumstances, you might be able to get additional support. Um, for example, if you have a disability or you have children, um, have a look online, have a search on the government website. There's lots of different types of support available. So make sure that you have a look. Um, and if you are unsure of anything, just get in touch with us. Well, and how do students apply for their finance? So all student finance applications are online. Um, so you can go directly to the application process through the government website and it is quite an easy step-by-step -step process um, by which you go through the application. Um, you will need to upload um, and send in evidence um, to be able um, to get your application assessed. That evidence might depend on your circumstances so you can have a look online which will give you um, an overview of the different evidence you might need to send in. Um, if there are any issues, you can contact Student Finance directly by phone um, or email. Well, and is there like a specific deadline that students need to apply by for the following year's entry or is it sort of they can apply whenever, whenever they feel they need to? So there's no specific deadline of when you can apply. Um, if absolutely needs be, you can apply during the academic year itself. What we would advise is that if you're starting this September, you um, submit your application for student finance as soon as possible and um, it can take between six and eight weeks for student finance to process an application so by submitting it as soon as possible then that just ensures that you can get support in place for the start of your course and um, applications open for the following academic year in roughly um, March and April time so keep an eye on the student finance Facebook pages on their website um, and there will be updates posted on there as to when the applications open um, and like I said, the earlier you apply, the earlier you find out your entitlements and it just ensures that that support is in place from day one. Yeah, and that support, so um, in terms of the maintenance loan, um, how is that paid to students? Is it in instalments or is it sort of one lump sum that students then have to manage throughout the academic year? So the maintenance loan is paid in three instalments across the academic year at the start of each term. 
So there's a payment in October time, a payment in January time, and a payment usually at the end of Easter. Um, the first payment probably won't arrive in your bank account until the latter half of the first week. Um, so it's important that you try to build some savings, a small amount of savings, just to get you through the first couple of weeks, just in case there are any issues in that student finance maintenance loan being paid to you. And just to give students a bit of an idea um, with the maintenance loan, what are the kind of things that they need to use that for? So the sort of the key things that they need to make sure that they've budgeted for? So if you're going to be living away from home while you're at university, then you'll need to pay for your rent. Um, depending on the type of tenancy agreement you have, then you may need to pay for bills as well on top of that if you're living, for example, off campus. If you're living on campus, then your bills will be included at Keele. Um, other costs that you might need to pay out for are food costs, course costs, for example, if your course um, needs you to buy certain textbooks, um, although there are textbooks available at the library. Um, you might need to pay for travel, you might need to pay for any car expenses if you need to bring a car with you. Um, there are also the entertainment and leisure costs that you might want to spend while you're at university. University is much more than just the academic side um, and so there are lots of different things you might want to get involved in. So it's really important that you account for that when you're starting your budgeting um, so that you understand roughly how much income you're going to need across the year to know whether or not you need to top up um, your maintenance loan with, for example, a part time job. It's quite a skill, isn't it, as well, budgeting. I think especially, you know, the kind of uh, the maintenance loan, when it comes in, it might look like sort of quite a large amount of money. But, you know, when you think about that, you've got to make that last you sort of that first period. So um, can the team help students sort of get to grips with budgeting? And what kind of things have we got on offer to help students to do that? So if you'll be starting at Keele in this September, September 2021, um, once you get your Keele login account, you'll be able to sign up to our partner, Black Bullion, um, where you can log in and go through an, an online budgeting session. Um, you can learn all about different budgeting hints and tips, budgeting techniques, um, but you'll also be able to build your own, your own tailored budget, uh, which you can use across the year. If you have got any issues in using the online system, you're more than welcome to make an appointment with one of our, one of our student experience and support team um, to be able for us to help you and um, to construct that budget. Um, obviously, everyone is completely different when it comes to costs that are coming in and out um, of your bank account. So it's, it's important that you look specifically at your own um, circumstances so that you know what costs you will have um, rather than the average student. Yeah, absolutely. And we've had a question from Alaya um, who's asking, does the maintenance loan get paid in three equal amounts? So usually um, two of them will be equal and one of them will be slightly less. Um, so once you've had your student finance entitlement letter, um, that will first of all outline how much maintenance allowance you can get across the full year. And it will also tell you how much money will be paid in each instalment. Um, so once you've got that letter through, that's when you can really start to budget uh, because you'll know exactly how much money will be coming to you on each specific date. Yeah, absolutely. And we've had a question from Morgana who's asking, um, for international students, when do you recommend applying for your student finance for study in 2022? So as with anything, I would advise that you apply as soon as the applications become open um, for that academic year. Applying as soon as they open just means that um, you're getting in early, making sure that you've got things in place um, rather than leaving them until later. Um, obviously, our, our main worry is that if you were to apply later on, um, closer to the start time of your course, then it just might mean that you might not have support in place when you start the course. Yeah, yeah. So get those applications in earlier rather than later. I suppose as well, it's just factoring in that time that if there are any queries on the application as well, if you've applied really early, then you've got more than enough time to sort of make sure that all that evidence is there with student finance and that, you know, you've got time to get that all that in place before you actually start. And you're not going to run into hardship when you sort of start the course. Yeah, definitely. Brilliant. Um, so, so we've touched on student finance. Um, that sort of most students would be eligible for. Are there any other sort of uh, government loans or any other schemes that uh, students on particular courses might be eligible for at all? Yes, so if you're going to be studying an NHS um, related course, for example, physiotherapy or nursing, 
um, you might be able to get a learning support fund from the NHS. Okay. Have a look online. Um, there's a website called NHS ESA. Um, have a look on there and you'll be able to look at the entitlement um, and eligibility on there. So you can have a look. Different courses might be entitled to slightly more learning support fund than others. And um, so it's important to just have a look for your individual course that you'll be studying to make sure you know how much you could get. Um, if you're going to be studying in the 2021 academic year this September, please have a look sooner rather than later, again, just to make sure you can get that financial support um, sooner um, and so that there's no delays in getting that support. Um, depending on um, your circumstances as well, like I said earlier, if you have, for example, a disability, you might be able to get um, dis disabled students allowance. So if it is that you do have a disability, have a chat with our DDS team here at Keele um, and we'll be able to talk you through the DSA process if you have any questions. Um, there are lots of different useful videos and information articles online. You can also have a look through for DSA. So do have a look through. Um, it's likely that you will need some form of evidence to be able to apply for DSA. So it might be worth having a chat with your doctor at the moment, your GP, just to check that you've got the evidence in place. Um, but if you have got any questions about that, again, speak with our DDS team. Um, and like I said again earlier about if you have children, you might be entitled to the parents' learning allowance and also a childcare grant. Um, have a look online. Again, there's different eligibility criteria. Um, so please double check. Um, and if you have any questions, again, just please get in touch with us. Yeah, fab. Thanks, Abby. And in terms of bursaries and scholarships, totally appreciate these change year on year. So you might only be able to give an example of what's on offer this year. Um, but have Keel offered any sort of bursaries and scholarships for students at all? So if you're going to be starting with us this September, um, if you are a UK student with a household income of below £15,000, you may be entitled to our Keele University bursary. Um, all of the eligibility criteria is on our web pages. You don't need to apply for this bursary, but you do need to make sure that you're sharing your, you agree to share your information with the university on your student finance application. Mm -hmm. um, once you've shared your household income with student finance, make sure to tick the box to share the information with the university. That is then an automatic process that you would be assessed to be for your eligibility for that award. Well, thanks, Abby. We've had a question submitted from Romy. Um, if you had student finance six years ago, but you had to leave the course due to ill health, can you apply, apply again or do you only get that one chance to apply? What I would advise you do is get in touch with us directly. Every student is completely different um, and so we really need to look into your individual circumstances. But we're more than happy to have a look into that for you today. Yeah, brilliant. And what's the best way of getting in touch with you, Abby, throughout today? So I will be on Unibuddy um, up until five o'clock today. So if you have got any questions and you wanted to get in touch with us, please just feel free to get in touch via Unibuddy. Well, thanks. And uh, what we'll try and do is pop Abby's profile um, in the chat, um, Romy, so you can uh, find Abby's profile easily. Um, Brill, so uh, let's have a think about uh, some of the other questions that we had um, pre-submitted. So um, we had a question about whether it's normal to have a part-time job whilst um, studying at university and whether that's sort of required for that additional financial support. So we would expect that most students would get a part-time job while studying at university um, simply for the reason that the maintenance loan, like I said earlier, is intended to be a contribution towards your living costs um, and it often doesn't cover the entirety of your living costs during your time at university. So depending on your course, you might have different intensities of course content. Um, so once you've got your timetable through, um, you'll be able to have a look at your availability um, and to work out whether or not you're able to commit um, a certain amount of hours every week, for example, um, to a part-time job. You can have a chat with our careers team and you can also look on search engines such as Indeed to have a look at jobs in the local area. Um, there are lots of different types of jobs available locally here at Keel. Um, so have a look, see what types of jobs there are. Um, but yes, we would definitely um, advise you look into a part-time job while you're studying at Keel. Well, well, thanks, Abby. We've had a question um, sent in about uh, family aid available for international students. Is that something that you could advise on, Abby, at all? Again, this might depend on individual circumstances, so I definitely advise getting in touch. Yeah. Um, I would advise 
as an international student, if you email into us rather than use Unibuddy, it yeah. just means you're able to pass that on to the most appropriate team um, next week. Yeah, absolutely. And what's the best email address, Abby? Is there a generic one that we can signpost students to? Yes, yeah, so it's just our student services email, student.services at keel.ac.uk. And again, we'll try and get the team to pop that in the chat as well. Um, so obviously we've talked about the application, we've talked about how that, that sort of finance is received and sort of budgeting throughout the year. What about when you graduate and it comes to sort of repaying uh, your student loan? Um, can you give us a bit of an overview of how that works? I think there's, sometimes there's some myths that go flying around about, you know, the more you borrow, the more you're going to pay back and that kind of thing. So just give us a bit of an overview of how repayments actually work. So once you finish your course, um, you'll then need to start repaying your loan. Um, repayments from student finance at the moment work in a way um, that you don't start repaying that loan until you're earning over a certain threshold. So if you earn under that threshold, you won't start repaying that loan. Um, it depends, that threshold depends on each year and it changes year on year. So it's important to keep double checking the government website to find out what it is in that current year. Um, but the threshold at the moment is roughly um, between 25 and 30. Um, thousand, but like I said, it does change year on year, so keep checking. Um, once you're repaying, what you would be um, looking to come out of your account um, is 9% of whatever you're earning above the threshold. Um, so because it's on that percentage-based um, format, um, what that means is you're never going to be worse off by earning more. So have a look on the government website to find the current rules um, for repayments, but keep in mind that they do change every year in terms of that threshold amount. Um, like you said before, when it comes to repaying your student loan, often there are a lot of myths about the more you borrow, the more you'll end up paying back every month. And that's just not the case because repayments is based on your earnings post-graduation rather than what you borrow. Yeah. Now it is true that the more you earn, um, the more you will pay back. And so over the repayment time, if you have borrowed more, you're likely to pay more back. Um, whereas if you've borrowed a smaller amount, it might be that if you're earning quite a lot of money after university, you might end up repaying um, all of that back sooner. Um, after 30 years, um, after you finish your course, any debt that you've got remaining with student finance gets wiped, um, which means that that debt isn't carried on um, after that point it's never passed on to anybody else it stays with you um, so if you have got any questions about repayment like I said earlier just please get in touch yeah so key take home message there then is that the amount that you will repay a month is not based on what you borrow it's based on your salary so essentially make sure you you know you get the financial support that you do need to sort of get you through your university experience definitely well, and then just to touch on Abby, um, what if student circumstances change while they're at university? So when they apply for their when they apply for their student finance, their circumstances are, you know, as they are. And then as they enrol or throughout the academic year, something changes and, and they perhaps need additional support. How can students navigate their options there? What sort of what is available to them? So if your circumstances change during the academic year, you might be able to um, change your entitlement with student finance. But again, this does really depend on your individual circumstances. So if your household income changes, you might be able to get your application reassessed to see whether or not you're able to get an increase in your maintenance loan. So in that case, what we'd advise is that you contact student finance directly um, and ask them if you're able to um, submit your new household um, data so that they're able to make a new application assessment um, for that current academic year. Depending on the, your circumstances during the year, um, I mean, we all know that things don't always go to plan. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes there are little or big things that come up along the way that can really impact our finances. Um, if there is anything unexpected and unforeseen that happens during your time at university um, that is impacting on your finances, please get in touch with the student services team. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we do have a hardship fund here at Keel. Um, so we can um, assess an application to the hardship fund to see whether or not we're able to offer any financial support. Um, and obviously we do have our emergency loans as well. Yeah. And then one final question, Abby. Do students need to reapply every single year for their student finance or is it just that they apply at the start of their 
course and then that's it. So you'll need to reapply for student finance for every year of the course. Um, so once you're at university, please keep an eye out still on the student finance website and um, on the student finance social medias um, just to keep in, up to date with when that application opens every year. It is roughly March to April time every year, but just keep an eye out. Um, and the same as if it was your first year, applying sooner rather than later just means you've got um, a much better chance of getting that support in place for the start of your next year. Brill. And we've just had a question sent in from Luke um, asking about how much can sort of academic books cost on average per year. I suppose there's sort of a bigger theme there, isn't there, about sort of um, you said courses that are attributed to your uh, costs that are attributed to your course, like certain books and that kind of thing. What advice would you give students on, on that? So course textbooks can cost um, quite a lot and it does depend on your course as to what textbooks you might need to read. Um, at Keele we have a really fabulous library um, mm -hmm. so have a look on our web pages to have a look at what support you can get from the library in terms of textbooks. As well as physical, physical books we also have access to online libraries where you might be able to access your textbooks remotely and um, through your laptop or your computer. Um, so have a look at what we've got available. It might be that you can get through your entire course without buying a single textbook um, because they might all be available at the library. So before you commit yourself to buying all of your books that you might need, always check the library first. And if it is that your course requires you to read a certain textbook and there isn't a copy of that in the library, have a chat to the library team. Um, it might be that they're able to purchase that textbook so that a lot of students can access that while at Keele. And um, so it's always worth the conversation just to make sure that you're accessing any support that we can provide as a university rather than making that payment yourself if we can. Yeah, absolutely. I think, to be honest, Abby, you've sort of just um, reiterated something that has been coming out of most of these sort of sessions, that just talk to us if you've got any queries or concerns about anything. And even if it's before you arrive at Keele, um, just get in touch and we're, we're always happy to help and signpost you to the most appropriate team. Yeah. Brill. Well, that does bring us to the end of this session. Um, so thank you very much for joining us for the Q&A and thanks, Abby, uh, for being available to answer all those questions. Apologies if there were any questions that we didn't get to. As Abby said, she's on Unibuddy throughout the day um, and we've asked the team to pop Abby's uh, profile in the chat. So fingers crossed she'll be able to find Abby's profile nice and easily. Coming up in around just, just over five minutes time, uh, we've got our third accommodation tour of the day, which is showing a classic plus room in Hallwood Hall. Thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of our virtual open day. Thanks both. And just before we head to the schedule screen, I'm going to quickly run through all of the things uh, that you can make the most out of today off stream as well. So again, we're here on Facebook and Twitter, uh, Facebook and YouTube, sorry, uh, until 4 p.m. today. But there's so much else going on uh, across um, the event today. So hopefully you've all signed up and you'll have uh, the hub page in your inbox. Uh, if you haven't, I don't think it's too late. Uh, the, the event's still here, so you can book your place, fill in the form and you'll get sent that information via email from there as well. Um, so here's the hub page. Again, just to mention, today's open day is focused at 2022 entry, but if you're here uh, and are still looking for a place in 2021, stay with us because all of the information is still quite relevant uh, and still should be useful to you as well. Um, but if you're looking for uh, the specific entry uh, uh Entry information for 2021. Uh, you can have a different applicant, applicant hub page. You go to keel.ac.uk forward slash applicant hub 2021. One more time on that, it's keel.ac.uk forward slash applicant hub 2021. And there's just slight differences in some of the information uh, for you on there. But again, all the information on stream today should be relevant to you as well, uh, whichever entry year you're looking at. The hub page has general information talks. Uh, these are pre on demand talks. So on things like accommodation, careers and employability, uh, global opportunities. So have a browse through these in your own time. You don't have to get through all this today. It is on demand content. So uh, in the next sort of week or so, feel free to watch these at your leisure. Most importantly is the live talks. Uh, so again, we're here till 4 p.m. and you can see our schedule here. Um, and then as well, there are all the uh, course talks happening on Microsoft Teams. There's lots going on. So if I'm interested in psychology, uh, I've got one-to-one -one chat. Let's try and find one who's got one a talk coming up. That's just finishing. Just finishing. I'll find one, I promise. 
There's one. History at Kiel, 215. So if you're interested in history, there's another talk at 215. Uh, and these are on Microsoft Teams. So if you just click the join link, uh, it'll take you to a page. If you haven't got an account, don't worry. You can join as a guest. If you have got an account, great. You'll join as an authenticated user. So either way, you'll be able to make it into those tours. Then there is the virtual tour, the self-guided virtual tour, which is virtualtour.keel.ac.uk. And you can just have a look around campus in your own leisure. Um, so again, looking around some of our facilities and having a look at videos uh, of the new Huxley extension, the Sir David Attenborough Laboratories. Uh, so make use of that in your own time, virtualtour.keel.ac.uk. And then finally, the best thing I think is keel.ac.uk forward slash chat, where you can have one-to-one -one conversations uh, with staff and students from across the university. You pop in your level of study, your area. I was doing history, I'm going to do history. Uh, and I can chat to Daniel, and Daniel's going to be joining us later on to give us a campus tour as well. Um, so I can chat to Daniel about history there, and I can also see staff across the university and chat to some of the staff. And who knows, you might end up chatting to uh, one of the lecturers who might end up teaching you on your course if you do end up coming to Kiel. Uh, so it's great, keel.ac.uk forward slash chat. As George said, George said, in about five minutes' time, we'll be heading to where are we 12 30 we're heading to our third accommodation tour which is Horwood. Uh, i'm going to be joined by deb um and abby for that and we're going to show us around Horwood. so uh yeah stick around for that um so yeah i'll see you in uh, just about three minutes time Hello and welcome back. Welcome to our third accommodation tour of today where we're going to take a look around Horwood, uh, the Horwood site on our campus. So I'm joined again by Deb and this time by Abby. Uh, so we'll get you both to introduce yourselves just in case anyone new is joining us. We'll start with you, Abby. Do you want to say who you are and what you study at Kiel? Yep. Hi, I'm Abby and I'm a pharmacy student and we're going into my fourth year this September. Amazing. And Deb, just for anyone new, same thing. Yeah, I'm Deb and I work in the student accommodation team. 
Fantastic. So as I say, we're going to have a look around. As you think of any questions, there are there are no silly questions. So pop them in the chat and I can ask them to either Abby or Deb. Now just before we go through, Abby, you've not actually lived in Horwood, have you? But you've had lots of friends in there and you've spent a lot of time in Horwood kind of yeah. socialising. And yeah, you've a seen lot of it. friends. Yep. Yeah. So you've seen it uh, from a first person's point of view anyway. So any questions about accommodation at Kiel, uh, drop them in the chat and I can ask them to either Abby or Deb as we go. Um, but as we always do, we'll start by having a look at where Horwood is uh, in relation to everything else on campus. And Horwood is great because it is literally right next to the centre of campus, isn't it, Abby? It's literally a stone's throw away. Um, so you'll see it here highlighted in blue. Um, so Abby, what sort of things have we got dotted around Horwood then? Yeah, so I think Horwood is probably the closest to the heart of campus. Um, so in Horwood itself, it's very close to Keel Hall. Um, which is a very pretty part of Kiel, um, big greenery, uh, good for picnics on summer, summer days and stuff like that. Um, within, um, even when it's winter as well, lovely, lovely scenery in Kiel Hall. Uh, within Hallwood itself, um, KPA is there, which is a Kiel Postgraduate Association. Um, and that's like a little pub, basically, you can get some nice food and drink. Um, you've also got the GP surgery there as well. Um, and as I said, it's near the heart of campus, um, so very close to shops, the SU, the library. Um, so very convenient um, accommodation. Yeah. So if you really don't like walking, I mean, you're not going to save yourself a great deal of time, but if you're really not keen on walking, you just want to be able to kind of um, stumble to the centre of campus, who was the one for you, isn't it? And Abby, have you seen that the KPA has actually had a nice refurb recently? Yeah, I've seen that. It looks a lot more uh, oh, really a, nice, I, actually. Yeah. I went in there on Friday. It looks amazing. Very um, vibrant colors. Yeah, I really yeah. Uh, yeah, no, excited to go back, actually. So uh, Jules, who who runs the KPA, I popped in and she was in there. Um, and I said, who's who's who picked the colors? And she said, I did. It's very, <laughs> if you if you know Jules, it's very it's very good. Very, very <laughs> vibrant. But it, it's so cool. Uh, and is, is really it was a great place before that. But now it's, it's even better. Um, so what we'll do is we'll head to the exterior forward so you can have a look around. We don't actually see the KPA. It's just on the left now, isn't it, Abby? Yeah. Um, but yeah, show us around. Um, tell us a bit about Horwood. What kind of stuff did you get up to when you were here with your with your friends? Yep. So as you said, KP is on the left, and then as you come this side, there's a lot of greenery um, here. So nice for summer days. Again, you can come out, revise, um, picnics. So I see some picnic benches there. Um, so you've got a few flats. I think it's A, and then it goes up to D and E on that side. Um, so as you keep on walking across, on the your laundrette will be on the further up, basically. Um, and this is where you can do all your laundry there. So you'll get given a card at the beginning um, called a circuit laundry card. Um, so as you see, it's like that white building there. Um, and you just top it up um, online and you can do your drying and your washing of clothes there, and it's quite handy. Um, as you can see, there's a car park and that's a GP surgery car park. So as I've mentioned already, there is a GP surgery. So this is for all of campus and even some residents outside in Kiel Village. Um, but really handy if your GP surgery is just there. Um, and from my experience, the GPs have been really good. You can tend to get an appointment on the same day, if not in, within the next few days. Um, uh, so, yeah. It's really useful, isn't it? So, so I know there's, it's, obviously, if you live in Horwood, it's great because it's literally on your doorstep, isn't it? But it is kind of the campus-wide and local area-wide GP, isn't it? Yeah, exactly, um, yeah. That you just sign up to. So, I, just in case anyone's wondering, you just kind of sign up on the, when you arrive, don't you? Yeah, so normally um, on the first day, you'll do all that um, administration work. So, you put your address and just sign up, and they'll register with your local GP, um, take some um, things like weight and height and stuff. But yeah, and then from then, you can start using the services. So, really efficient and really good. Amazing. So, Deb, Horwood, in terms of its room types, then actually. Yeah. They're all kind of the same. There's not that much variation in Hallward. No, you've just, you've just got the two room types. You've got the Hallward shared flat stroke houses and then the classic plus, which are rooms with a wash basin in them. So it's just the two. And the, are, are they in a specific place there? Because you've got, you've got the Z sheds, what kind of room Yeah, are well, they? the Zs that you like, uh, they're the Hallward <laughs> shared flats and houses, they are. Nice. I'd highly recommend them. If you like living in, I don't know, Lord of the Rings or, or some sort of... <laughs> Hobbit Hut, it's they're great because they're not. That's, I say Hobbit Hut, but they're not small. They're really big. Oh, um, they're yeah. really big in size. Yeah, they're awesome. Um, yeah, so there's the GP just in front of us there. Um, so yeah, and then sharing, Deb. Just in case anyone's wondering, do, yeah, do you know the sharing ratios. Yeah, so the Horde shared flats and houses are between six and eight, and then obviously you've got your classic plus. Again, they vary. I think the I think the highest one I think is up to 
20, uh, yeah, 20, 23 per kitchen, the highest one is, but each block is different. So if you just have a look on the website, uh, the, all the ratios are on there. Um, so Abby, where did, where did your friends live, by the way? In the Z sheds. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. So as you said, like they look small from outside, but they're actually really nice inside quite a big communal area and kitchen, kitchens especially yeah. quite big. I'll um, just point out which ones we're on about, just in case anyone's wondering. So it's these ones, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, those ones, yeah. Um, and then even the showers are lovely. And even like the rooms as well, like they're quite spaced out within the block. So it, you don't feel like claustrophobic or anything. It's really nice. And they're yeah. kind of like, look, look at the slant on the roof. They're like yeah. into the into the landscape. <laughs> but then you get these huge, like double height kitchens, don't you, in them with a huge yeah, ceiling space. Big kitchens. Yeah. yeah. They're, really they're definitely my favourite. Um, but what we're going to do, we're heading into, oh, I've got Google, Google Earth has gone crazy, uh, but we're heading into this block here, which is, I think, A. Yeah, A. Uh, so we'll have a look around A in just a minute. Yep, so let's go inside. There we go. Um, so, Abby, I know you didn't live here, but in terms of uh, access into here, I think, Deb, actually, it's key or card on the outside, is it? No, it's key. Um, the key for... Key all the way through. Yeah, yeah. I think it's key, the same key on the outside door and your actual room door, which is quite handy um Perfect. and then yeah, so abby shows around the room yeah so as you go in you've got your desk um shelves on the top bedside table bed um and around the corner you've got a cupboard as well um and this one has a wash basin wash basin i believe as well um so that's quite handy having that they don't have to go to, don't always have to go to the kitchen or the bathroom um and I th as you can see like quite a spacious room um lots of light coming in so it's not you know it's, it's nice to live there um and yeah single bed um but very manageable um and any ideas if this one's got under the storage uh, under the bed storage deb yeah, oh, it, it looks like it has actually yeah, yeah. So a lot of my stuff went under the bed Inside so things under yeah very handy <clears throat> um and then with like kitchen um so you do share a kitchen and a bathroom with other people in your flat um, so we'll, we'll have we'll pop down to those in just a minute so abby in terms of as i say we the rooms that we've toured today um some of the, the props that you see in here are, are props. The, no one's actually in this room, um, so don't judge their decor skills or anything like that. But in terms of your room, how did you make it your own? Yeah, so um, I quite like putting pictures in my room um, of like family and friends and stuff. So once I moved in, I see the pin board there. Um, so you can pin stuff on, like handy reminders and stuff. So I put fairy lights in my room as well. It's quite nice. I did some lighting so to make it a bit more uh, feel at home. Um, so yeah, no. Um, you want you can really make it your own um, own room. It's quite nice. Any any plants? Personally, no. But as I said, my friends had a lot of cactuses on the window and stuff like that. I've just seen one there actually. Um, did they manage to keep them alive? Yeah, yeah, they did. They Good. did. Uh, took them home with them in in the bricks and stuff. Um, but yeah, no. It's always nice to personalise your room because you're coming back to it at the end of the day. Um, so you want to make it as cosy as possible. Is it kind of, do you spend, do you find yourself, obviously you sleep in your room, but do you find yourself spending a lot of time in, in there or is it kind of personal preference because there are obviously a lot of different spaces that you can go to? Yeah, I mean, I found that um, when I was making food, um, I'd very much be socialising uh, with friends, making food with friends. So that was nice. And with having a big kitchen, um, it's, that social space is there. Um, and more so for studying as in the library, um, either in a one-to-one -one space or again with friends. Um, so I wasn't really in my room a lot, I would say, um, just sleeping and getting ready. Um, but if you wanted to, you know, study in your room, for example, it, you can still do that. Um, you've got a lovely big desk and you've got shelves to put books on, um, so it's still very manageable. Brilliant. Uh, I've had a question in, is it possible to see the shared accommodation in Block Z? So we're not actually touring Z today, we're just doing this um block a in hallwood but they're very similar in terms of the rooms aren't they deb yeah i mean in the hallwood z so uh, you, you've basically got your room with your single bed again you know wardrobe desk um that uh, cabinet and then you'll share your bathroom in your kitchen like i say if it's a hallwood z they're asking about then like i say they are big kitchens as as we've just said uh, and then like i say you share the bathroom with the other students so we're just heading across the corridor now into the, the bathroom facilities. So, Abby, do you want to talk us through kind of how this works in Horwood? Yeah, um, so I think some people get a bit worried that maybe, you know, is, is it always going to be free. But um, everyone has different schedules. Um, so it's, I've never had to wait, um, you know, to use the bathroom. There's normally, there's always like more than one toilet. 
Um, and then the showers is, uh, you just press in, it's a button. I think this one is, yeah. Um, so you just tap it and it will come on automatically. Um, and yeah, really nice showers. Um, so yeah. And I think someone was saying when they, uh, when they're in shared facilities, what they do is they get a, a hamper with all their kind of toiletries in that they can carry to and from their room. Um, so you can have your own, you know, these shower stuff that you just carry in a bag. Yeah. I had like a little basket plastic there. basket that we could, we tend to just leave in there, or as you said, carry it in between. Um, and then toilet roll, we just used to share, um, split yeah. between us um so yeah quite easy going actually yeah here's the kitchen that really nice sort of social space in the kitchen isn't it Did you kind of find yourself having meals together with friends in here yeah this is it i mean it's such a nice social space as you can see the table there so we'd all either probably we made a meal quite often together and then sit there chat for quite a while um so the kitchen is really nice and spacious um and with, in terms of cupboard as well normally you will get a private space so you can put all your stuff there um, and same thing with um, fridges and freezers. You probably get a shelf at least, um, if maybe a bit less, um, but nothing to worry about. Um, if you just go there and speak to your flatmates, it's, it's, it's very reasonable living um, conditions. Um, and as I said, yeah, big spaces, nice um, worktops, so very, yeah, very good. And obviously these, you do share with more people in the kitchen and that's kind of why the kitchen is therefore bigger, isn't it, Deb? The kitchen's scale, don't they, depending yeah. on how, how many yeah. people you're sharing with. This is approximately, I think, seven, yeah, 17 approximately this. Which sounds like a lot, Abby, but obviously you've been in here with friends, haven't you? Was it ever kind of too crowded? Did you find people were on top of each other? Uh, so no, this is what I'm saying. Like when you're cooking, everyone's got such different schedules. Um, some have lectures in the afternoon, some in the morning, um, extracurricular. Um, so I never really found it an issue at all. If you're cooking as friends, maybe you'd have your French group in there. Um, but you were never, you know, you never felt like one people, one person was on top of another. As you say, because the kitchen's so big, um, you could have some people in one corner and then some people in the other corner. So you're never like really, um, it's never that crowded at all. So I wouldn't be too worried about cooking times and stuff. It tends to work out quite well. Good question here, Deb. Um... On what basis is accommodation allocated? So how do you guys as a team allocate accommodation to people? Yeah, well, obviously, um, it's your, your firm choice first and then um, your insurance and then clearing at the end. And you have to apply by a, a set date, um, 30th of June, if it kills your firm or your insurance choice. That may change next year. It may be go back to May. It used to be the end of May. And then it's like a random allocation, you know, so it's sort of fair. Obviously, people put the preferences of accommodation down the first, second and third, and then it'll look at allocating them the first, second and third choice. But obviously, if we haven't the availability, then it'll allocate what, you know, what we've got. So it isn't a first come, first serve? No, it's not first come, first served. Like I said, the main thing is if Keel is your firm or your insurance choice, then you must apply by the deadline. Like I say, this year it was 30th of June. I think next year it'll probably go back to normal, which was the 31st of May. It's just been extended this year and was last year because of covid you see deadline. and it it is best to put a couple of options down isn't it deb rather than yeah, banking on one put, one accommodation you know, block. don't like if for example people were wanting on on suite don't just put on suite on suite on suite because obviously then if we can't accommodate you in on suite we wouldn't know what you know you'd be interested as a, you know as another option you see so it's sort of then we've got to work out what you what you perhaps you know looking at so we do say put three different choices down and if someone's unhappy with what they get allocated, Deb, what are kind yeah, of options once from they arrive that? in September, well, they could request a room move uh, once they move in in September. Yep, perfect. And also, there is also off campus, isn't there? Um, so you can always, if you're really, really unhappy there are, and you, you want kind of your own space, um, yeah, the accommodation team can help you with off campus stuff. Yeah, can't we, they? we run a website called Keel Student Pad, uh, which is, you know, there's a surplus amount of off campus accommodation in the local area. We'd only recommend that site though, because the landlords who advertise are accredited with the local council. So, um, don't you know, sort of just go to a random, you know, poster on the wall and contact them. They, they are accredited, sort of thing. These, these ones are. So, Abby, are you fourth year? Did you say? Yeah, going into my fourth year in September. <laughs> so, talk us through your accommodation journey at Kiel. That. So, did you did you stay in Holly Cross? Was it Holly Cross you stayed in, in your first year? Holly Cross first year, and then second and third year was off campus, and going into another off campus this year as well. Um, and how did you find your off campus then? How did you kind of uh, go around go about sorting that? Yeah, so it was through Kiel Student Pad actually the first year, um, and we ended up finding looked through a few places. As you said, there's surplus amounts of 
off-campus accommodation really close and a thing that was quite key to us was being close to campus um, so we were literally five minutes if that um, drive away from campus um, and the good thing about Kiel was they helped you so once we got our contract we brought it to the SU and they looked at it and made sure it was legitimate and everything seemed all right so that was really helpful for students who hadn't looked for off-campus accommodation ever um, so that was a really good thing. Nice. And who did you actually live with then? How did you find your... So obviously when you when you get put in accommodation um, in your first year, you don't kind of know who you're living with, do you? How did you meet the people that you then went on to live with from there? Yeah, so they're all my course mates. Um, I got on with my flatmates first year, um, but I think um, my course mates, I'm really close to them. So we decided to get a house together and they're, they're who I'm moving in with for my fourth year. So we've just ended up staying together. Uh, th- so you had three years with them? With, three years, yeah. I mean, some have left, some have come in. Um, but yeah. The, the ones that we started off with are still there. Because <laughs> you're a, you're a quite a different course. Yours is quite you know yours isn't the traditional three year course, is it? Yours is, is yeah. I mean, I say a disadvantage with course mates is it gets quite tense in the house during exam period, uh, exam <laughs> season. But otherwise, it's lovely to live with them. So yeah. <laughs> so what mix did you get in your first year then? When you was and how did you find kind of um, moving in with people that you, you don't kind of know who you're going to live with? How how was that? Yeah, so as you said, I think as most people would um, feel quite nerve wracking, um, but you really have to put yourself out there. Um, so when I moved in, um, everyone was really lovely. And that first night, we'd, I'd say make use of Freshers Week. And that doesn't mean going out, but it means all the little events. So I went to the chapel the first night and they were just giving free food and having everyone sit down and talk. But I actually met so many people, um, a girl on my course who's now my best friend, um, just by chance. So like, I'd say really go out, put yourself out there, go to the sports events and everything so you can get to know each other. Um, with regards to flatmates, uh, we all got on really well. Um, we used to ten- not really see each other because we had separate schedules, but at meal times we'd see each other quite a lot. So that was really nice. Nice. And there's also the I've heard some people kind of meet. I know that not everyone probably is able to do this, but some people go on the the student life group on Facebook, don't they, and post where they are. And sometimes people yeah. meet their entire flat before they've arrived yeah. through, through social media. So that didn't happen with me. I, I mean, I put something, but I couldn't find people on there but it does happen quite a lot that you can um see who's who's in your flat and then already know them prior to coming so it releases a bit of the, the pressure um so yeah, yeah so if you're interested in joining that the the 2021 uh and you, if you so if you join us in september the 2021 to 2022 group is actually now set up uh, it's run by keel students union if you search for keel official student life group on facebook you should be able to find it and the, again, if you are joining in September, there'll be loads of people posting. I'm in Horwood, A, whatever. They'll be posting where they are and you can all try and find each other in there. Deb, just before we wrap up then, do you want to give us the pricing of that room we've just seen? So it's £113.40 per week. That's the classic plus. And I know we didn't see them, but the Horwood shared flats and houses, just in case anybody's interested, is um, £115.57 per week. And again, the, this year's price is starting in September. If anybody's you know looking at next year, then um, they're on the website normally January time. And give us that a date to apply by again, Deb. What was it? Well, for next year, I'll, I will say, well, I'd say 31st of May, but keep an eye on the website. Because like I say, this year it had been extended to 30th of June. So I'm presuming it'll go back to normal, which is by the end of the 31st of May next year. But just get it in early and you'll have peace of mind that it's all done. and You don't have to worry about your, your accommodation, do you? Yeah, it normally opens up sort of beginning of February time. Nice. And Abby, before we go, I know we'll see you again at Holy Cross, but um, what was what was your favourite thing about Hallwood when you used to go and visit? Um, to be honest with you, I used the KP. I was there every week. So I loved it being, because all my friends were in Hallwood. So I loved just, it was so close. It was really nice. Um, and I said it, it being so close to campus, just the library is really close. And I use the library quite a lot as well. So I would say convenient. Um, it's probably is the closest to everything. Everything's there. The shops are there. The pharmacy's there. So really handy. Amazing. Uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to head off, uh, back to our schedule screen and we'll be back in just about five minutes time uh, where George is going to be joined by uh, Ben from our careers and employability team for our careers careers and employability at Keel live Q&A uh, and then we'll be back right after that at 25 past one for our final accommodation tour uh, of Holly Cross and the Oaks it'll be us three again because Abby's actually this is where Abby actually lived uh, so Abby will be guiding us around Holly Cross and the Oaks then 
Um, so yeah, so I'll see you both uh, in a short while. Okay. Bye. Bye. Keele is surrounded by a wealth of culture and arts, theatres, museums and local attractions, cinemas and shops. There are shops and bars on campus, but if you fancy a change of scene, you can hop on a bus just outside the Students' Union. Our nearest town is Newcastle under Lyme, which is only 10 minutes away. Newcastle has a fantastic high street with lots of cafes, bars, pubs and restaurants plus four supermarkets including Aldi, Lidl, Morrisons and Sainsbury's. In the centre of Newcastle you'll find the Limelight Boulevard which is home to View Cinema, Laser Quest and Escape Room. Just down the road is the New Vic Theatre where you can enjoy a range of shows, comedians and artists. Stoke-on-Trent is the closest city and it's only 20 minutes away. Into Potteries is packed with a variety of shops and includes The Hive, which has restaurants and a place to see the latest films at Cineworld. It's also home of the Cultural Quarter, which is the hub of creative and entertainment venues, which includes the Regent Theatre, Victoria Hall and the Mitchell Arts Centre. You can also visit the Potteries Museum and Art Gallery or the Emma Bridge Water Factory, where you can try your hand at decorating your own piece of pottery. Just across the way from Hanley is Festival Park, which includes a variety of shops and restaurants, Odeon Cinema, Ten Pin Bowling, a dry ski slope and Water World. Looking to go for a day out nearby? There are so many places to explore all within an hour of campus. Whether you're looking for an exciting day out or a peaceful walk around Britain's biggest campus, Kiel offers the best of both worlds. Good afternoon and welcome to this live Q&A session looking at careers and employability services here at Kiel, running as part of today's virtual open day. I'm George, really pleased to be joined by Ben, one of our careers consultants, and we're going to be here for the next 20 minutes or so to answer any questions you might have about careers and employability. Before we get started, I'll just hand over to Ben and ask him to introduce himself. So over to you, Ben. 
Hello everyone, thanks for attending today. My name's Ben, I'm a careers consultant here at Keele University and I work specifically with the School of Social, Political and Global Studies and also Keele Business School. So um, we have a team of careers consultants and each careers consultant has faculty and schools that they're uh, specifically responsible for. So I've worked for Keele since uh, 2012, so nine years now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I'm it's a great place to, to study, great great campus to live. Um, yeah, I'm happy to answer your questions and I'm hoping to get some really good questions in the session today. Brilliant. Cheers, Ben. So I suppose the best place to start is perhaps if you could give us an overview of the services that careers and employability uh, team offer at the moment. Yeah, sure. So careers consultants, um, oh, we've got a, bit of a, got a bit of feedback here. Yeah, bear with me. I'll uh, see if we can get that sorted. Right, bear with, we're just trying to get that sorted. Hey Ben, do you want to go ahead and see if we're, uh, if we're okay? I'm just going to give us a bit of an overview. Okay, testing, Thanks, testing. <laughs> Nothing like a bit of a live stream, eh? I always wanted to do that. One, two, one, <laughs> two, three, four. <laughs> there you go. Take it away then, Ben. Give us a bit yeah, of an so, um, so it. So bread and butter work of careers consultants at Keel is one-to-one uh, -one careers guidance appointments. Uh, so we both, we offer those uh, in a digital format. Uh, so it will be run for, via MS Teams. Uh, we're also, we also do it face-to-face -face as well. So you can visit us on campus and meet face-to-face. Uh, so the career service is open to every student uh, and graduate up to three years after graduation. And it's, uh, it's a service that is paid for through uh, fees. Um, so it's sort of free at the point of, of use. Uh, and students can use the service as many times as they, uh, they need and they require uh, over their time here at Keele and, and three years afterwards. So we do. Uh, those uh, digital and face-to-face -face appointments. We also deliver uh, career sessions within the curriculum. Um, so you may see us popping up in modules that you're studying to, to talk about, uh, you know, how to start developing your employability if you're in your first year, uh, looking at how to apply for internships and work experience opportunities if you're in your second year, uh, turn up in your third year modules to talk about uh, how to apply for graduate recruitment, how to apply for options of further study and a whole range of other topics. So, for example, me personally, I run sessions on LinkedIn, so I help and support students to develop their LinkedIn profile, their, uh, their sort of social media presence, their, their online brand. So we deliver sessions in school, specifically in programmes tailored for those programmes. Uh, we also have a range of uh, central events, which uh, students from any programme of study can sign up for and a range of subjects like CVs, application forms, uh, career choice, interviews, LinkedIn, etc. Um, so that's that's pretty much our sort of bread and butter work. Well, thanks Ben. And obviously the careers team um, run quite a lot of events throughout the year like you've just said, but in terms of students getting that sort of one-to-one -one advice and guidance, how do they access the careers team? That's a great question. We've got an online booking system called Career Hub. So rather than contacting, you know, somebody via email or ringing up to ask for an appointment, each Chris consultant puts their availability for, appoint for appointments in Career Hub, and then students are free to select the day and the time of their preference. And when I'm working with students, because often uh, when when I meet a student for the first time, uh, they may want further support. Uh, what I'll usually say to them is, is that um, if you can't see a, an appointment time in Career Hub that meets some of your uh, other commitments, so for example, acad academic or work commitments, uh, to contact me directly and then what I do is I, I book in an appointment for them that's um, appropriate. Yeah, yeah. So, 
super accessible um, via the Careers Hub, but obviously they can get in touch with you if, uh, if they do need any further support. Brill. So a lot of students who um, are looking to join us might not have sort of like a specific career in mind. They might be doing a course that they're particularly good at or enjoy, but haven't necessarily thought about where that's going to take them. Um, perhaps it's just that they're not sure. How can the careers team help students to sort of navigate those options and start to really think about sort of, you know, the kind of job that they're going to end up in? OK, yeah, well, I think everyone's at different points in, in terms of their career planning, their sort of awareness of what opportunities are out there. Um, so unlike when when a student is in sort of sixth form or in school, often um, they may be um, sort of called out of class for a, a careers appointment. Mm -hmm. At university, it's much more, um, you know, it's, it's much more the onus is on the individual to seek out that support as and when it's required. So we don't actually do uh, necessarily target students and ask them to see us. Um, but if a student is is looking for help and support to start uh, exploring what opportunities are out there, uh, one thing I would suggest is, is to think about how you frame the question about where this course is going to lead you. So some students who come to me, uh, they ask me, uh, Ben, uh, what can I do with my undergraduate degree? Um, and I encourage them to reframe that to what would you like to do with the, what would you like to do with your undergraduate degree, which is much more empowering. It opens up options outside of their degree subject. Um, so really, a, a careers guidance appointment is a, is a great way to start exploring those opportunities, um, getting some work experience or volunteering. We can help students to set that up to start um, finding out what their preferences are, where their strengths lie. Uh, you know, um, to explore uh, what, what skills they may want to use in a role. Uh, we help them to look at their undergraduate degree as well and to sort of understand all the wonderful high level skills and knowledge mm -hmm. that they are developing. And then we explore the modules that they're studying and which modules they've enjoyed and then encourage them and help them to make connections between those modules and the things that they enjoy to um, potentially careers um, so yeah so I mean if I was going to give students advice um, don't leave it to your third year to start thinking about these things the earlier you can start the better um, usually when when first years start they're, they're you know very much about the sort of practicalities of starting university accommodation and you know getting to class in time and become familiar with the campus and you know maybe living away from home for the first time so there's those important life skills that they need to get under the belt and that's all really important uh, once they feel settled, that's at the point where I would suggest, you know, come and seek out careers, uh, careers and employability, maybe book an appointment with a careers consultant. Um, there are uh, there are some um, work experience, careers and employability related modules as well delivered. So these are related to career exploration um, that are credit bearing that they can take. So you might consider, uh, you know, enrolling in one of those modules. Um, there's also we've also got Kill Careers Online, which is a wonderful online resource, and there are lots of uh, career exploration uh, resources on there. So, for example, if um, if a student uh, sort of lacks the self awareness about what they're good at or where their strengths lie or what kind of work environment they might prefer, there are sort of resources, quizzes that they can take on Kill Careers Online. So, so really, there's there's really loads of things that they can actually be practically doing to sort of explore careers and start that sort of career management process. Yeah, definitely. And I suppose one thing that we do always talk about is, you know, when you come to university, obviously you're going to get that sort of in-depth subject specific knowledge because that's what you're doing your degree for. But we always talk about those extra skills, don't we? Those transferable skills that a range of employers are going to be looking for. And um, what do you think those kind of skills are like? What are the key skills that students will develop if they sort of, you know, really throw themselves into into their degree, which are really transferable that sort of employers are looking for? Well, I suppose the, the top two skills that uh, you you commonly see on um, adverts for graduate schemes are communication and teamwork. Mm -hmm. So the ability to uh, communicate effectively verbally and in the written format, and also the ability to work collaboratively within a team. And those are skills that um, students will start to develop uh, to quite a high level 
just from doing the, the their, their sort of pathway of study. So there'll be opportunities for them to do uh, verbal presentations and develop their uh, presentation skills. There'll be opportunities for them to do uh, projects, including potentially work-based projects where they'll work collaboratively to sort of share goals. And when they come to start to apply for uh, internship, um, summer internships, and then graduate employment, those are experiences that they can draw from, from their undergraduate degree. So, so yeah, so communication, teamwork, also analytical skills. So they'll be yeah. developing analytical skills to a very high level, uh, problem solving, uh, research. So there are lots of um, transferable skills that students will be developing. Um, and that's pretty much regardless of what programme they follow. So those are very common to all of the, 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 the pathways that they may follow. Uh, but if students are interested in, uh, in finding out um, the sort of skills that they'll be developing through their specific programme, I'd recommend they, they look on the Keele University website and in the search bar type in programme specification, click on the top link, then select undergraduate programmes and then choose the, the year of entry, whether it's going to be this year or next year. Scroll down to their program and have a look at the program specification guide, because that's uh, a really useful document that lists the subject specific skills and knowledge they'll be develop, developing, key transferable employment related skills. And also it articulates the learning outcomes from each year of study. So that's a really useful document to have a look at if they're really interested in what they'll be developing through their time here at Keele. Great, thanks Ben. We've had a couple of questions sent in. So the first one is from Amanda, who's um, asking whether your team is able to help um, to arrange work experience in sectors relating to a specific, specific degree, such as history. Amanda's used sort of like the National Trust, English Heritage Property or a museum to get a feel for a job. Is that something that the careers team can support with? We can support, yeah. What we don't do is we don't set it up for students. What we do is we we support them to apply for opportunities. Um, and that's quite important because um, if we did all the work for students, they, they'd be missing out on opportunity to really uh, strengthen and flex their career muscles. So um, if you go out and you, you've arranged your own work experience opportunity with, say, for example, the National Trust, with support from a careers consultant, that achievement is yours. You have ownership of that achievement. You've, uh, you know, you've developed potentially skills. You may develop confidence, and then that's something that you can take forwards when you apply for uh, further opportunities. But we will sit with a student. We'll look at what opportunities there are. We'll look at their requirements. We'll help them to identify opportunities. We'll help them through every stage of the recruitment process. So that's that's where we kind of fit in there. Yeah. Yes. And then we've also had a question from Mary, who I believe is an international student. Mary's asking whether it's worth um, international students bringing over their certificates and any relevant documents um, to, so that they can use them in the UK whilst applying for jobs. So, you know, it might be sort of proof of previous qualifications and that kind of thing. Would you always say it's worth bringing them over? Um, that's a really, that's a really, really good question. Um, often those, those certificates will be asked for by, by employers. Uh, my only hesitation would be is you wouldn't want that to get those certificates lost in in your luggage at Heathrow or Gatwick. So if you are bringing over your certificates, I really would recommend you keep them in your sort of personal luggage and, you know, save them somewhere safe whilst you're in the UK. Maybe take some photocopies. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just in case they get lost, because those are really important documents and they, they can be a pain to replace. But yeah, you know, that, that could be something that you do bring those those uh, certificates and documents over. And in terms of, so we've obviously touched on things like um, placements and sort of students getting themselves those opportunities. What support can the careers team offer in terms of students improving their CV and making sure that, you know, that's the best it can be or, you know, writing personal statements and those kind of things? How can the careers team support with that? Yeah, well, firstly, um, what we can do, we can sit down with a student, we can um, discuss uh, their experiences so we can help them to identify the kind of information that may go onto a CV. And then what may lead from that is, is helping them to identify where there are maybe gaps, things that they might want to improve. So for example, 
Um, if they don't have um, employment experience, we may, may help them or support them to look for part-time work. Um, we have, uh, the second thing is we have something called uh, CB360, which is available through Keel Careers Online. And that is a, an online um, a piece of software that checks CVs and it gives students a, a report which identifies for them areas uh, that they may sort of focus improvements on. And thirdly, we have the one-to-one uh, -one digital appointments. Um, so you can sit down with me. What I'll do is I'll uh, look through your CV with you and I'll suggest uh, changes and improvements that you could consider making. Right, thank you. The important thing to bear in mind as well is, sorry to interrupt, um, often, often there's a real sort of focus on CVs and then people kind of forget about the covering letter. Yeah. So um, what we do as, as a service is as well as helping you with your CV, we help you to develop a really effective covering letter as well, because we understand that um, a, C, a good CV accompanied by a, a good covering letter really could help you to stand out from the crowd. So, yeah, so that's just something to think about. Something to bear in mind. Thank you. Thank you. At the start of the call, you mentioned um, the events that uh, the team um, put on for, stu for students. And um, from my understanding, there's quite a lot that go through the academic year. Can you give us a bit of an example of some of those events that the team do deliver across the academic year? Yeah, sure. So um, in October, we have our um, graduate uh, and placements uh, careers fair. Uh, so that's for undergraduates. Um, and that's where we're going to uh, be inviting, hosting at the beautiful Keel Hall, uh, a range of uh, graduate employers that students can come in and and visit and um, that's not just something for third year students you can start to uh, talk to start to meet start to find out about the graduate employees that are out there from your first year uh, last year it was uh, completely uh, run completely online uh, this year it's going to be hybrid um, so we're going to have a combination of uh, live uh, employers that are going to be in the, the ballroom at Keel Hall, but also uh, an opportunity to engage with them digitally. Um, so that, that's one of the things we do. Uh, me personally, uh, I run a session specifically for first year students. So uh, when you come to Keel, I'd really recommend you, you look that up. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that, but I think it's great. And what I do is I help you to start uh, thinking about how you're going to use your time effectively at Keel. You know, it's it's a wonderful place to be. You know, it's an absolutely fabulous three year experience. Um, but unfortunately, that time does go very quickly. And before you know it, you know, you're in your third year and you start to look for graduate employment. So um, in that session, I help students to sort of start to plan for uh, that sort of transition from university uh, and focusing specifically on the actions they can take to start improving their employability, to start exploring career pathways uh, and start start to be really competitive for the types of opportunities that they may want to apply for. Uh, I also do a session on LinkedIn um, and that's that we do that. Um, if it's going to be live this year, and I think it will be live, uh, that will be one of the PC labs. And uh, whatever stage you are up to with, with developing your LinkedIn profile, uh, we can sit down and we can have a look at that as a, as a big group. Um, and I'll run you through some of the real success factors uh, um, uh, to do with LinkedIn, how you can use it effectively, the different ways that you can use it. And for those of you that don't really know what LinkedIn is, it's it's basically it's a social media platform, a bit like Facebook, but it's for professionals. So Facebook would be your sort of private persona. Uh, LinkedIn is your uh, professional public persona. Uh, my colleagues also do sessions on interviews, uh, interviews. Uh, we have sessions on CV and covering letters. Uh, we have sessions on assessment centres. Uh, we have sessions on exploring uh, career opportunities. Um, I'm probably missing loads, to be honest. I mean, I could have a quick look on our uh, on our programme events. I think that's pretty much. There is tons of that. And is, is there, there are still loads, there? yeah. Yeah, when when things are sort of in a more normal time, um, the coffee mornings with employers they they prove to be quite popular as well, don't they? Yes, yes. Thank you for reminding me. Yes, we do have uh, employers visiting campus, 
So uh, for some students, uh, meeting employers in a, in a big, uh, a big massive room with lots of stands and it's very busy, it's very loud, so that can be, um, you know, it, it, that might not be the best best way that uh, students want to meet employers. Uh, so, and we appreciate that. So we have these, uh, they're called coffee with employers. It used to be called cake with employers, but um, <laughs> coffee's more popular for some reason. I like cake. Um, but it's your opportunity to meet up with a, a small number, usually around four impl graduate employers. Uh, it's It will be running our career centre. It's very informal. It's a chance to get a, you know, a free cup of tea or coffee and chat informally with these graduate recruiters that really want to meet you and find out about you and for you to find out about them. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Uh, we've also had a question um, from a student who's actually going to be joining us as a mature student. Um, I'm guessing the answer is that there's, there's no difference, but um, they're just asking what support is available for them from the careers team. Exactly the same. Yeah, yeah it's, you, you, you have yeah you have access to all of the services uh, just as a sort of 18, 19 year old would who's, who's starting for the first time. Um, obviously, if, when you meet with us and you start getting, you know, if you came for a careers consultant, a careers guidance appointment with myself, you know, we take you as an individual. So we, so we, if you've got a substantial work experience, you know, that's something that we'll, we'll bring into discussions. So, yeah, and you may be potentially a little bit further along in your career planning. You may have quite extensive experience from which to sort of make judgments about where you want to go and what your strengths are, what you enjoy, etc. So, yeah, so it's, you've, you've got access to exactly the same service. Yeah, brilliant. And obviously at Keele, there are so many opportunities that students can get themselves involved in to sort of enhance their employability. You know, there's uh, study abroad options, there's learner language, there's, you know, all the different sort of societies, clubs and, and sort of opportunities that are available. What would you have you got like a top piece of advice for a student about sort of, you know, getting themselves involved in in these opportunities to sort of really make sure that they're making the most of their time at Keele? Yeah, I would say um, it's not just about the degree. That's the important thing to bear in mind. Going to university, obviously, the, the getting the qualification at the end is really important. Um, but the, there's the kind of the, the added value of the university experience and the opportunities to meet people with different perspectives, uh, to try things that you've never had the opportunity to try before, um, to step out of your comfort zone a little bit. So I mean, my advice is, is to, firstly, if you're in your first year, I would say concentrate more on what you think you're gonna enjoy rather than actually being strategic about it. Yeah. Because in my experience, um, Graduate employers can be very much interested in a wide variety of extracurricular activities. And it's really, um, it's your chance to sort of explore things that you're going to enjoy. And the um, the sort of unintended benefit of that would be that you will have things to talk to graduate employers about. So let me give you an example. Um, as you said, there are a range of student societies. So you can join a student society along your lines of interest. And you can apply for position of responsibility within that student society. Say, for example, a committee member, or you could be the president, you could be the, the social secretary, you could be the treasurer. Uh, and you're enjoying doing that. And you've got a position of responsibility. You're coordinating things. You're communicating with people. You're organising things. You're providing leadership to the overall student society. That's something that you're going to enjoy, something you're going to get something personally out of. But also it's something that graduate employers will be interested in because it's something that you've done that's in addition to your undergraduate degree. So yeah, so I'd recommend step outside of your bubble, make sure you know all of your experience at university isn't just from the comfort of your student digs that you sort of get out there. Um, look at work experience. So if you haven't got employment history, try and get some part-time work under your belt. Um, first year is a really good time to do that. Um, in your second year, start to think about uh, summer internships that take place in between second and third year traditionally and start thinking about maybe applying for those. And then in third year, it's making sure that you start to look at your options, whether you want to um, uh, study further, maybe do a master's or a PhD. 
uh, to start looking at those opportunities or if you want to start applying for a graduate uh, graduate job to start those in the first semester of your third year that's that's kind of my overall advice Brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Well, that does bring us to the end of this session. So thank you very much for joining us for this Q&A uh, where I've been discussing all things careers and employability. Uh, thank you to Ben for joining us to answer answer the questions. Um, okay. Coming up in around five minutes time, we have our final accommodation tour, which is showing you a premier ensuite room in Hollycross and the Oaks. Thank you very much for joining us and enjoy the rest of our open day.
Hello and welcome back and welcome to our final accommodation tour of the day. We're going to be taking a look around Holly Cross and the Oaks. And just to say that if you've missed any of the previous accommodation tours, don't worry because the stream will be available to rewatch on demand afterwards uh, on both Facebook and YouTube. It'll stay live on there for around about 30 days. But also if you've got the link to that applicant hub page, um, it will also be on there as well if you need to rewatch any of the sections. That not, not just the accommodation either, that's any sections of today's stream. You can always go back and watch it. But let's uh, dive in and have a look around Holly Cross and the Oaks. And I'm joined again by both Abby and Deb. But just in case anyone new is watching, we'll get you to introduce yourselves again. So, starting with you, Abby, tell us who you are and what you study at Keel. Hi, I'm Abby. I'm a pharmacy student and I'm going into my fourth year this September. Fantastic. And for the final time today, Deb, uh, do you want to tell us who you are and what your role is at Keel? Yeah, I'm Deb and I work in the student accommodation team and we deal with the lettings of the accommodation. Awesome. So as we go through Holly Cross and the Oaks, any questions that you might have as we go through, pop them in the uh, in the comments section. To be honest, any questions about accommodation, whether it's about Holly Cross and the Oaks or any of the other blocks at this point, uh, we're happy to answer those as well. Uh, seeing as this is our last tour, um, we'll do our best to answer any questions that you've got about any of our accommodation blocks at Kiel. So we'll start, as we always do, uh, at the centre of campus over Union Square, just to have a look at where Holly Cross and the Oaks is in relation to everything else. Now, Abby... It is classed as the, the accommodation that's furthest away, isn't it? Yeah, but it's quite nice and secluded, I think. Um, it's a little community of its own. Um, and it's not that bad, maybe a 10 minutes walk. Um, yeah, this, this um, is the Keel thing, isn't it? By far away, we compared to most other universities, I'd exactly. say your commute is very, very small. Uh, so Holly Cross and the Oaks is all just over here, uh, surrounded by the blue outline there. Uh, so, Abby, when we say Holly Cross and the Oaks, they're just two different buildings, aren't they? So which one's the Oaks? Which one is Holly Cross? Yep. So Holly Cross is on your right hand side, um, the bigger looking building, basically. Um, and the Oaks on the left hand side um, of the <laughs> screen that you can see there. Do you know what's only just occurred to me? And we've done been doing this for over a year now. Holly Cross is the building that crosses. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> yeah no i've heard that it's one actually. <laughs> li literally only just occurred to me that that's why it's holly cross and that one's the oaks okay that makes sense well done accommodation team um <laughs> so yeah so they're two but they're, they're just one one site aren't they they're classed as one one accommodation yeah. um so, deb yeah. we, we only have one room type in these don't we yeah on sweet plus on sweet plus yeah um and in terms of its location, then Abby, what's what's it got around it? As you say, it's quite nice and and um, almost isolated and quiet, isn't it? Yeah. So um, again, I'd say like a lot of greenery um, because Kiel Village is just literally down the road, um, two minutes walk from there, um, and um, lots of fields and really nice, especially if you like running and stuff. There's a nice few running routes down there. Um, so that's something that I really enjoyed in my first year when I was living there. Nice. Um, the bus stop, even though it's a bit. As you said, a bit secluded, the bus stop still comes up to there. So you don't have to, you know, trek down to to get a bus. So the bus 25 that goes into Newcastle. So that's all there. Um, and the advantage is it's really close to the post room. Um, so really nice and quick and easy. You don't have to go across the whole of campus. Um, and as I said, getting to the main part of the main part of campus, like the library and stuff, isn't that far. Ten minutes walk max. So it's still really convenient as well. So that's the post room there, isn't it? That's um... yeah. And just, just for anyone who's wondering, it, it sounds very self-explanatory, but post room, because your post doesn't actually come to your accommodation block, does it? No, so um, you'll need to take your kill card to the post room. Um, it's a very easy process. You just give them that and it'll come. all the post comes to that room and you just pick up there. Amazing. Um, and yeah, and as you said, that actually goes for all accommodation blocks. They all have a bus stop outside them, don't they? So um, you don't have to walk to... The Union Square bus stop, do you to get on the bus? You can just whatever, you, whichever accommodation in has a bus stop. That's right, isn't it? Yep, exactly. Yeah. Um, and actually, I think Holly from the Students Union was saying that top tip is to the the Union Square one is that actually gets quite busy. So if you can jump on the bus a few stops earlier when it's outside Lindsay or Holly Cross, you'll often um, beat the traffic. Yeah, no, that's well. a really good tip actually. Yeah, <laughs> it does tend to get quite packed, especially nine a.m. lectures and coming in and then going out at four again it does get quite packed um and yeah and you've got the great benefits of the village haven't you so that in and you've got the sneed arms haven't you which is a local pub in the village um and is this the way you used to go running then did you kind of head out and head this way yeah i just used to run straight down um and then back up again but yeah you do it yeah so all the way down there so you do tend to pass the pub um and it's a lovely pub i've been there really nice as well um but yeah awesome. and i think there's some new there's new houses there as well, so it's, it's, it's a nice village. It's a mixture of people um, in the village. 
Nice. Let's have a look at the exterior of Holy Cross New York then. So we'll just have a look outside. Um, now this one's got quite a lot of parking spaces, as an Abbey, and we haven't we haven't actually spoken about parking yet. But um, we often we do, would you advise someone have if you're if you're living on campus and you're just kind of going to your classes? Would you would you say you need a car? I really don't think you need a car on campus because everything's there. Um, and even with shopping, you can have online shopping, so it can come. You can drop it off at com at campus. You really don't need a car. Um, on the in first year, I was always on campus. And it hardly went off campus. I mean, as you said, if you do need a car, there is um, car parking if required. Um, but I think uh, we tend to advise not to, just because of the. It's just you just, it's just not necessary really on campus. Yeah. And there's also a, uh, an application process, isn't the Deb? And there's this criteria. Yeah, that, there's criteria um, you have to meet. So um, not every, you know, normally, like say, if you're living on campus, as Amy said, Abby said, you don't really need a car. But uh, there is an application process, and I think it goes like on a point system. So uh, it's all on the website again. Yeah. So if you need any, if you need parking space for uh, disability reasons or caring purposes, then um, you'll be higher up on the list, won't you, Deb, in terms of securing a car parking space? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I'd say it's far easier to not have a car if you don't if you don't need one. Um, don't don't bring one. Um, and as you said, Abby, there's, there's lots of transporters, and the bus goes straight into the centre of Newcastle from Holly Cross, uh, Holly Cross and the Oaks, doesn't it? Um, yes, yeah, so there's two main bus. I meant 25 is the main bus, which is like a first operated bus, and you also have the 85 as well, um, which are similar routes, just different endpoints. Um, but the 25 goes straight into Newcastle, where the big superstars are. So you've got Morrison's, um, you've got Lidl, Aldi. Um, it's very handy. And then it continues into Hanley, which is where the train station is. Um, and it all starts off on campus. So you don't have to change buses or anything. Um, it takes you straight into Newcastle bus station. So really, a really handy route. Amazing. Favourite thing about Holy Cross New Oaks has to be this thing in front of us now, uh, the carved squirrel. It's the only place on campus you'll you'll find it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's been there for a while now. Uh, a tree that was passed, um, that had sadly died, but instead of pulling it out of the ground, it decided to turn it into a nice piece of artwork, and that sits outside Holy Cross New Oaks. So just before we head inside, the, 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 you don't get a bar, do you, here um, at Holy Cross New Oaks, do you, Abby? It's just a common room, isn't it? Yeah, so you've got the cross, which is the common room. Um, but yeah, no bar, but still a um, nice social space. Um, I mean, you can go into any common room for any um, halls, but um, mm -hmm. people tend to use, if you're in Oaks or Cross, they tend to use the cross, which is really nice. What sort of things happen in the common rooms then? What kind of did you find was happening in the, in the cross? Yeah, so um, it tends to be just like socials, for example. So I'm part of Badminton. Um, so not specifically in the cross, but in Barnes Bar, we used to have a lot of socials. Um, so like quiz nights and um, things like that um people just do tend to meet up for social gatherings just like a chat or something some people as well would like doing study groups in there as well and um, so a variety of things because it can be really quiet some nights some evenings so it's quite nice to just go sit there and have um, some more time to yourself awesome and as with all the other halls we saw it a bit earlier on you get a laundrette as well don't you the one laundrette for both um both buildings isn't it which is just around the side there yeah um just in case anyone new's watching abby talk us through laundry at keel how do you do your laundry Yep, um, so you get a circuit card at the beginning of the year and you top it up online um, and then you can use that circuit card to do your washing and drying there um, and it's very easy to use um, and yeah, it, it does a good job um, and you tend, uh, washing machines and dryers tend to be, they're not always full so you always find one um, if you go at the right times as well, there's, there's plenty so it'll be good. Smash him, let's head in, which one did you actually live in uh, Abby? Were you Holy, Holy Cross or? Holy Cross, yeah. So you're on the right. So we're going inside the Oaks, but pretty similar. Um, so yeah, show us around. Um, so how, first of all, how many people do you share with Abby? The eight people. Um, so eight people. So you have your ensuite, and then you share the kitchen uh, with eight other people. It, also with seven other people, but eight people overall. Yeah. Um, so if we go into the room, um, so you have a bigger bed. Uh, so I think it's a three quarter bed. Um, so it's quite a big bed, as you can see. You've got your cupboards there, um, side table and a big desk again with shelves. Um, again, you have the pin pin board so you can put stuff up, some handy notices and stuff. Um, and yeah, really nice again, really spacious. Um, and then your ensuite's in the corner as well, just near the door. Are these the, Deb, are these the Ottoman beds again? Are these the ones that you can lift up? Or oh, actually, Abby, you, you would know you, you lived in these blocks. Could you put stuff under your bed? I could, yeah, I could lift my bed up. Um, so I think is this 
Yes, I think this one is. Yeah. 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 So again, handy for storage. I mean, you end up accumulating a lot of stuff that is really handy. <laughs> Someone once said that the the top tip for them was with your clothes is um, if you can if you do go home, um, kind of at Christmas, New Year that time you can kind of change over your wardrobe at each season, so you can kind of bring back your winter clothes, bring back your summer clothes, just so you're not kind of not get too much in your room. Yeah, no. I tend to do that. <laughs> so take a lot of clothes home and then bring some back again. Yeah. And I said you've got storage out. above the wardrobe as well, which I tend to use quite a lot, just like for big boxes or suitcases or something. So really handy. These are lovely size rooms, aren't they? And especially the ensuite in these, you get a really big ensuite, don't you, Abby? Yeah, and a nice mirror as well, <laughs> is what I remember. Um, but yeah, really nice. Um, it's always nice to have I mean, like a bathroom to yourself as well. You don't have to worry about, um, you know, if someone's going to be in there or not. Um, but as I, as I said, um, even the kitchen, it's, it's lovely sharing. Um, you never find it too overcrowding. Nice desk space as well. So you also get that top shelf, do you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you can put books um, and, and the desk is like, it's in the corner as well. So it doesn't take up too much, but it's quite secluded as well. So it's really nice. Um, yeah. Now, this is someone used to give us the in depth detail on notice boards. So these are magnet notice board. Did you have a pin notice board in your room, Abby? It was yours? Yeah, pins? so I had a pin. So I think it varies. Uh, in Oaks, it's a magnet, and in Holy Cross, it's a pin. Um, so it just depends which room you get as to what you need to buy. Do you get the pins or do you bring? Do you get your own pins then? There were a few there when I went. I needed more because I stuck up a lot of stuff in there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there were a few uh, odd ones um, sticking about. So yeah, this is the Look bathroom. Look at that mirror. Look at that mirror, man. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it's really handy, especially for girls doing the makeup and stuff, really handy. Um, but yeah, showers again, I think it works the same um, where it's just the automatic. Yeah, the automatic one. So <laughs> it, you just have to put your hand over it and it comes comes on off. Really good showers. And these are, again, I think we said this in Lindsay, uh, Lindsay Court, and I'd, I'd even say Holy Cross is even slightly bigger. These are kind of the, this is for one person, this ensuite. It's it's absolutely huge. And you've got a lot of counter space as well, so it's quite nice that you can put a lot of things in there. Um, so it doesn't clutter up your room as well, so you can put it in the bathroom, which is handy. Lovely. Um, <laughs> Lauren from the team has just spotted my keel mug. Show that <laughs> off whilst we head to the kitchen. Shout out Moreland Pottery. Obviously, the local area is famous for its pottery, and Moreland Pottery, one of the companies, made this one. But there's a the wide variety if you want to get a keel look. This one, this one says <laughs> London, New York, Paris, keel, all the big places on planet Earth. Um, on a mug. So into your kitchen. So these are similar to Lindsay again, aren't they? With the wings. So you've got kind of. Two yeah, similar to Lindsay to Court. Yeah, Lindsay Court even. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Abby, give us a give us a tour on the kitchen. Yeah, so they said it's um, you got like two separate bits, and then you've got your sitting area in the middle. So again, quite handy because not everyone's in one place. Um, so you have two fridges and two um, freezers, and you can normally get a, about a shelf, um, which is pl plenty of space, especially if you tend to cook together, which happens quite often. Um, and you've got quite large cupboards as well, so you can put all your pots and pans in there, so there's no need to put it in your room. Um, you get given a kettle. Um, you may need to chip in with your flat for a toaster, because um, there wasn't one there. You get a microwave as well, um, but the toaster you may need to buy. Um, but normally, if you just split it between your flat, that's it's quite reasonable as well. Um, but yeah, really nice kitchen. Um, can become a nice social space as well, not just for eating, but for just talking with your flatmates. Um, so yeah, it was really nice. Question from Edward, um, and uh, we've yeah we mentioned this on the first tour, but again, uh, for anyone new who's watching, uh, Edward's asked, "Is it Wi-Fi only for all accommodation blocks?" And yes, it is, isn't it, Deb? Yeah, the hard wi the the ports uh, are disconnected, so it's all Wi-Fi. Yeah, so there's a you might find in your room there is some Ethernet or Cat five, Cat six ports in there, that but they're not live, are they, Deb? They're, no, they're just redundant. No, no, um, so any devices that you do bring, any games, consoles, computers, anything like that, just make sure they are Wi-Fi enabled, and you'll be all good. Because Abby, you just connect to the university Wi-Fi network, don't you? Yeah, really easy and really good connection as well. Um, so you can stream um, like Netflix and stuff. I've never had an issue with it, and it's available throughout campus. Um, you don't lose connection if you you know go to the library or something. So really good. 
And as someone else was saying, because it's it's called the Edgy Roam Network and essentially it's what all universities use. So if you go and visit a friend in another university, your likelihood is you can log into the Wi-Fi there. And also some university hospitals have it. I know that Royal Stoke has Edgy Roam in there. And if so, if you ever go to the hospital, um, it's great because whilst you're waiting, you've got internet access and you can kind of sit on your phone and scroll through things and watch videos if you want to whilst you're waiting for any appointments or anything. So I do like uh, I do like Edgy Room. Yeah, and the kitchen space is quite nice, isn't it, Abby, in terms of you've got a nice kind of dining area as well. Did you find you were cooking uh, meals for flatmates and things like that and having kind of group meals together? Yeah, I tend to... So a lot of my friends were in Horwood, but I tend to have them over quite a lot. Um, and it was really nice because as it's such a nice big table and big social space. Um, so we would cook meals together um, and it wouldn't get really messy at all. Or it was really manageable. Um, so it was really nice to have people over and be able to, even for like badminton socials, um, sometimes the social would just be in the kitchen, but it was big enough to have that many people in. So it's really nice. Full, full badminton team in there. <laughs> Not a full badminton team, um, but a lot of people. But as again, it, everyone was spaced out and, you know, standing up, it, it was really nice. And I guess you kind of before you know before you go on a night out maybe in the SU or one of the bars you you kind of gather in the kitchen do you and and you know have a quick I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say the the, the term that everyone uses but have a you know yeah. have a, a cheeky beverage before you head out into the the main main uh, bars and restaurants on campus. Exactly, because Holy Cross did have that social space, um, as do most accommodations to be fair to you. But because it was just that bit bigger. Um, it was always the place to go so everyone was always coming to our flat but it was uh, really nice yeah and i like as well because i guess some people might be worried that they'll um kind of go in their accommodation block and then how do you meet people from across the rest of campus but you seem to have found it very easy to meet people in hallwood and in, in, in other accommodation blocks as well and you kind of all meet at each other's halls is that right yeah so i met when i first joined on my first day i was just very much with my um, block flatmates and we got on really well um, and it appeared that all my course mates were all in Horwood. Um, so then I started mingling with Horwood people as well. Um, and then through societies, you find a lot of people um, in different blocks and you visit their blocks and you visit their um, their common room. So you do get to see other blocks as well. And it's actually really nice because then if you want to move into somewhere next year, at least you've had a feel as well as to what it what it looks like and how it is. Um, so so you, that was really nice. You did badminton. Did you do anything else? Um, so just um, other like cultural ones, so Malaysian and Tamil society, which is quite nice. So a lot of food involved in that one. Um, so nice. that's really good. Um, but yeah, badminton was my spot one. Yeah, it was really nice. Did, did you compete? Did you do the books league or did you just do it for no, hobby? No, um, just as a hobby. Uh, I mean, I'm on committee, so quite involved with the club um, and in social league, but nothing um, too competitive. So I played in the social league a few times, but that, that was it really. <laughs> and I'm guessing they're a great way to just meet, um, you know, people that you, you've got common interests in and... Um, who enjoy the same sport as you or have the same interests as you. Exactly, yeah. I mean, you don't have to be a pro. Um, you can be a beginner. Um, and any ability, I think, with sports clubs, but sports clubs at Kiel, it's just really nice to get to know people um, through socials or through playing. So, it's, yeah, really, really good. And did you do that it's kind of as soon as you started then? Did you kind of um, know which clubs you wanted to get involved with and kind of go straight for them? Yes, yeah, so I went to the Freshers' Fair, which is what I advise a lot of people to go to because you have um, all the stalls in the SU um, and badminton something I've always liked but never managed to pick up. Um, so I managed to pick up at uni and there's a separate sports one as well. Um, so they all advertise themselves and you have trial weeks. So I ended up going to the trial weeks and I really liked it at badminton. Um, so yeah, uh, that's how I got into it. But a lovely, a lovely sport and all the other sports at Kiel are, I'm sure are very, really good as well. So definitely would encourage people to try um, stuff in Freshers' Week. Yeah. Awesome. Deb, do you want to give us the price of Holly Cross and the Oaks just before we wrap up our accommodation tours yeah. today? £166.04 per week. That's this September's prices. Um, and again, for next year, they'll be on the website January time. Nice. And we'll get you to do two things before we leave. Abby, I want you to give me your top tip for anyone who's uh, moving into accommodation in September or in September 2022. What's the first thing they should do when they arrive? um make yourself known to your flat uh is what i would say because if you it's quite easily done to just stay to yourself and um, so i definitely say get yourself out there um socialize with your flat um and then you won't feel as you know alone um you'd feel really involved um, and it's always it's always good so yeah awesome and deb uh 
considering you're the expert in accommodation, if you were a student applying, what is your first choice for accommodation? What's your second choice? Where are you living on campus, Deb? Well, I, I quite like the shared flats and houses because they're a small sharing ratio, but, you know, you, you've got that sort of community spirit, you know, there you're meddling with the other students, you know, yeah. in the kitchen and the, in the bathroom, you know, and then you sort of get quite tight-knit and, you know, make friends. And as we always advise it, don't just put one choice down. So what's your second choice, Deb? Um, probably an ensuite. An ensuite. Well, where, <laughs> where are you going, Barnes? Um, I like Lindsay Court because, you know, the views, you know, over the farm and, you know, the greenery around there. Nice. Lindsay like Court. it. Go on, the Deb. So what... <laughs> Lauren, this one's from Lauren, from uh, from our Open Days team. Uh, she wants to know what's the what's the funniest accommodation story that you can tell us that you've ever had. Who's that to to me? Or... Yeah, yeah, to you, there. Oh, you stumped me. Hat. <laughs> Go with no, this. I stop, I stop thinking the most, that one for next time. <laughs> what's the most common question that you always get? On the talks, it's probably, uh, you know, the sharing ratios. People are, you know, because they're worried about, you know, how many people they might be sharing with and that. But, you know, as Abby and the others have said, you know, you soon, you know, mix with the other students and, uh, you know, form your friendships and get along. So, and all that information's on the website, isn't it, Deb? So it's kill.ac.uk forward slash accommodation. um, And you can find out sharing ratios and all that on there. Um, And if you need to chat to the accommodation team, kill.ac.uk forward slash chat and they're on you on unibody aren't you or yeah, you can find your you can also find your email and number on the website yeah. as well abby yeah. are you on unibody i can't remember if i asked you that or not i don't think so no no not on unibody but there are plenty of other students on there as well so he- again keel.ac.uk forward slash chat uh thank you both it's been an absolute pleasure deb you've been brilliant throughout today and abby yeah. thank you for also showing us on not one but two accommodation blocks as well um that's been awesome Thank you very much. Uh, We'll catch you in around about three minutes time for our campus tour. So we'll see you then. Bye. Bye. Hello and welcome back and welcome to our beautiful campus tour. We're now going to take a look around uh, pretty much all of our campus or as much of it as possible anyway. Uh, And I'm joined by two of our current students, uh, Beth and Daniel, who are going to guide you through this tour. So we'll get them to introduce themselves first. Uh, So Beth, we'll start with you. Do you want to tell us who you are and what you study at Kiel? Hi, I'm Beth. I'm going into my fourth year studying forensics. Fantastic. And Daniel, same thing. 
Hi, I'm Dan. Uh, I've just finished my third year doing history, um, so I've just graduated. Um, and yeah, I'm just not graduated. Well. Yeah. Amazing. How's it feel to have graduated, Dan? Feels good, relieving to to finally finish with um, my degree. Well done. Congratulations. Uh, I'm guessing you, that was just over the summer, then, yeah? Yeah, in July. Amazing. Uh, awesome. So, any questions as we go through anything about campus, but also the local area as well? Um, and we'll cover lots of things. So we'll be going past things like the sports centre and the student union. So we'll cover things like sports and society. So any question um, about just generic life at Kiel as we go through this, pop them in the chat and I can ask them to either Beth or Dan as we go through. Um, but what we'll do is we'll start by kind of taking a look at uh, where Kiel is um, in relation to the rest of the world, really, because it was it a common question when you said that you got into Kiel. Someone asked, I'm, I'm guessing someone somewhere asked you where it was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, everyone. Everyone. Um, Beth, how did you describe where Kiel was? I usually say it's like North Midlands between Manchester and Birmingham. Yeah, sounds about right. It's the easiest way we describe it. Um, <laughs> so on this map currently, you'll see two lighter blue dots, one at the top and one at the bottom. The one at the top is Manchester, the one at the bottom is Birmingham. And this kind of uh, congregation of blue dots in the middle, of darker blue dots in the middle is, is our campus, which we'll zoom into now. Um, so we're about actually about 40 minutes, 50 minutes by train uh, to either of either Manchester or Birmingham, aren't you? So you can jump on the, the um, it's not the Virgin train anymore, is it? I can't remember. It's a, I can't, is it Avanti now? I can't remember. But whatever the fast train is that goes to London, you can jump on it and get to either Manchester or Birmingham um, from Stoke Station. And this is our campus here, <clears throat> outlined in the blue. Kind of think it looks like a shark or a dolphin, doesn't it? If you look at it like that. Yeah, a little bit. I, I can see that. Yeah, I'm not going mad. Um, so that's our campus there. We are Britain's biggest campus, but don't let that uh, put you off or make it sound like you'll be walking for hours on end from lecture to lecture, uh, because as we'll kind of show you, everything's very centrally located, as you've kind of seen from the accommodation tours. Um, all the academic buildings are kind of in the centre, and then around that is just green fields, uh, woodland walks, and, and lots of other other space um, to kind of relax and wind down uh, after your studies. So Kiel is a village. Uh, we pretty much take up most of that village uh, because it's very, very small. Uh, but our nearest, we're located in Newcastle under Lyme, which is our nearest town. Um, so Daniel, you take this. So if I'm going out in Newcastle under Lyme, what is there out there for me to do? Yeah, there's a few bars and pubs. Um, there's obviously Weatherspoons uh, and, and a few others. There's also there's a, a laser tag, I believe. Uh, I think they have like an escape room kind of thing. I've never done that, but um, it seems quite interesting. Um, yeah. There's obviously the local sort of, um, I guess, food like oat cakes. There's a, there's a very nice oat cake shop near where I live. Um, and uh, there's, the, there's a, the standard shop. Um, on the high street as well. For, um, yeah. And this is kind of, this is where most people go to live in their second years and second, third years, don't they? They head into Newcastle uh, and live in the town and commute onto campus, don't they? Is that what either of you did? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so that's Newcastle. Then our nearest city is Stoke-on-Trent. So Beth, if I'm heading a bit further out to Stoke-on-Trent, what can I find? Uh, the main tra train station is there, so you can get the train to Manchester, Birmingham, London, kind of anywhere, to be honest. Um, and then there's a few clubs. I mean, I always loved the SU. I didn't really go out to Stoke, but I know there are a few clubs and like bars, restaurants. There's a big shopping centre in Hanley if you need to go on a day shopping. Or obviously, there is Manchester or Birmingham as well if you want to go to a bigger place to shop. And as I said in the last accommodation tour, Stoke is famous for its pottery. Um, that's kind of what it was built on. So this is a Moreland Pottery and you've also got, um, I can't remember the other one. There's another one, another big pottery company. Um, and if you actually, I guarantee if you go into your kitchen and you pick up one of your plates and you tip it over, the likelihood is it'll say made in, Sta made in Stoke-on-Trent or made in Staffordshire on there. And that's kind of what, what that area is famous for. So that's Stoke-on-Trent. Um, but heading back to our campus. And as Beth said, if you travel in by train, you're likely to go to Stoke and then you can either get the bus or a taxi uh, onto campus. And 
so yeah, we are Britain's biggest campus, but again, everything is very centrally located. So this is Union Square and all the buildings are kind of located around this. And we'll be walking through all this in just a moment. Uh, but one building to point out is Chancellor's Building, which is our biggest academic building on campus. Likelihood is you'll get lost in here at some point during your studies at Kiel because it is very, very confusing. Um, but in here is teaching space, lecture theatres. There's also a brand new um, eating area that's currently been refurbished. I feel like half of campus is, is having a, a facelift at the moment. But yeah, brand new area that's been completely refurbished inside Chancellor's, which will be um, where you can grab food and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's our kind of biggest building on campus, just to point out there. But what we'll do is we'll head to the main entrance, if, which if you arrive by car is just over here and we'll head in and we can have a look around campus so yeah so in terms of arriving then um obviously we've got the bus you could get a taxi which what kind of when you lived in a local area how did you guys get to campus i used the bus, bus. Or car bus. sharing car sharing i know um, some people use the e-scooters which Beth was lucky enough to have a chance on uh, have a go on on Tuesday. Great. They are awesome. They are really Beth? fun. I'm going to use them all. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Um, but yeah, I'll let you two kind of show us around. So we're currently at the top end of campus, aren't we, where our new buildings are. So uh, Beth, do you want to talk us through our, our kind of the new buildings that we've got on campus here? Uh, so there's a new hotel. Um, is that open now? Yeah, what opened hotel? in January. Oh, yeah. So there's a hotel that's newly built. Um, there's a new vet school, which is just there on the left. And then that's the business school there. All super, um, they've been all built since. Yeah, all left. of them back yeah. under, I think the business school is the oldest, isn't it? Just just over a year old, probably. Um, either of you been into the business school? I know you probably won't have been into the hotel or the vet school. I've been in it, but I've never had any lectures in it. It's got a great <laughs> study space on the ground floor that everyone yeah, loves because yeah, it's quite quiet. Um, then we've also got sustainability farm up at the top, haven't we? Mm-hmm. And yeah, one thing just to point out. students that live in there as well in sustainability that's the bungalow that's in barns so we'll go oh, past yeah. that you will see that you'll see that um you, you can talk about that when we go past it beth <laughs> <laughs> just to point out that sign there um so as you go past the vet school and down to the bottom you've got um the solar uh the energy far the energy park which is both solar and wind so there's twelve and a half thousand solar panels and two wind turbines going in which will provide 50 percent of our campus energy um, all from on campus. Um, and Kiel's big on sustainability and you'll see lots of different sustainability things as we go around. Um, Daniel, David Weatherall, uh, what's what's this building for on campus? So that's for uh, the medicine students. Um, but I think you can just, uh, like all buildings, just walk in if you're not a medicine student. Um, and into and there's like a, I don't know if it's a cafe or you can get coffee there, I think. so. Yeah. It's, it's kind of... Um, how would you describe it at Kiel then? So you've, if you study one subject, would you expect to find yourself in one building for your entire course? Not necessarily. I mean, you, if you, some subjects I guess are more confined to, they'll have like a main building. Like I did history, so I was in mostly in chancellors, but you're in other buildings as well. Like I did a foundation yeah, and I was in almost all the buildings. Um, so you get to, some depending on some courses, you get to experience all the, all the buildings, quite fun. And Beth, you did, for forensics? Forensics, it? yeah. So I was mainly in um, Learning Journals Laboratories um, and I had my labs in CSL, but lectures can be anywhere. I had a lot of chances and a lot in like Hornbeam and like other ones like that. Yeah, so you were lucky enough to be in Central Science Laboratories, which is a new new building a new building on campus again, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's really nice. Uh, for any mature students who've got um, caring responsibilities, on the left here is the Keel Nursery. Uh, which is on campus and is available to both staff and students. Um, so if you've got any children, you can use the nursery. And then Beth, your shiny moment coming up because this is where the sustainability bungalow is. I always now, Tom... thought it was at the top. I never knew it was here. No, it's part of Barnes. Um, now, when we were doing the stream the other day, Tom explained this to us. So I'm going to test your memory. T talk us through the sustainability bungalow, Beth. Um, <laughs> Don't look terrified. I think all <laughs> students live in it and they have like yeah. a little veg patch in the back. That's the main bits I remember. Yeah, and they make veg, and then they have like a vegan night every week, and they cook food. But yeah, well, well remembered. So that's the bungalow <laughs> there. Um, and as you say, they grow all. They kind of live a sustainable lifestyle, don't they? Grow in their own veg and yeah. crops, um, and then they kind of do other sustainability uh, initiatives. 
Now we 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 kind of just went past it, didn't so that's called the science park, that top bit, um, and we're kind of on the edge of it now with the um, the building in front of us, which is the Cobra uh, Biologics building, and Cobra are actually manufacturing the AstraZeneca vaccine from that building on campus, um, and the science park is a, a hybrid approach, isn't it? So you've kind of got external businesses in the, in the buildings, but also uh, some student study space as well. And, and students sometimes um, work with those businesses to kind of do internships as well. So um, you've got a bit of both there on the science park. But shout out to Cobra for that awesome work over the last um, 18 months. On to the sports center then. So did either of you, so Beth, I know you did a sport, did you? Yeah, I did tennis. Tennis, that's the one. Daniel, any sports? Uh, not a part of any society, but I have booked out the um, uh, badminton court. You can just uh, do it as, um, if in a group. Um, cool. So we've got both sides there. So you've got leisure. So, so Dan, if you want to kind of use the sports centre just kind of on your own then, how does it kind of work? Uh, you can book uh, on, on the website, but I believe you can also do it in person as well. Uh, and it's quite cheap So for like a one-time use. Um, I only know about the badminton court, but I think you can possibly book out other um, courts or um, facilities and yeah you don't have to be part of a society you can just rock up and play yeah so if you just want to grab a friend and go and play badminton tennis you, you, can, you can do that can't you yeah. Beth in terms of sports clubs then um, why first of all why tennis and kind of how do you go about joining a sports club at Keel? I picked tennis because I've done it since I was like four um and I took a gap year where I didn't do anything. I went traveling for a bit. So I just wanted to kind of get back into what I knew. So that's why I picked tennis. Um, usually the, the, there's a freshers fair. Um, for the first week, it's like for the freshers events of uni. Um, in that, they have an AU fair. So that's called sports societies. So they have all of them there. You walk around, you kind of see what there is, see what ones you want to join. You can either join there on the spot or you go onto the SU website. It's really easy. Um, you pay a membership fee, and then with sports, you also pay the AU fee, which covers like insurance, court bookings, stuff like that. Um, and yeah, and then they also have a society's one, so they have ones that aren't part of the AU, so like dance, and I can't remember any others. Like they have loads of other societies, like they have. I think there's like a reading club or like literature stuff as well. So it's not just sports that they have on campus. There's loads. Nice. A couple of questions come in, which we'll answer just before we kind of move on. Um, Miriam has asked, how would you describe the public transport? Dan, do you want to take that one? I'd say it's, it's pretty good. Um, there's a 25 bus, which is um, relatively cheap. And it runs like uh, during the week, at least, like every 10, 20 minutes. So and there's bus stops everywhere, all over campus. So that will like take you into Newcastle in like, I'd say that's like 15 minutes. Um, it also goes to Stoke if you just stay on the bus um, and it loops around. Uh, so it's quite a good in terms of public transport, despite being sort of isolated up on a hill. It's still quite connected. Nice. Um, and Beth, you can take this one. I think this has been asked by someone in the chat, or Lauren's just messing with me. But she, she, she's asked, "What is an oat cake?" I've honestly, it's like kind of like a pancakey thing, right? I've never actually had one. Oh, like a savory sacrilege. pancake. How have you thing. never had an oat cake? I know. I know. I need to have one. It's my last year at Kiel, so I need to try one. But I've Dan, never had one. Have you yeah. tried the the local speciality? It's quite it's quite nice. Uh, um, I think they're quite the local to Staffordshire, or is it Stoke? I'm not too sure. They're quite good. It's yeah. It's the local area's claim to fame. Um, traditional wartime food that's local areas claim to fame <laughs> that, that never goes away. Um, I'm, to be honest, I'm not a huge fan. But I, I shouldn't really say that because everyone's going to hate me now. But the, you, you kind of—it's a savoury pancake, yeah. isn't it? You kind of—you can put whatever you want on, um, and do your best. Oh God, Lauren! Lauren's angry. Lauren behind this behind the scenes. <laughs> uh, okay, Ashini. We'll move on swiftly. Move on. Ashini has asked, "Do you get credits uh, from joining slash attending society? So does it count towards anything, Beth? On any?" volunteering so if you become a member of the committee so i was part of dance and tennis committee you collect volunteering hours um so for dance i collected a lot more because i was teaching a class every week um so you basically log all your hours and then you get awards based on how many hours you've done there's also the society the, the, the end of year awards aren't there as well for clubs and yeah. societies so if you because they're all run by students aren't they so 
you could yeah. be on the committee for tennis um and then if you do great things that year you can win awards for that which um also look really good on your on your cv don't they yeah societies are definitely a way of chatting yourself up it doesn't count for anything academic but it gives you a lot of other skills that people look for in, on cvs and stuff so just one building to point out as well, just before we move past it, is the Newsom building. Um, so it's part of student services. Uh, it's the counselling and mental health support building. It's called the Newsom building because Audrey Newsom was a member of staff at Keele back in the 60s or 70s. And she set up the first counselling and mental health dedicated service at any UK university. Um, so her legacy lives on um, as many other universities adopted it and also set up counselling and mental health services. And then, so we're just kind of going around the back of Chancellor's now, aren't we? Which was Dan's main home up to some of the... So these are kind of more specific, aren't these buildings, to some courses. So we've got Colin Reeves, which I think is that computing and maths off the top of my head? Yeah, I think, mm -hmm. I think so. We'll go past the sign in just a sec. So again, like we said earlier, you might find, as Dan said, you might find yourself in one building more than others. It just kind of depends on the course. And obviously, Beth, with yours, where you've got some specialist equipment that you need, you'll be in some of the, the more specialist labs, won't you? Yeah. Well, so what's the coolest thing you've done in forensics? They have, in third year, we had, it's like a fire, a fire and like explosion module. It's really fun. And they, um, they bring in the local fire department and they basically set fire to a, like a, a shipping container. And then. I think I've seen pictures of this. Is it to really demonstrate fun. how they fire spreads, is it? And the dogs are really cute. The dogs? Yeah, they bring like fire dogs that can smell accelerants and stuff. So wow. they have two this year. And they're they're really cute. They're like little spaniels. They're adorable. And that's not just for fun, is it? That's the, is that to demonstrate how yeah, fire it's spreads? Yeah, demonstrating it? how how you find stuff and yeah, yeah you, you have a little things on fire just for the fun. But yeah, the dogs were a bonus. Coolest thing you've done in history, Dan? Um, I mean, with history, it's more about seminars and sort of essays and things. Um, we don't really well, do give us the cool, Dan. Give us the coolest fact you learned about history. The coolest fact. Um, what blew your mind? What blew my mind? I don't know. Um, I said like one thing. I've. It's not like directly learnt from the course, but I learned it from like linked to the course, just from like um, reading lists. But is that like all languages in Eurasia, like from like ancient Sanskrit, or modern languages in South Asia to like English, are related? They come from the same language root because people migrated. Um, as well as like religions, like Hinduism, Greek religions, and Norse religions have like a common root. Uh, they're a common ancestor. That's very interesting to me. Ace, I love history. I love the, all the stuff you can learn because it's endless, isn't it? History, yeah. absolutely endless. What was your kind of your main area that you learned then, Dan? What was kind of your the bit that you went most into? I preferred modern history, like um, so looking at imperialism, uh, like national nationalism, or national identity. Uh, that's what I did my dissertation on. So. Cool. Beth stomping ground now. This is the Central Science Laboratories. Talk us through it, Beth. What's inside here? Yeah, so they're brand new labs. Um, they're really nice. Uh, they have loads of specialist equipment. There's a big IT floor at the top that so has all the software you need, so you don't have to buy stuff like that. Um, you can also do remote access. So you, I could access a laptop from from my laptop. I could access one of those computers and then use the software on it. So that's really handy. And a great view of campus as well. If you go to the top floor. Yeah, yeah. Out. Floors, I think it's the stairs are pretty steep, but the, the view is really good. <laughs> and there's a lift if you need it. There is. Yeah. Although um, second year, one of my friends got stuck in it, and they had to call. Oh, don't say that. That's, that's like everyone's worst nightmare in, like, getting stuck in a lift. <laughs> Use the stairs. Yes, yeah, better exercise. Um, so you've got. I think we just went past. Dorothy Hodgkin was that just, which is psychology. Psychology, I think. Yeah. Hornbeam, which is pharmacy. Pharmacy. Um, and then again, so we're, we're we've kind of kind of stuck to chancellors and done a circuit around it. So chancellors on the left here. Um, which bit were you in a, a a certain area of chancellors, Dan, or was it kind of just all over? Um, a lot of seminars are in B, but then you're in A, A and B mostly. Uh, but... I don't think I've ever asked anyone this, but. What's your advice for navigating chancellors? Advice? Um, if I remember right, I think each floor is like, um, so ground floor is zero to 100, then it's 100 to 200 for first floor and 200 to 300, if I remember correctly. 
and obviously like there's, there's chancellors B on the on the right and then on the left this whole building is actually chancellors A including this um, uh, cafe so chancellor I think there's chancellors C as well for some things but I'd, I've never actually been in there it just goes on doesn't yeah. it they use the maps uh, the maps for my saviour yeah you there's a ask. map of chancellors like a yeah, proper one that like actually isn't confusing they're everywhere I feel like you'd have to have a degree in orienteering to navigate <laughs> chancellors. You can ask there's a reception on the left as well. You can ask. I've done that before. So, again, so you've got the food court, which has been completely redeveloped, and then a lot of the humanities courses, isn't it, Dan? So history. Um, law, there's a school of law in there. Um, I'm sure English use it, don't they, and, and yeah. courses like that. And if you pop in chancellors for, for a bite to eat, I mean, it's all changing, to be honest, so whatever your reviews are, irrelevant because it's all going up it's all going up up another notch but how uh, did you ever grab lunch in there yeah the bistro is quite nice um and sometimes in that hallway they would have like um nice food every now and again like uh people would come in with i don't know uh once what they had like lots of like fresh nice quite, quite nice food so that's sometimes there so tawny building just in front of us which is the student services hub and uh, a new change is that the accommodation team have now moved to Tawny. So if you need, if you ever need to pop in and see the accommodation team, their office is now in Tawny, um, which is great because Tawny's in the centre of campus as well, which makes it nice and easier. Um, questions come in: If you're staying off campus, will your flatmates always be Keel students? How did you guys? Did, did you both live off campus? Yeah. So I'm, I'm guessing you both stayed with Keel people. Yeah. I guess it depends if you know if you know people from the area or from the other university, the one that sh oh, we'll just staff university. <laughs> you could live with someone from staffs. Um, it's, up, it's up to you, isn't it? Really, you you decide on who you live with if you live off campus. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, it usually works. You kind of get a group of people and then you look at houses together. So if you've got like three other people you want to live with, you have four bedroom houses or whatever. You don't. And here we are put in a random room, sort of thing. <laughs> Yeah, in the centre of campus, Union Square. Um, all paths lead to Union Square. Um, go on, Dan. Show it. What have we got on Union Square then? So there's the SU, and in there you can find uh, all sorts of student support things. There's a thing called Ask, which helps with um, like hou housing tenancy agreements. Uh, they can go over it. There's also, there's food. Um, they change it. I think every couple of years. They used to be burrito, but I'm not too sure what they do now. Um, obviously, upstairs there's the SU as well. There's um, the Martins, which is good for like some small things. Uh, there's of course uh, it's Costa Coffee, and then like, a cafe as well. They've updated it. And then it's Cost Cutter, but then I think is it next year? It's um... no, in a couple of weeks it's it's a co-op, yeah, co-op, right? And then obviously like the bank and uh, pharmacy. Um, so the, no, uh, the bank's not there anymore. You've got the farm, the pharmacy is still there, and then you've also got S uh, ST Five, is it? Yeah, it's called on, SD5 now, isn't it? On the square? I think on the square. SD5 square. is old name. I can never remember which yeah. one it changed to. On the square, which is where you grab your curly fries, yeah. isn't it? Um, and heading into a building that I'm sure you both spent a bit of time in, the library. Beth, talk us through the library. Yeah, so there's a couple of different floors. Um, you can also obviously got all the books um, that you can rent, as well as uh, all the study space. Um, there's group study space as well as um, like silent study, which you would study by yourself in. Um, I think at the moment with COVID, you have to like book slots, um, which is all done online on the library web on the library website. Um, and you kind of like check in and stuff. But I went there a couple of times over lockdown, and it was completely fine. It was really nice to get out of the house for a bit, to be honest. Just to say, with COVID as well, it's forever changing. On we kind of as as the government release new guidance we kind of update our um processes on campus so the easiest way to just keep uh in in touch with what's happening is to go to keel.ac.uk forward slash coronavirus and all the information is there based on what level campus is in terms of um its social distancing states right through to from completely no social distancing all the way through to lockdown there's a kind of a scale that we update regularly it's moving in the right direction it's getting there um and yeah, and the library's kind of gone through several iterations of um, being completely locked down to now opening up again and you can kind of book the study spaces. Um, you've also got IT in here, haven't you, Beth? So if you've got any kind of IT there's problems. There's IT and I think there's Careers Hub as well that you can like book yes. stuff. And they can like, look over your CV and help you with that sort of thing as well. 
that's them there. So Ben was just on the stream uh, a moment ago. That's where that team is based in the careers and employability hub there. This has slightly changed around a bit, um, probably since you, you both went in. Uh, so I think as you'll see, the room, the room across has changed because there used to be books in there and there isn't anymore. Um, this has been refurbished. So you've got kind of a new um, kind of breakout space just to have a break from your studies with some seating. But I'm, I'm guessing it didn't look, did it look like this when you guys were there? No, I don't Last, think so. I think this has changed recently, yeah. And then the the books have, I think, moved up a floor um, and that's where all the, the bookcases are. Obviously, under normal circumstances, the, there's a lot of yellow tape and guidance around which hopefully won't be there for much longer fingers crossed especially this law library on the ground floor did you guys find yourself did you use the study spaces much any group study or anything like that yeah i did uh, most of my work on these um study these carols something they're called they're very good very comfy chairs uh very good for work but it's not just the libraries. There's a few other study spaces on campus as well. Uh, either of you know where they are? Can you name as many as you can? Um, I think you can book a room in the CSL on the top. There's a computer suite, even if you don't do computer science. Um, and then during exam season, they open up a lot of the university for uh, studying. You've got chances as well. Most of the well, buildings have little study spaces in the bottom. Yeah, a lot of them do. Yeah. So you got you got the big study spaces are the library, chancellors, um, the business school. You've also got the top of the CSL. They're kind of the big, um, the larger spaces where you can go. But as as Beth said, there's you'll find seating dotted around, won't you, where you can kind of grab a seat and, and do some work from. There's a chapel just in front of us, which is where you normally graduate, um, and hopefully, Dan, you'll get to come back in April, is it, and finally have your graduation. Um, Klaus Moses. So again, we're going down. It's called Central Drive now. Um, so either side of this are kind of dotted academic buildings, aren't they? So there's the Klaus Moser, which is where a lot of PhD students um, are. Walter Mobley. Either of you know off the top of the head, Walter Mobley is that that's humanities, isn't it, Dan? Well, you have some history seminars in there actually. Uh, I think uh, there's like business. It's a mix as well as exams in there. Yeah. Then on the left, coming up is. Uh, William Smith, which is Geography, Geology, and the Environment. And they've also got a cool ice... Uh, I should have said, I've just dropped this off. I didn't mean, pardon the pun, but they've got a cool ice lab around the back. I genuinely didn't mean to do that, but they have actually got uh, an ice lab around the back where they've got... Um, I think they've got a, a block of ice that's, I want to say, 8,000 years old in there. It's really old. And they, what they do is they test the air bubbles inside it so that they can test the air concentration from 8,000 years ago, which is was fascinating. So Dorothy Hodgkin, which was psychology. So again, we've just done a loop round. Here's a good question. How long does it take to learn your way around campus? Uh, Beth, how long did it take you? Not very long. Really not long. Maybe like a week. That. A week? Dan? Yeah, it wasn't too bad. I do remember getting lost at least a couple of times. Um, but the good thing is, obviously, they're all on um, all the buildings right next to each other along the main drive. So it, once you figure it out, it's not too bad. Did you find yourself kind of later into your degrees discovering new places? Um, I would say like discovering new places uh, around Keel Woods and things, not really uh, in the center. So here we are, Huxley um, on the left there with the new extension, which is this on the back, which is the Sir David Attenborough Laboratories, um, opened by Sir David Attenborough himself back in 2019. And therefore, they're more biology, isn't it, Huxley? Yeah. So yeah. a lot of the biology oh, labs in there. The labs are really nice. Though. I've had a lab in there before. And then again, we've looped around onto Leonard Jones, which again, this is more your building, isn't it, Beth? Do you yeah. also use the crime scene house? Yeah. Yeah, I've used it a few times. Nice, which we'll go past in just a minute. This building confuses people at the crime scene house because it says crime scene house on it and people don't quite understand what it is. Um, so what is it, Beth? 
Um, it's just it's like kind of like a set up house. It's got like a little living room and a kitchen and stuff. And you go in and you do different practicals in it. So I've done one. We looked like decomposition. There was like a fake person in there. It was like made out of like the the acting stuff you know that you have in the movies. It was like stuff like that, and you had to like kind of date the skeleton. So they have different practicals that they set up in there. I did a tour around there once and learned about blood spatters and how you can you can figure out the area of impact based on the blood splatters on the wall. Um, mm-hmm. And like in a film, they do that thing with the string, don't they? Where then yeah. when it all meets, that's where the impact point was. Yeah. Crazy. That, that takes a long time that we've done that before and it, it took ages to put all the bits of string up and then you actually like walk into one and then it pings some off and it's, it's a bit like <laughs> <laughs> How like the movies is forensics, Beth? Um, I don't know. I feel like they don't show a lot of it in movies. There's a lot more to it than, than you think. There's a lot of maths involved, which not my That's favorite thing in the though, world, but we just want to see the cool stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So we took a tour of this earlier. This is Lindsay Court. Where did you both live on campus? Actually, did you both stay in on campus accommodation at some point? Yeah. So Dan, where where were you? So I was in Taylor House, which is down there in Lindsay, and then they're also in um, Hallward. So um, I've got got to experience both really. Uh, What's good. Taylor House, Dan? Taylor House is just a normal, uh, well, I said relatively normal. I don't know if it's like that uh, much different to the normal uh, like Hallward A B style accommodations. It's about the same price. Um, it's quite nice, and it's got nice views of the uh, the back as well. Cool. And then Beth, where were you? I was in Hallward for my first year. Hallward for your first year, nice. How did you find? How was how was on campus accommodation living, Beth? How did you find it? Yeah, it was really nice. I liked I liked how you could instantly make friends really easily, which was nice. It wasn't as daunting that way. Um, no, I really enjoyed it. I, I would go back and do that, do it again. Nice, Dan. How was it for you? No, it was, it was really good. Honestly, it was a good community atmosphere. Uh, Hallwood's great for that. So, you, did you say you only did Taylor House? Was that the you didn't? Then you went off campus. Sorry, I, no, I was in Hallward as well. Uh, oh, Taylor House and Hallward, nice. Yeah. Were you in any of you in the Zed Sheds, my favourite? No, I knew people who were in there. They're the I've, best. I've had a tour. They've got some interesting rooms. Yeah, they're cool. Some of them used to have bathtubs as well, <laughs> if, until fairly recently. They used to have a bath, but they, they've all gone now. Waste of, waste of water. Baths are, are non, non-environmentally friendly. Can't have that. Um. So, yeah, and again, you can, as people have said, you, you can... Go into other people's um, accommodation, can't you? Um, the the Lindsay Cafe and Bar isn't just for people in Lindsay, is it? You can kind of go there for socials. Um, where were most of your Beth with with like tennis and places? Where where would you have most of your socials? Um, a lot of the time they're in the SU. Um, so, but it depends where the societies book them. So you can book them in all the social spaces. So sometimes they're in the SU. I've had a couple of li- in Lindsay Bar. Um, I think that was it. I think then we might have had one. No, none in Chances or anything like that. It's kind of in like the main like drinking areas. Oh, we had one in Lindsay, not Lindsay, Barnes Bar and like the Barnes Common Room. And then Dan, can't remember if you said, are you part of any uh, clubs? Uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, societies? Yeah, a couple. Uh, which, ones, which ones? I was part of the History Society and one called Cura, which is Keel University Royal Play Association. And we basically play like tabletop games. Uh, and nice. D&D. Um, so we were in Chancellors for that, and then uh, the History Society. Uh, we'd go off campus a lot, but KPA as well. Um, anyway. So there's a lot of course-based societies, aren't there? So kind of what do you get up to on a course-based society? Well, mostly it's just like social meeting the people in your course. So like if you're scared to meet people in a lecture, um, ha- meeting them in a sort of non-pressured or maybe a more relaxed setting outside of it, um, it's quite fun, and you can... Uh, Make friends that way. Um, and again, you don't, you don't have to join your course society, do you? It's completely optional, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and then obviously the other one. So I'm guessing, Dan, you were interested in um, Cura before, the Cura type stuff before you came to university? Yeah. And kind of just wanted to continue that on? It was good for like, it's got, it's not just that, it's got uh, all sorts of things for um, like people like board games or card games as well. Um, I, I've never really played those much, but um, yeah, was, I've played a bit of it before and uh, good play for that. 
and then Beth Societies for you. So you did tennis, which was a sport, and then you did. We did I dance. Mean, you saw me this before. Well. Dance, wasn't it? <laughs> Anything else? Um, I think I was part of the forensics one for a bit, but that was over lockdown, so um, we didn't get to do very much. But I was part of it. And we've had this question before, but kind of. Um, some people are quite worried that when they, you know, will they have time for this stuff outside of their studies? Yeah. Uh, did you find you could fit it all in quite easily? Yeah, really easy. I would definitely look at see your timetable because for forensics, we have quite a lot of labs. So I joined two, two like main ones was that I would go to and I would train. But then also if you're, if you've got a deadline and you're a bit busy that week, you don't have to go to training. Like you don't have to go to it. Um, just let whoever it is that's teaching. If you're meant to be there, just say that you can't come that week. Um, but I'd recommend joining at least one, if you can do two or three. They're just they're just so much fun, and it's it's a good way of getting skills that that aren't academic. And Dan, in terms of fitting things in around your studies, how did you find it? Yeah, I'd say it was pretty manageable. History's got slightly lower contact hours, and I assume than like forensics or science subject around like eight to ten hours. So um, you can fit it around quite easily. Uh, even though, of course, you've got to do a lot of self study um, to manage that as well. Awesome. So now we're heading into kind of the historic part of campus, right up your street, Dan. Um, this is all the the old older buildings on campus. We've got the clock house here, which uh, the right hand side is the is the music school, with some uh, studio space in there. So if you're studying music, you're likely to go in there. Um, but I think also if you if you're interested in music, I think you can also hire out some of the practice rooms as well. Um, it's called the clock house because there's the big clock on it and it used to be the stables back um in sort of the uh 1600s this would have been the stables and then straight ahead of us is the original entrance to campus as well which is no longer in use but i think you can walk down there and get to the services that way i think that's where you go if you head to the services and and grab a kfc because the m6 runs right along the side um beyond that tree line there's the m6 do you guys find you spend a lot of time having to walk around here? Are these kind of the areas that you kind of explored throughout your degree and found new routes around camp, new walking spots around campus? Yeah, it's, it's great. I think actually right next to where we are is Taylor House. So you can literally walk out this lovely like, back garden area and down here. So it's very nice. Um, just like a, a step away from your accommodation. Nice. And how, how, of, uh, how often would you say, Beth, was it you who said you actually were on campus for a bit of lockdown? Yeah, well, I was off campus, but we would drive onto campus to go that for a walk. It. And if you follow the the original entrance um, and turn left, it brings you back into Keel Woods. Um, that's about an hour's walk. It's really nice down there. And there's a variety of routes, isn't there, from kind of there's yeah, there's like different coloured walks or something, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, you probably will get lost. I mean, we got lost our first way round, and then. You can't just go to follow it and then hope for the, <laughs> the best. Yeah, you, you'll arrive somewhere. Yeah. I think I went, to, I went in from the lakeside and ended up over by um, the Cordwell Children's Centre, you know, where the, mm. near, the, near the vet school. It came out somewhere over there. Yeah. Um, but it's fun. <laughs> you kind of go into this woodland and come out com somewhere completely different on campus. And this is where you'll find a lot of people, especially today. So today was a nice um, sunny day when we filmed this and there's lots of people having picnics uh it's just a nice spot to go isn't it and kind of de-stress yeah yeah everyone's there in summer yeah, <laughs> yeah. now keel hall you, i'm sure anyone who's applied to keel will have seen this building um on some some of the photography um it's the original building on campus so when keel was first founded in 1949 this was where all of the lectures took place inside there um, but that's since then moved off and now Keel Hall is more an event space, isn't it? So you'll have, I don't know if any of you have actually done this, but had any end of year balls in there or anything like that? No. Yeah, Beth, you're nodding. Yeah, yeah they have all the AU balls and society balls in there in the, in the back bit. Yeah, it's really nice. It's pretty. So you get dressed up and go, go for a, a, a kind of a, a night, a, a more sophisticated night out yeah. than, yeah, than the like SU? Yeah, a three-course meal and then... And then you go out to the SU afterwards. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> I love it. It never gets old, I, don't, I think, when you walk around Keel, uh, Keel Hall. The view's always great. Um, there is a tradition, which we'll go past in a second, of Freshers Gate. Now, I know, Beth, you have had, you did have a photo there in first year, didn't you? 
So the suggestion is there's a gate that you have your photo there in first year and then when you leave and graduate, you have a photo there again. Dan, of course you've done it, haven't you? I don't think I have, actually. Oh, crying out loud. <laughs> but I do make it a, a habit to walk through Fresh's Gate yeah, every time. But... Do you know the story of Fresh's Gate? Do you know why, why it's called Fresh's Gate? I'm not, I'm not too sure. I'm just assuming it's just for Fresh's. And... So the gate didn't exist at first, and it was just kind of a... a, a a driveway onto into Keel Hall. Um, and lecturers were, back in 1949 or wherever it was, lecturers were getting annoyed that students were clogging up the road uh, as they were trying to drive onto the onto the car park. Um, so they thought, let's be safe. Let's build a pedestrian route. route. So they built the gate, but um, some student decided to write Fresher's Gate on it. And it was uncool at that point to be seen as a fresher. So people continued to walk on the road and, and annoyed the lecturers. And that's the story behind it. And then there was an argument about how you should spell it, whether you should have the apostrophe after the S or before the S, um, which is why on each side there's both styles of grammar. I didn't know that. I've never noticed yeah. that. Um, so one side is the apostrophe before the S and the other is after the S. After the S is actually correct. And this is it. It's the front of Keel Hall. There's also the um, Raven Mason collection in there, which is good for visiting, but we can also volunteer there. I volunteer there for a couple of months. Oh, nice. Explain what the Raven Mason collection is, Dan. It's like a pottery collection from um, when this like family called the Mason family used to own and um, produce all these pottery uh, types, really fancy looking, pot like massive vases. And also, there's like really nice paintings as well. Quite nice. Awesome. So a few questions coming in, um, which we'll go through now. Uh, one is, I'll be staying in Zed Sheds this year. Why are they so special? Heard quite a few people say it. Um, everyone just loves the Zed Sheds, don't they? They're quite unique in terms of their accommodation, aren't they? So, Dan, did you say you'd been inside them? Yeah, I mean, from what I remember, the rooms are uh, like somewhat like half underground, I think. Uh, you go downstairs. Yeah, to, like, go into the... like a hillside, isn't it? That they're yeah. kind of it, The buildings are kind of in the hillside. Yeah. They're a bit cheaper than normal Hallwood uh, accommodation. They're just cool, very quirky uh, and nice. Uh, just before we move on with the next questions, we'll point out the KPA, which is just in front of us. Um, Beth, I think you said it's the best food on campus. Yeah, I love it there. The food's really good. And yeah, it's really nice in the summer to sit outside. They have like, little picnic benches. It's really nice. And as we said, in the Hallwood tour, it has just had a complete new refurb. It looks amazing. Lots of new chairs and... Um, the tables have had a good um, kind of resurfacing too, and it just looks completely fresh and new again on the inside. The bar looks great. Um, so if you do get a chance, pop to it. And on a sunny day, it's great, isn't it? It's always busy on the outside on a sunny day. Apparently, they do a great Sunday roast as well. Yeah, I've heard that. I've never had one, but I've heard it's good. That's the KPA. Uh, Jennifer has asked... When will the vet school finish construction? So the vet school should be ready for students who are starting in September. So it's very, very nearly done. Um, so hopefully be ready for this September. Miriam has asked, is there quite um, is there quite a bit of bike storage? Either of you have a bike? I never brought it to kill, but I believe every accommodation has one. Uh, there's one next to C block in Horwood, and then Lindsay has one for sure as well. And I think you, some of them are enclosed as well, aren't they? So I think you can sign up and get a key or your key card gives you access, I think. Yeah, you, you yeah, can get a key, I think. Yeah, but either way, there's, there's a variety of on-campus bike storage, uh, storage as well. And there's kind of the loop. So we've gone all the way around the back of the library um, and now we're back um, back to Union Square here, which is the center of campus. And there's on the square, which is where you get your curly fries as well. Yeah, that's really good. Definitely go there. Where is the first place you guys went when you arrived then? Other, other than obviously moving into your accommodation block, where's the first place you ventured out to have a look at? Uh, Beth? Probably the SU, to be honest. Because we moved in on a Saturday and then they had a night out on the Saturday night and we all went as a flat. I think that was the first place I properly went to on campus. Dan, similar to you? Yeah, I think either we went, uh, our block went on like a walk around campus a bit, or we went, um, I think it could have been the day after, we went to the SU though, uh, that's usually the, the ritual for everyone who arrives, um, very fun. Nice. 
Um, and as you can see, there's, uh, well, uh, people ask this quite a lot. Uh, there's Emily in the back who joined us for the Barnes tour. You'll see her there in the high vis, um, giving a campus tour to some people on the day that we filmed this. Um, in terms of getting a job on campus, then you two are the experts because you currently do it. But what opportunities are there, um, Dan, what opportunities are there to get work on campus while she's studying? Well, obviously, there's a student ambassador role, uh, which is like campus tours, but also other sort of small random events you can do. There's uh, the SU has a few different jobs. There's uh, obviously the bars and cafe. And I think there's a SU steward. Um, so a, yeah, um, student union steward. So you sort of like stand around and make sure everyone's safe on a night out. There's a, and the other, the other um, shops and campus uh, uh, bars and things around campus. I think you can work there as well. And then Beth, did you know anyone in the local area that kind of picked up any jobs i'm guessing there's a few things you can get um, to in the local area i had a housemate who used to work at costa um yeah there's loads of different like shops and stuff especially in like newcastle underline which is obviously the closest to town there's those of little places like bars and little shops and cafes that you can work at if you if you wanted to nice uh question come in from uh lucy who's asked can you uh can you bring your car so um Better to take this one. So, in terms of a car, then on campus, a would you say you need one? And B, I wouldn't can, say how you do you how do you go about it? I guess yes, you could bring it, but you would need to get a permit. Um, otherwise, paying for parking every day will be quite get quite expensive. Um, you apply for parking permits online on the website, uh, but you honestly you don't you don't need one to be honest. I didn't have one in first year or really second year because I wasn't allowed a permit because my house was too close to campus, so I didn't qualify for one. Um, so we just car shared or I would get the bus and stuff like that. So you really don't need one, to be honest. Dan, would you say you need a car? Did you ever find you needed a car to get around? Uh, not for living on campus, but I guess uh, if you do live off campus, it can be quite useful. Um, but with on campus, you can, um, like with groceries, you can, the bus actually stops right outside the Lidl, or not too far outside the Lidl, like a, a couple of minutes walk so you can that's quite easy to get um your shopping on foot but you can also do a grocery delivery i used to do that a few times like most of them deliver to right to your door in fact so it's quite convenient and how did you find campus then so obviously i said at the start we are britain's biggest campus um did you find that you were often getting your steps in um was it good exercise walking around campus um was it nice to have because people call it the keel bubble don't they so um what how would you describe the keel campus to people beth if someone said you know what's it like i don't know it's hard to explain it's like everything is there that you need so if you didn't want to leave campus you you don't have to um especially with the new car i assume that's going to have more stock in it than the old cost cutter did um so you really don't have to leave campus if you don't want to um but obviously i did i would i went to the to the little and the aldi and the morrisons and stuff for my weekly groceries but yeah, it's like kind of isolated, but not isolated. It's like, I don't really know how to describe it because you're kind of in your own little world there because you don't have to leave, but then you can easily get the bus to the train station and go to Manchester for the day. Like everything's just so easily accessible. So in your first year then, how, how often would you go off campus? I would go off every week, for my weekly shop. Just for your shopping and then you'd kind of do the rest. Everything else was on campus for you. Yeah, yeah, I had no need to leave, to be honest, because all my social activities and everything like that was on campus. Nice. And and Dan, in terms of you then, how, how would you describe Keel Campus? Yeah, I'd say the bubbles is a good way to describe it because you have almost everything you need. And sometimes socials go off campus, I would say, uh, like into bars and stuff, um, pubs off, off campus. But generally, um, yeah, it can all be, almost be too easy to stay on campus. But it's also very well connected, though, so um, for both. Did either of you grow up in a city? Yeah, uh, well, so Reading is counted as a town, but it's, it's kind of like a large town. They always boast about how large it, it's the largest town. <laughs> but, yeah. What would you say the main differences are then, Dan, in terms of a city experience to a campus experience? Yeah, I said, like, you're just not, like, directly in the middle of the, um, like, where everything's happening, uh, but you can very quickly get to... Newcastle or Stoke or even um, Birmingham or Manchester. Yeah. Uh, questions come in from uh, I don't actually know who. Uh, they've asked how how long does it take to travel from university to the town centre? 
Um, so let's go. How long would you find it took uh, Beth to get from campus to Newcastle? Well, the bus is, I think it's about 10 minutes. It's really not far. Well, it's 10, 15 minutes. Depends on the amount of stops that they make. And then from there to, say, this is campus to Stoke? Uh, I think it's about 40 minutes. If you want to get to Hanley, I think it's about 50. But if on the bus? Less stops, it's a lot less. Oh, you're, yeah, you're talking about the bus. I mean, if you drove from uh, oh, Kiel to Hanley, it'd be about 30 minutes. You're like probably right there, yeah, bus. Yeah, it's so quick. And Stoke is maybe like 15, 20. Yeah, so not far all. Oh, go on, Dan. Also, walking back is quite nice because it's down a hill. You don't have to walk up the hill. And it's quite a nice view walking down Kill Hill. I was quite like it. So um, that's about 40 minutes, maybe. 45, depending on how far you walk. I think the Kiel Hill gets a bad reputation. I don't think it's that steep. This is the this is Kiel Bank that everyone moans about. It's barely got a gradient to it. It's got some a steep bit <laughs> yeah, at the beginning. Yeah, it's really long. The thing is, I always say this first bit's the worst, yeah. and then and then once you get past there, it is. It's a nice walk. Um, and the e-scooters get up there, so if you if you really need to, you can just power your way up um, on the e-scooters. That's campus. So let's go for your your favourite spot on campus then. Uh, I'll go on, I'll, I'll, what's your favourite spot on campus, Dan? Where, where where are you? Where would I find you on a, on an average day at Kiel? I don't know if I'd, you find me there every day, but I say Kiel Woods. This has to be the best. It's got some amazing little spots. Um, like there's one very nice hill with like a um, like a log, which is like a bench. You can just like chill there for a bit. There's, oh, there's so many nice spots in there. So I'd say Kiel, Kiel Woods. There's loads of random stuff in there. So there's the there's the the benches and there's a swing, a rope swing yeah. that you can go on. Um, you can sit around the lake. Um, yeah, it's great. So to Beth, you can't have Kiel Woods. Oh, I was going to say Keel Hall slash Keel Woods. No, um, can't, can't have either. Where else is a good spot to go? Ooh. I don't know. I used to hang out a lot in Chancellors to do work. It's a nice study space if you want to do it as a group because there are more tables um, and you can chat on it and stuff and they have little pods. So I like it in there. Nice. And then if anyone who's watching is starting in September... Um, What's the best way on campus to get the most out of your your first week, uh, Dan? How would you uh, how would you what 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 advice would you give to someone to get the most out of their first week at Kiel? I would say um, what's it called Freshers Fair. Uh, so like for societies and all that, so you can sign up because you can get uh, I believe taster sessions or they do taster weeks for some uh, depending, and it's it's just a great way to get stuck in, and it's scary at first, but you know you get used to it. And hopefully that will be in person this year again. So Freshers' Fair is normally in the Students' Union, isn't it, On in the ballroom? Yeah. And you can wander around. It's ace because you meet, you basically meet every area of Kiel in Freshers' Fair, don't you? This is all the societies in there um, with from the Yorkshire Appreciation Society where they seem to have lots of boxes of Yorkshire tea, from Quidditch to Harry Potter Society. Um, there's all sorts of... Um, societies in there and there i guess the, the main thing is societies are run by students aren't they dan so um for D you can be on the committee can't you and you can manage the D society uh well the, the cure cura was it called cure yeah um and if there's something that you're interested in that isn't currently society you can set that up can't you you can just make that yourself uh, and that's that goes for sport as well. Uh, so sport's slightly different, isn't it, Beth? They have uh, similar freshers fair over at the sports centre, don't they? Yeah. And yeah, you can do taster sports sessions. Sports. Is that right? You can kind of get involved yeah. in taster sessions. Yeah. So like the societies, they have the first few weeks, you can just go along to a couple of sessions and just see if you like it, like the vibes and like just generally the sports. So a lot of sports societies, you can compete in it um with other unis but you can also do it just for fun like if you've never done it before you can do it as a beginner as well awesome uh and beth same thing to you then how how to get the most out of your first week at keel um other I'm than gonna freshers fair. Say the same thing oh no, i can't say, say the same thing I it's was illegal say freshers fair nope um you must have done something I, else i don't know just throw yourself into it and like try not to worry because every, everybody's really nervous um so just really don't worry about like kind of meeting people because it'll just happen naturally, even if you don't think it will. It will, trust me. <laughs> nice. 
Well, thank you both. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for showing us around campus. Um, are you both on Unibuddy? I know, Beth, you are, aren't you? Dan, yes. are you? Yeah. yeah. So if you want to get in touch with either Beth or Dan, you can go to keel.ac.uk forward slash chat. Um, and you can chat to them about anything to do with life at Keel, uh, Keel as well. We're heading next in around about five minutes time to social life at Keel uh, live Q&A with George, who is going to be joined by Nissa um, from the Residence Life team and then also Rob Linton from the Students' Union. And then Mustafa, uh, another of our student ambassadors, will be there as well to talk you through um, what you can get up to outside of your studies and all, the, all of the other stuff that's in place as well. Um, but thank you both. Uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank, thank you. you both. Uh, and we'll see you in just about four minutes time bye
and welcome to this live Q&A session looking at the social activities available here at Keele, running as part of today's virtual open day. I'm really pleased to be joined by Nissa, Rob and Mustafa for today's session. Just for a little bit of context, Keele SU is a charity that's run by students, running services such as bars, food outlets, uh, shops, sports clubs, societies, and they also offer an impartial advice service. Additionally, your time in halls can be one of the most memorable and enjoyable parts of student life. Residence Life is the Keel programme to help make sure you can make the most out, out of it, making it fun, social, and also giving you the reassurance that there is support there for you if you ever need it. We're going to be here for the next 20 minutes or so to answer any questions that you might have, so please do feel free to pop them in the chat and we'll get through as many as we can. Just before we get started, I will ask the panel to introduce themselves. So I'll hand over to Rob first. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Rob and um, I'm the Membership Services Manager at um, Keele Students' Union. So in my remit, um, I look after sort of volunteering, the athletic union and sports and then sort of all our comms um, and, and, and marketing. Well, thanks Rob. And over to you, Nessa. So I'm Nissa and I'm Residence Life Manager as part of the Residence Life team. I've worked at Keele for about three or four years um, supporting students who are living in halls. But just recently we've created a Residence Life team and lots of other staff members have joined me. And we're hoping to put a lot into making sure that students who are living in halls are having the best time, both in terms of being supported, but also having fun, making friends and so on. Thanks, Nissa. And last but absolutely not least, Mustafa, over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Mustafa. I'm a third year medical student. Actually, I just finished my third year, so I'm technically a fourth year medical student now. <laughs> yeah, you made it into fourth year. <laughs> yes, great success. Uh, <laughs> Rob, let's start with you. I think the best place to start is if, if you could perhaps give us a bit of an overview of what is a student's union, because, you know, pre-university, you've perhaps not come across a student's union before. So what is the uh, what is the SU? Absolutely. So um, a student's union is all about you, the students, and we are sort of there to make sure that you that your time at Keele is enjoyable, engaging, and we're there to sort of support your development as a person. Um, so students automatically become a member of the student's union when they um, sign up. So there's there's no need to sign up separately or send us any details. You're, you automatically uh, become a member. Um, and we're also a membership led organization as well so you know everything uh, we do anything that you want us to do basically you come to us you come to us and, and you tell us what you want us to be working on what campaigns you want us to run what type of events you want um and sort of we'll support you sort of sort of through that the students union although there's staff members um like myself we are we are um run by five student officers who are elected every single year um, and they sort of run the students um, and union and they um, are sort of the student voice um, and they represent you to both us at the students union and also into the university meetings um, as, as as well. We've got a lovely building in the, in the heart of campus right right in the centre so you can always pop in and say hi um, and see what we've got um, on offer to sort of support and help you. A little bit of an overview there. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. I think there was perhaps a time when people would think an SU is, is purely a building where there's nights out and it's all sort of around, you know, uh, events and that kind of thing. But it really is so much more than that, isn't it? And you mentioned there that you ran by five officers. And is that just sort of so we can really sort of make sure that we're representing the student voice? That, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, th th those students are elected each year. They sort of um, sort of speak to students and they sort of put together their sort of aims and objectives for the year. And then we work and then we strive to work to make sure sort of those are achieved um, sort of in sort of the past 12 months. Our officers have sort of supported students in, in their exams and their academic issues, ensuring that those who um, are maybe struggling with exams and working from home um, have been supported more during that time. And they've sort of been the voice of um, those students in university meetings to make sure that exams have been sort of moderated and marked fairly we call it safety net policy um, and our officers sort of led on that um, they've also recently been looking at the shops and services on campus as well and, and we might move on to that but we sort of worked our officers sort of worked to improve those shops and services and we've got the launch of the new co-op coming soon as well and um, they were integral to sort of um, sort of the workings of that so you know the shoot that um, any student who's coming to Keel can speak to our, 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 our officers and sort of have a chat with them and then they can bring forward ideas to make sure that um, the university is always improving evolving and making sure it's there for sort of the students um, whenever they're needed 
Yeah, absolutely. I think it's just such a good example of how proactive the officers are and, and sort of how integral the student union is in terms of making sure that the student voice is heard and, you know, we're constantly improving our services based on what our students need. Mustaford, now might be a nice time to come over to you. So sort of what's your involvement been with the SU over your time at Kiel so far? So I've done uh, a few things. Um, so I, I joined a, a bunch of sports cl- sports clubs and societies when I started off. Um, so but I, the ones I mainly dragged out were Kiel Esports, which is a uh, very basically competitive video gaming um, and table tennis as well. So I really enjoyed those two. Uh, and as I got um, as I as I got more and more comfortable with Kiel, figured out um, what I wanted to do. Um, I also applied to be a trustee for Kiel as well. And I think um, Rob might be able to explain better than I am um, as to what the role of trustees are within the organization. Um, but if I just give a brief overview, um, every single charity needs trustees uh, and they're the people who do the long term vision of what the charity uh, what the charity is going towards. So the elected officers come in and they change every single year. So there's a lot of change going on th- with that. But the trustee and the trustee board, um, which you can join as a student, um, you can give lo- you develop long term plans which go on for five, 10, 15 years into the future. Um, so I, I was uh, a trustee at Kiel SU for two years uh, and I just finished my tenure this year. Um, and uh, on top of that, yeah, I joined a bunch of sports clubs and societies, um, some medics things as well, as well as that. Ace, ace. And Rob, sports and uh, clubs and societies and that kind of thing are an- another sort of really integral part of the SU, aren't they? I imagine the ones that I could list off are probably a drop in the ocean as to what we actually offer. Can you just give us a bit of a flavour on the kind of societies that are available for students at the moment? Yeah, this this is my absolutely favourite thing. This is what I'm sort of super passionate about is sort of getting students involved in sort of clubs and societies because the skills that you can get, your your, your degree is what we one thing and, and we absolutely want to ensure that all students leave Keel with, with, with the best possible degree um, that, that they can. But you know, it's so competitive nowadays when you're when you're sort of thinking. You know, I don't want to talk about leaving university when you haven't maybe started yet, but that's something always to bear in mind is, is what's going to be the end, end results. And I think joining clubs and societies is one of those ways where you can develop so many sort of different skills. Um, and at Keel, we've got sort of over a hundred different clubs and societies. Must have mentioned um, a few of our sort of sports and our, and our gaming ones, um, but we also offer societies that tie into your course. We've got a range of academic societies. So, for example, if you're studying law, you can join our law society. Society, um, and you can sort of be with sort of like-minded people um, who can sort of support you with the academic side, maybe in revision and, and study sessions, but they can also give you the social side. So you can get to know people on your course better um, in a different environment outside sort of the seminar room in the lecture theatre um, as, as, as well. Our sports clubs, we've got, we've got sort of 36 um, different sports clubs. So um, Basically, if you've been watching the Olympics, there's probably a club that fits into one of those sports. If you've watched something and you've really liked it, we've maybe probably um, got got that sort of club. But, you know, we've got the usual football, rugby, hockey, tennis, um, oh, swimming, mountaineering, cycling. There's so many. If you, if you go to our website, keylesu.com forward slash activities, you can see the full list um, of, our, of our sports clubs and societies. Um, and with those, you can, you know, it's no experience needed. So if you haven't played at um, school or college, it doesn't necessarily matter. You can just um, join and they run training sessions and taster sessions to give you a flavour of what it's about. You can do it, um, uh, it for fun or you can also join competitively and you can join books, which is the university Oh, wait, British University Colleges and Sports, um, and um, they compete. You can go to matches and competitions up and down the country and compete against other universities. So um, there's different sort of levels of sport. Um, so I'd absolutely you know, recommend anyone get involved um, in our clubs and societies because the amount of skills, the friends you meet, the communities, um, there's so many positives. Um, I could just go on and on with all the positives and, and how it will help with your employability and, and all that jazz. So absolutely would recommend. Ace, ace. And Nissa, let's come to you, because obviously another huge part of the student experience very often is obviously living on campus and sort of learning how to stand on your own two feet. And, and for a lot of people, that's the first time that they've had to sort of support themselves independently. So you're from our Residence Life team. So can you just give uh, students a bit of an idea on what Residence Life is? Because it's a relatively new thing that we've introduced here at Keel, isn't it? So just a bit of an overview of what that service is. It is, yeah. So we've offered um, residence support on campus for a number of years now, and that will still continue as part of the Residence Life project. And that is advice given by managers, including myself, to help students kind of acclimatise and get used to their living environment. 
So if, for example, you turn up and you're feeling homesick, you can come and talk to us and we can give you some advice about how to settle in and how to make friends with the people that you're living with and, and so on. Of course, some of the issues students might face in their living environment don't always happen at the beginning of the year. So that support can happen all the way throughout. So if you have a fallout with a flatmate or have an issue with a neighbour, we're, we're always there to, to give support. And I say always there because we really are always there. Um, unlike um, other support agencies that might have nine to five working hours between the staff in residence life, in term time, we have 24 seven coverage. And that is um, from a mixture of the managers, such as uh, myself and my colleagues, but also from our resident advisor team. So our resident advisors are student volunteers. There's 33 of them in total, and they live in halls as well. And they work overnight and on weekends to support when we are not quite available to help out. They have really intensive training covering every issue that a student could possibly face um, and sometimes it's just nice to talk to a friendly face that's a similar sort of age as well so there are choices on how you can access the advice and support from us but we're also expanding our remit now to look at ways we can build community in halls perhaps build a sense of pride in where you live. So this year, for the first time, we'll be asking our resident advisors to also arrange a range of activities in halls. So um, we're in early days yet, so I can't give you any examples of what they're going to do, but our thoughts are that they might do things like a quiz for Barnes Hall students or um, some kind of competition at Hallwood and so on. Um, to get the ball rolling, the staff team have been organising some events for welcome so that we can launch with a bit of a bang. And we've got loads of things organised, ranging from crafting competitions to photo competitions um, and lots more in the pipeline that we haven't quite gotten around to, to sorting just yet. But all of those events will be in the Keele University app. So for those students starting this September, if you make sure you've got that ready, you'll be able to find out all about those. Ace. Thanks, Nessa. Mustafa, did you live on campus in your first few years? Yes, yeah, I did. I lived, in my, I lived on campus in my first year. I lived in the cheapest accommodation on campus, um, which was great. I, I um, lived in an open block with 28 people. Um, and as terrible as that might sound to somebody, um, it was actually great. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I met so many people so quickly and made so many new friends. Um, in such a great cohesive environment um, and there are people you know from different backgrounds people from different age ages um, so I really did make lots of friends and I'm not just saying that like I, I still live with them some of them right now um, so I've carried on friendships from there um, so as daunting as it might seem to you um, coming into university I don't know if you're coming in this year or next year um, as daunting as it, might, as it might seem the support network here at Kiel was really good um, as Nissa said it was 24-7 um, and I think the type of student who usually applies to Kiel and comes to Kiel is also quite nice and friendly as well. We're a, we're a different bunch. There's a thing, things here, in my opinion, go a little bit slower than other places. So there's a much more relaxed vibe, much more personable vibe here. Um, since I'm a graduate, I, I have the experience, I guess, to say that because I've gone to other universities. Um, yeah. So I, I, I can I can attest and say Kiel is very chilled out. Um, and don't if you if you are stressed, even though I say you shouldn't be. Um, the support networks are here so you can de-stress with them. Yeah, so this has obviously just given us a really nice overview of the kind of things that students will hopefully be able to get involved in. Um, what would your piece of advice be, Mustafa, for someone who perhaps hasn't moved away from home before, they're moving away for the first time, understandably probably feeling a little bit overwhelmed, perhaps a little bit anxious about, you know, moving into halls. Um, as a student who's been there and done it, what would you advise these kind of students? I would highly advise make a group chat. Um, before you come to Kiel, um, before you come to campus, make a group chat, meet the people you're, you're going to live with for the next year. Um, and I can, if you're coming in this year, those group chats are already being made. So if you go to the Kiel Student Life 2021-2022, uh, Rob, did I get that correct? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah, uh, the SU runs the page. So if you go to that, if you go to that page, you'll be able to make a post and ask, hey guys, I'm living in Horwood, I don't know, flat this. Uh, and then you'll be able to find people who are also living in the same space as you. And then you can start to get to you can start to get to know them earlier on and make friends that way so that when you do come in, 
and you are a little bit lost, you have friends already there to support you. Yeah, I think that's ace advice, ace. Um, Nissa, most of us just said how obviously you lived on campus but has moved off campus. Will students who um, move off campus still be able to get involved in some of the activities um, that residents like put on or is it purely just for those students living in halls? The focus is mainly for the students living in halls, but we are open to all students getting involved. Just because an event is labelled, you know, the Barnes Hall quiz, for example, it doesn't mean that other students won't be able to attend, even if they don't live on campus. But I, I think it's really key to say that it's not just the events that are available for off campus students, that 24 seven support is as well. Now, our resident advisors do support students who are living in halls, and that is their remit. But our security team and our out of hours residents live team um, are always there for students on or off campus 24 seven as well. So, um, yeah, th there's lots that off campus students can be involved in as well. And, and please don't feel excluded in in terms of the events or the support. Yeah. And Mustaford, with you living off campus now, how have you managed to sort of keep up with all the social things that are going on on campus and sort of still ensure that you're sort of really sort of uh, feeling part of that Keele community? Mm, yeah, um, so I'm a medical student and I spend most of my time at the hospital now. Um, the Clinical Education Centre, which is where I'm mostly based at the hospital, has a SU office there um, and they, they do SU advertisements there as well. So the SU does outreach, um, but I get lots and lots and lots of emails from the university um, as well. So even though I'm, I'm not ma mainly based on campus anymore, I still have access to the emails and the services. And I'm, I'm definitely still made aware that those services are available to me. Um, yeah, because because they, they make, Keel reaches out and they make contact. Yeah, brilliant. And Rob, let's come back over to you at the start. You briefly mentioned about some of the shops, services um, that are available to students via the SU. Do you wanna just give us a bit of information about that? Yeah, of course, Cam. So, um, briefly mentioned that uh, we've got new uh, co-op coming to campus. So, opening um, in, in, in September, we'll be a brand new co-op. Um, which will be again um, right at the heart of campus sort of next door to the students union building um, and that'll be a brilliant resource for students for just buying those essentials um, and you can also get discounts so um, by being a student you become a member of sort of sort of NUS and you can buy a totem card which is your student discount card some people may have that if they've been to college um, and, and pick one up that way but you can get 10% off in the co-op so hopefully bring in a value for money service and um, right onto campus to support students with buying their groceries and, and bits and pieces um, like that. Um, we also run an advice centre, um, so it's independent from the university and can support students um, with academic advice. So if you're struggling with your exams or you maybe didn't get the grades you were expecting, our advice centre can independently support you um, through that process if you need to appeal or you need any um, other advice. They can also support with um, off-campus accommodation, finances um, and bits and pieces like that. So um, if you are struggling, we, we can support you that way uh, we also run a print shop um, on campus the keel print house and so if you need to print your dissertation or maybe you've joined a club and society and you really want to advertise your event by getting some posters printed again we can then um, help you um, with um, getting some really cheap printing done and um, that's really high quality as well and then we've also got the nightclub bars eateries in our, in our SU building as well so we've got that sort of social side so after lectures and seminars everyone's welcome in our building for sort of um, a drink and a burger or in the evenings if you sort of need to de-stress and you need to just dance the night away hopefully come September you know we're you know restrictions and um, allowing we'll be sort of back open with our nightclub and our big evening events as well and if you want a taster um, if you're coming in September or you're planning on coming in the future um, we've just launched all our welcome events um, via our website so if you want a taste of the sort of events we're running I'd really recommend checking out our website keelsu.com to find out more about um, what events are going and they're also on the Keel University app as Nissa mentioned um, as, as, as well so you can find our events there just to get a flavour of the sort of things we do. Perfect. I think you also mentioned volunteering as well, which can be sort of quite important for students' employability and just getting themselves involved in, in more of those sort of types of activities. Can you give us a bit of information about how that works and sort of how students can get involved in volunteering? 
Absolutely. So, um, yeah, volunteering um, is sort of massive at Kiel. Every year our students um, log thousands of hours worth of volunteering, both on campus and in the local community, which is sort of brilliant. And if, and if that's something you're really interested in, sort of giving back to local charities or supporting projects on campus, you can, again, head to our website. Um, and um, on there, you can create yourself a little profile of what we call our volunteering profile. And on that, you will see all the different vol uh, volunteering opportunities we offer. We work with about... I think it's about 70 different um, providers at the moment um, in the local area and they post adverts up and then you can just have a scroll through there's different filters and different categories so you can find the opportunities that um, relate to your set um, relate to you and then you sort of sign up and then that organization will be in touch and will sign you up and um, will tell you where you need to be and what you need to do and, and stuff like that. Um, with our volunteering, you can commit as much or as little as time as you want. You know, if you've got quite a chocker timetable, you can maybe allow it, give it a bit of time at the weekend. But if you've got a bit more flexibility in, in what you're doing, you can give it more time um, as, as well. So, again, as you said, Georgina, there's, that's a brilliant way to sort of gain new skills, um, employability skills, great for the CV, get those sort of references and create, start creating that portfolio sort of before you leave the bits and pieces you've done. So, yeah, again, you can head to our website to find more information about the different uh, opportunities we have. Brill. Thanks, Rob. And Mustafa, let's come back to you. Not that a student would ever need to go off campus because everything that they're going to need is on campus. Um, but, you know, if you do fancy a change of scenery, obviously we're really close to the local area. What's the kind of, uh, what kind of social activities are going on in the local area? Um, what's it like? How do you get around? Just give us a bit of an overview of the local area. Yeah, sure. So the local area is called Newcastle on the Lyme. And that's the closest town to um, to Kiel University. You can get there by, by the bus. So the number 25 is the basic vital line. Um, and the number 25 will take you from campus um, to the local area. And if you're a, um, if you're a healthcare student, it will also take you through the hospital. Um, and if you want to leave for whatever reason, um, it will also take you to Stoke Station. Um, yeah, so it'll take you all sure, the way through. The number 25. <laughs> yeah, it will take you everywhere. Um, and yeah, so you can get on the number 25 and go into Newcastle that way. And then Newcastle is a, a it used to be a market town. I think it is still a market town. Um, so there's um, there's there's weekly markets there. Um, and it's a buzzing show, social life. There's a number of nightclubs, um, places to go out, number of places to eat. Um, I, I don't know about brand advertisement here, but Capello's, if you're interested, Capello's mm -hmm. is really good. Um, there's also a cinema out, out there too. Um, and the, there's a, a new place that opened up a year or two ago called the Clubhouse Stoke. And they offer lots of opportunities, mini golf, um, table tennis, um, video games as well. So there's lots to do in town. But if you don't find whatever you want to do in town, uh, there's also the local area around. There's lots of beautiful places to go visit. Trenton Gardens um, and the monkey uh, monkey forest there as well. Great places to go visit. Um, and the if you, if you don't like uh, Newcastle for whatever reason, you can always go to Stoke Station and head off to Manchester and Birmingham, bigger cities um, and more opportunity there as well. And the the trip there shouldn't shouldn't take too long at all. About 20 minutes on the train to get to get to Manchester. Perfect. And while we're with you, Mustafa, obviously, um, I don't know how you fit all of this in, but you obviously do work as a student ambassador as well, sort of representing Kiel, don't you? And that's obviously what you're doing today. Just tell us a little bit about that and how you've got involved with that and the kind of things that that's led you on to. Yeah, so student ambassador is the best job. It is it's just apply to it. Uh, so when you when you come in, uh, apply to be a student ambassador and represent Kiel. Um, within student ambassador, there's lots of different ways that you can represent and, and work. Um, but if you get your foot in the door, it will basically open up a lot of working opportunities for you. Um, the way you do that is you apply in, I think, November time. I'm not sure exactly when, uh, but early on in the year, uh, you'll be able to apply for that. And the job is super flexible. It uh, pays really well. And the people who you work for, um, the university and the team that you work with are super, super nice and friendly. So definitely, uh, definitely jump on. The job is as flexible as you want it to be. So you can um, you can work as many hours as you want, as many hours as they really offer you. And you can reject jobs um, and they won't mind at all. They always find somebody um, to, to fill a position. So just apply to it. Uh, the way I got into doing this sort of stuff now is um, Tom, who's in the background of the stream. I basically just met him when I was doing an open day and I harassed him. Uh, and then he gave me a job opportunity, a digital marketing opportunity, which was running an Instagram, uh, which was running Keele University's Instagram for a day. And then it just took off from there, really. So the more, the longer I've been here, the more experience I've got um, and the more confident I've become. As Rob was mentioning, university is not just about your degree, but it's about the other opportunities and experiences that you can get uh, whilst you're there. And student ambassador 
and the the SU and student life here, they really do try and put in all the effort so you can get those skills and experiences. And if I plug it again, student ambassador, man, it's great. <laughs> Real, real. Thank you so much. Mustafa. Well, that does actually bring us to the end of this session. I said it would go quick, um, but that does bring us to the end. So thank you very much for joining us as part of this Q&A, as part of the, uh, the virtual open day. And thank you, Rob, Nissa and Mustafa, for your time today. Apologies if there are any questions that we didn't quite get round to. We've got staff available on Unibuddy um, on our website, so you can always uh, point your, di your questions in that direction. Coming up in around five minutes time, we have our final session of the day where you can be asking our students anything about living and studying at Keele. Hopefully you found this Q&A useful. We hope you enjoy the rest of our virtual open day and hope we'll see you soon. Thank you.
Hello and welcome back and welcome to the final section of our stream today, our chat to our students live Q&A. So I'm now joined by four of our current students, some of them you may recognise, well three of them you'll recognise from previous sessions of the stream. Uh, you've got Vasant, Beth and Dan and then we're also joined by Kyle, four of our current students, apart from Dan who's just graduated, but we'll still class him as a current an honorary current student, um, who are all experts um, in being... Uh, Students at Kiel. They're experts of being students at Kiel. They know what it's like to live and study at Kiel. Um, so any questions that you've got, that you've watched the stream and maybe you've thought of something uh, throughout the day that you just want to ask to them, it's an open floor. So any questions about anything to do with clubs, societies, accommodation, campus, um, what it's like to study at university, anything like that, pop, pop them in the, uh, in the chat and I can ask them uh, to one of the four joining us today. So just in case anyone new uh, is joining us, we'll get you to go around the room uh, and introduce yourself tell us and, what, and tell us what course you're studying. So we'll start with you, Basant, do you wanna go first? Yeah, I'm Basant and I'm just about to start my fourth year of medicine. Uh, Beth? So I'm Beth, I'm just about to start my fourth year, which is my master's year in forensics. Dan? I'm Dan, I've just graduated and uh, finished my third year in history. And then finally, Kyle. Hey, uh, my name's Kyle and I've just finished my final year in criminology. Nice. Nice. Loving the moustache, Kyle, as well. That's new since the last one we did. Loving it. Very nice. Very nice. Um, so great. Now, actually, Kyle, I'm going to go... Kyle uh, and Basant, I'm going to go with you two first because we got Beth and Dan during our campus tour to tell us what the most inter interesting thing about their course or fun fact, that something that blew their mind about their course was. Um, so I want to tell you, what's the what's the best thing you've learned so far? What's the one thing that everyone's like, what's the most interesting thing you know from studying your course? What would it be? Uh, Basant, let's go with you. Oh, that's a tough one. Uh... Give me a I fact mean, that will blow my mind. You do medicine. I know, that's the thing. And I can't remember anything from medicine right now. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many interesting facts and I can't remember. Um, well, what is it now? Um, I'd say the liver is the biggest organ and it, can, it has a tendency to regenerate itself to uh, an extent, um, which is really amazing. And the brain as well. If you take like if you remove a part of the tumor, it has the brain has the tendency to re um, kind of re remake the connections, so you can relearn things again. And even if you take part of the brain out, you can still function fully without it. Amazing, mm. very fun. I bet there's loads and loads of cool facts like yeah. that on <laughs> medicine. Uh, Carl, what about you? Um... I can't really think of anything, but I can think of a fact um, it's to do with football. But um, the Liverpool's the highest has the highest domestic abuse as a team in the UK. Nice. And you learned that on the course. Is that's not Clifford Start, is it? Uh, it was just through Liverpool in general. Oh, nice. Very nice, very nice. So there's there's some fun facts about the courses that they studied. Uh, just a reminder, Beth's was uh, that you love that you set fire to things and have the fire brigade come in and dogs come as well. And then Dan's was that languages all come from the same place, was it? At least in Eurasia, yeah, like Europe and Asia, a lot of them yeah. do, yeah. They can all be traced back. Very interesting. There's some fun facts from the courses that you guys study. Um, but let's go all the way back then to when you were doing your... A levels or whatever you were doing just before you came to university and you were deciding um, on your course, why was it that you chose your course and what was kind of your process on on figuring out what you wanted to do at university? Uh, Dan, let's start with you on that one. Right, with history, it was a subject that I was just the best at in school. And Kiel's history course uh, has quite a lot of a range. You can you, you start with uh, medieval, but you can also go all the way to modern and the course really appealed to me, the university appealed to me, so I applied to Kiel. Um, Basant, what about you? For me, I kind of always knew I wanted to do medicine. I went on a lot of shadowing experiences and work experiences, and I knew that was the kind of work I want to do in the future and the place I, wanna be, I wanted to be. Uh, and for me, medicine at Kiel was very attractive because it's one of the top three best uh, schools in the UK. And the cohorts are quite small, so our cohort is only 150, which is nothing compared to other schools like Liverpool and uh, Manchester. Awesome. Uh, Kyle? 
Well, uh, Keele was the first university to actually start a criminology degree. Um, so it was like a major point, plus also the campus as well. Nice. And finally, Beth? Uh, so I picked forensics because it was kind of a big mashup of all the subjects I really enjoyed at school. So it's like um, chemistry, biology, has a bit of criminology and psychology bits in there. Um, and then I picked Keele because of the campus, but also because it was the, the top uni in the UK for forensics when I when I applied. Awesome. So a couple of questions coming in, which is great. Keep them coming if you've got anything that you'd like to ask. Um, the first one, um, chip in. I'll, I'll, I'm going to get uh, Bassan. We'll go to you on this one. But if, if anyone else agrees or disagrees, uh, feel free to chip in. Someone has asked, um, is it worth bringing a printer to university? Mm, I'd say for medicine, it definitely is worth it because a lot of us have bought, like in the first year, we would print from the library, but then it's too expensive. So we had to bring our own printers, but in a flat or like in a house, if you live in a house, you can share between your housemates and it's a bit cheaper. So I'd say wait until you see who you're living with, especially in second year, it would be better uh, to just wait and see, and then you can get a printer or all of you together. Nice. Anyone else find they needed or didn't need a printer? Um, there used to be inside the um, SEO at the bottom floor, like some printers. And if you got the app, you could print for free. I'm not sure if oh, it's still there, though. Print, yeah, I think, I think Rob just mentioned it in the previous talk. There's the print shop. Is, is that what you're talking about, Carl? The print uh, shop I'm in the SEO? Sure, there's just some printers downstairs, and you get the app, and you could use that. Cool. Awesome. Um, so yeah, might be, I guess it depends on course as well and how much printing you'll actually need to do. I imagine if you're doing an IT-based course, you probably won't need to do that much printing. Um, anyway, um, I'll give you this one, Beth, as I know you're part of a sport. Stuart has asked, is there a gym? Yes. Yeah, there is a gym. It's in the sports centre. Um, you pay membership, but it's like every other gym, basically. You can pay like monthly or termly or yearly. Um, and you use it by your kill card, so you just kind of scan in, and then you go up. And yeah, it's a nice gym. Nice. It's quite small, but it's got everything you need in it. And we'll go around. So I know that Dan did societies, Beth did a sport. Uh, Basant, you did basketball, didn't you? Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Any any other sports? Uh, no, that was it. <laughs> just basketball, Cal. Yeah. Any sports? Nope. Cool. Um, and yeah, so you both. So, Cal, did you do any societies? Um, I just did a chess and my criminology and uh, sociology society. Cool. We'll stay with sport then. Um, so, Basant, why, why, first of all, why basketball? And what's it like joining a, a Kugel society at Kiel? So, to be honest, I wasn't interested in basketball that much uh, in high school and in college. But then when I came in and I tried, I went to one of the taster sessions. So in fresher weeks, all the societies, all the sports societies, the AU societies, they give you taster sessions. And I went to one of them and basketball. I just like the community. They're very nice and they're very welcoming. And I was a beginner, so I was a bit hesitant, but they're really nice and they take you at your own pace. And it was really fun, to be honest. Uh, I think I joined, yeah, I joined for the whole year. And so every Wednesday we play a match against other universities. And there's also the night out in the SU, which I think is one of the best night outs. Um, so, you, so you did the books league then? So you actually competed with uh, the basketball team, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And so did you, how, how does that work? So you, you travel off, to, did you travel to other universities to compete? Yeah, it depends sometimes. Yeah, most of the time we did travel, but sometimes it's a kill as well. And I guess, how, how was that in terms of fitting that in around your studies? Did you find it fine going off uh, and competing? It was a bit intense, to be honest, that year. Um, sometimes I wouldn't be able to make it because I had a lot of commitments, like study commitments. So I'd have to excuse myself and they were really accepting of that. So I, it kind of worked in the end, but I had to yeah. fit it in. So it's a little bit flexible, which, is, which mm -hmm. sounds good. And then Beth, you didn't, so you did tennis, but you didn't compete in the books league, did you? You just kind of, you would just enjoy tennis, is that right? Or did you do the books league? Yeah, yeah. I did the books league as well. So there's only oh, awesome. one, one women's team in the books league. But yeah, I did that. It was fun. It's really fun doing competing, but obviously most societies do beginner stuff as well. So even if you've never done it before, you can join from beginner level. Is it nice going off and kind of seeing other universities and meeting all the, all the other teams at the universities? Yeah, it's quite fun. It's like, you know, in school when you do like those 
the school games where you go around different schools and like play it's just it's just a fun way of competing like it's there's no pressure it's just it's just fun and it's it's just fun to bond as like a team so like you can make more friends that way and like it's just really nice i would definitely recommend joining at least one society awesome and then yeah moving over to societies so carl you said chess and criminology is that right uh, yeah, Mus uh, degrees himself will have his own like kind of society. Uh, but um, with the chess, I just did it um, for like just first year, and it was every Wednesday, two hours, go have a few games, just a bit of fun, and it was like a pound membership. Nice. So just casual, casual yeah. chess. Yeah, yeah. Had you played chess before? Or did you just were you just interested in it? Uh, no, nah, I didn't really play much. It was just kind of just something for fun, you know. What's your favorite opening, Kyle? Oh, um, I, to be honest, I literally just put my pawn for it. <laughs> <laughs> you could have just said the London or something like that. You could have made yourself sound really, really smart. <laughs> nice. Um, and then, Dan, just remind us again, you did your, your two... Uh... So I did History and uh, Cura, so Kill University Roleplay. And you do a variety of like, tabletop games, but also uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, they really do a variety of things. Another thing is Warhammer as well. They do. They go off campus to a place called Minor Flux in Newcastle. Um, but if, you, if you're into that, I'm, I would. I don't do that. But yeah, it's a variety of things for people who aren't into maybe. If you're not into going out to the SDU as much, you can do um, these. These. It's a very good uh, like community society. And when you would when you'd meet for like Euro and things like that, where where would the, where mm. would those kind of take place on campus? So I think typically they would meet weekly in chancellors uh as well as so if you're doing a dungeons and dragons game you, you sort of have like a sign up and then where everyone signs up to a group and then you'll have your own individual room uh, that you can book in it's usually in chancellors but it might be elsewhere you can even do it off campus if you have a house um but yeah it's uh it's generally in chancellors awesome so yes you all highly recommend getting involved in at least one club or society throughout your time at Kiel. Um, let's move on to accommodation then. Um, and I know, uh, well, Beth, you've done a few accommodation tours in the past. Uh, Dan, you said you lived in the accommodation block that I've never even heard of before today, which was, what was it again? Taylor's House? Uh, Taylor House. Taylor House, that's the one. Uh, Bassant, you lived in Barnes, I want to say? Yeah, yeah that's right. Barnes. And then Kyle, you lived in Hollywood. Oh. Yes. yes. <laughs> so you're all uh, well experienced to be on campus. How many of you moved off campus just by show of hands uh, into the local area? All of you moved off campus into the local area. Awesome. Um, anyone moved back on campus for the final year? None of you. Well, apart from Carl. Nice. Um, how was it applying for accommodation then? Did you um, and what was it like when you arrived in terms of that kind of um, change in lifestyle? Because I'm guessing a lot of you lived at home. Uh, and didn't kind of live self-sufficiently. What was kind of the biggest thing that took you by surprise when you moved into your accommodation block? Let's start with you, Beth. I guess my biggest change was obviously got to cook for yourself. And cooking always seems to take longer than you think it's going to take. Um, so sometimes I wouldn't even eat till like eight o'clock at night just because everything had taken so much longer than I thought it would. So what that was making? a major change. Well, I, I don't know. I like making a lot of curries, which which take a long time. A lot of, like enough. Chinese food is yum. Would you make the sauce as well? Yeah. That is. Well, impressive. I do now. I didn't back then, but I do now. Oh, nice. Uh, Dan, what was the biggest thing for you by surprise? I said the biggest thing was just because I was in a I was in a hall of like twenty people, and we had like one shared kitchen. So just going from like a house or see or four to uh, twenty odd people, it's kind of shocking initially, but it's, it's a good it's a good way because. Um, you can talk to, you know, you get a whole range of people from around the world as well to talk to, and it's you, you bond like pretty quickly. It's a great time. Kyle, um, I suppose yeah, just being away from home, like it was quite a different environment, but I quickly got used to it. It was like really welcoming. Which were you in? Uh, which part of Hallwood were you in, Kyle? Uh, I've lived in Hallwood H and Hallwood P. Nice. Um, so yeah, it's quite quite nice. Like, it's quite nice. Awesome. And then Basant, uh, now you are earlier. You, do you say you're from Egypt as well? Yeah. So you had the extra challenge of uh, having to get your stuff over the over the ocean and, and, and to to the UK. So how was that for you? How was the move? How was the transition? 
Um, it was quite scary. I was pretty anxious to begin with. So I'd say moving away from home, the stuff itself was pretty scary. Um, I wasn't sure if I'd fit in, if I'd, if Kiel was diverse enough, even though I knew it was diverse because I I met a lot of international students on the open day, but still there is that doubt. So I think it was the move itself. Nice. Awesome. Um, but would you, you, you all kind of, I'm guessing accommodation is, is that moment where um, you kind of throw yourself in and it helps you kind of throw yourself in, does it, and, and meet people um, quickly. Because if I guess if you're um, a local and commuting student, you might find that slightly harder than if you're just in halls and you're surrounded by new people around you. Is that, is that how everyone felt? Lots of nods. Yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, and then moving off campus into the local area. So um, <laughs> I guess a lot of people... Uh, we went through this earlier. A lot of people don't actually know where Kiel is to begin with because we are we're named after a town rather than a big city. Um, so, how did you find the local area uh, in terms of when you moved off campus and doing your shop and things like that? So, uh, Basant, we'll start with you on that one. So, I lived in Silverdale and now I've moved to Newcastle under Lyme. So, uh, the nearest town to Kiel is Newcastle under Lyme, and that's about 20 minutes on the bus and the 25 buses that on that same route. So. It's actually quite, you, you get a lot of varieties of things to do in Newcastle under, and under Lyme. <laughs> so you uh, have the shops, so things like Aldi, Tesco's, the big shops, but you also go, get a lot of entertainment. So the cinema, uh, Monkey Forest, a lot of museums, the bowling, all of that. Um, and to be honest, you get a lot of parks around there as well. So you get a nice scenery and greenery if you just want to chill with your friends. So it's quite nice and it's quite close to the campus. Um, so the 25 bus comes every 10 minutes and it takes about 20 minutes. So it's not that bad to commute in the morning. And Dan, moving off campus then, was it was it much different to living on campus, did you find? Uh, well, I was in a house of four, so yeah, it did change quite a bit. Um, but it was it's, it's a very nice change moving uh, from a big block to a small house because you have so much more control over like uh, everything. And it's... Uh, yeah, you, you end up making good friends with your housemates, of course. And I like in terms of being off campus as well. Uh, there's Newcastle House. You know, you can just quickly take a five-minute walk to the, the supermarket and things like that, which are, I, I quite appreciated because um, in terms of buying groceries, it's a bit more choice. Cool. So in terms of then starting your course, and this again might vary depending on what course you're studying. Um, but what would you say are kind of the essential things to bring for, for you to when you first start? So uh, things that you'll need for your studies. Um, what would you recommend having? Beth? Obviously, classic pen and paper. I like I like taking all my notes um, by hand. So I always would take a little notebook and a pencil case with me. Um, a laptop is really helpful. But obviously, if you don't have access to one, there are loads and loads of computers on campus, which you do have access to. Um, those in the library and there's also like a big one in the CSL which is the new labs um, I guess that's the main thing I wouldn't buy any books or anything because um, most of them you don't need and a lot of them are available in the library or online with the with your Kiel account um, and if you need any then the lecturers will tell you which ones you definitely need so kind of wait to wait till you're on campus to get your books or just you'll hear which ones you need ahead of yeah. ahead of arriving Cool, Carl. What did you? Any anything else to add to that? What did you kind of find you needed um, when you arrived? Um, I think I actually fits too much stuff. Uh, I can like <laughs> all my stuff in <laughs> and found a billy in the room. Um, ironing board, iron, um, quite a few hangers because I think there's only a couple when you move in. There's only a couple hangers there. Someone said, actually, you can go to the Great Donate Scheme as well and grab some hangers, which is kind oh. of a hand-me-down system um, where people leaving halls donate their stuff that they don't need anymore to the Great Donate Scheme, and then if you oh. arrive, you can go and get oh, some hangers. Oh, stuff that's on the centre sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. sell glasses and stuff, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a good place, actually, yeah. yeah. Cool. I mean, the question was, Carl, around what you need for your studies, but if an ironing board and an iron is, is for that, then that's, <laughs> that's your thing. You, you go ahead. But there's some other things that you might need as well. Um, love it. Uh so we're coming to the end, really, of the Q&A, really. So we'll wrap it up with um, just a couple more questions. Um, we'll start with what's the most memorable thing that you've done at university so far? It doesn't have to be to do with your course. could be to do with something extracurricular or just something that will stay with you forever. So that you obviously can stay on stream that won't get us into any hot water. But what's the most memorable thing that you've done during your time at Kiel? Dan, we'll start with you. 
I would say the most memorable thing was uh, really just like freshers that uh, that whole period because you're doing a whole bunch of new things, you're meeting a whole lot of new people, so it sort of sticks in your mind. You remember it very well, and it's obviously a lot of fun um, before like the exam season starts. So it's quite it's, yeah, freshers and um, first awesome. or second year. Kyle, what about you? Uh, I'd say probably finishing. Um, I feel like um, there's quite a lot of work towards the end. Uh, I feel quite accomplished to have finished. So that fight that what, at the end of each year or at the, at the end, end of the year? It's like uh, the end is like the final year. Nice. Uh, Bassant? Uh, I'd say placement because last year I did get involved in in quite a bit of surgeries and I helped deliver a baby so that was definitely the most memorable thing wow sorry that's the best so far guys you've, mm. you've, you've been I know that's there. amazing uh, Beth though. <laughs> mine's so boring compared to that I was going to be you really you set fire to stuff it's really say, cool <laughs> that was really fun but I was going to say like um, all the friends I've made but especially my housemates and stuff because we've made so many great memories together and we actually met up a couple of weeks ago because um, most of them have graduated now there's only two of us left um, so it's just been really nice to spend time with people that I would never have met otherwise. Awesome. Um, and then finally, um, so I know Dan, you've obviously graduated, and a few of you are getting towards the end of your of your time at Keel. Um, what do you hope to go on to next? So what what's kind of your your plans um, post Keel? What's what's uh, what have you got lined up? Dan, we'll go with you, seeing as you have you've technically graduated. Uh, I'm quite interested in uh, book publishing uh, and editorial types of jobs. So that's what I've been applying for and uh, hope I can get a career in that. Nice. Uh, Basant, because you've kind of got quite a de- direct route into what you'll be going into, but is there any area in particular in, in medicine that you want to go into? Um, I was thinking paediatrics, but I haven't really made my mind up and still keeping my options open because I've still got two years to go. Nice. Uh, Kyle? Uh, the plan is to join the Navy. Join the Navy. I think I remember that. You've said that before. So, yeah, nice. Beth? Um, I guess my main plan is I want to go into the forensic side of the police or into lab work. And then maybe in a few years after that, I want to lecture. Nice. So, what, master's PhD route? Yeah, well, PhD? I'm doing my master's. So, that's, I think, all I need to, to lecture, but then possibly do a PhD on the side Azure, of lecturing. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Um, and again, just before we go, I know I asked Beth and Dan this before, um, so you can recap your answers quickly before we then uh, pass it over to Basson and Kyle. But there will be some people watching who are starting in September, so just like a month's time. Um, what would you say is your top tip to get the most out of your um, your time at Kiel in those first two weeks uh, as you arrive? So Beth, I can't remember what you said on the, on the end of the campus tour. Um, I basically just said to throw yourself into it. Don't be scared about meeting people or making friends because you'll do that automatically in societies or in your halls and stuff. Uh, one tip for moving day is to bring like a doorstop or something that will hold your door open because then that means when everybody else is kind of wandering past with their boxes and bags, you can kind of say a quick hello and it, it makes it a bit less awkward when you're going to actually properly say hello and start meeting people. Nice. Dan, just recap yours again from the campus tour. Uh, I think I said uh, fresh as fur. Uh, it's a great opportunity to obviously join all the societies and uh, sort of taste all the different things that are available at Kiel. Nice. Kyle, top tips for starting? Uh, I'd, I'd say similar to Dan, but also say um, looking to become an ambassador as well, because obviously there's so many jobs they can do, they get you out of there so much. Nice. And then Bassant? I'd say put yourself out there, just like that said. Everyone is in the same boat, so don't be scared to just say hello to want to introduce yourself awesome well thank you all it's been a pleasure uh thank you very much for joining us for a quick q a there at the end um you've been a pleasure and thank you again to uh those who did tours earlier on and q a's earlier on i uh, appreciate it and hope those watching found it useful uh, you're free to go thanks again for your uh lovely knowledge of, of how to how to get the most out of your time at keel so we'll see you all later on bye guys bye bye so that is it. We've come to the end of our virtual open day here at Kiel. Thank you so much uh, for sticking around and watching. And we hope you found it as useful as possible and hope it was 
almost like being there in person yourself. And just to say that if you can do so, uh, campus is open. Um, so if you wanted to visit and have a walk around the outside areas of campus, you are free to do that. We have been off offering some um, some campus tours. They're currently all, uh, they finished tomorrow and are fully booked at the moment. But if we do offer any more, we'll be sure to email you and let you know about those. But fingers crossed, our next open day, fingers crossed, will be in person. And it won't be me sat in my home, um, which will be sad. But also very exciting that you'll be able to come back to campus uh, and actually have a look around in person as well. So fingers crossed that our next open day will be on campus in person. So keep an eye out on keel.ac.uk forward slash open days. Uh, and we might be back to our full open day very, very soon. Um, other than that, I'm just going to recap some of the stuff that you can make use of uh, beyond today. Um, so keep, keep a hold of that applicant hub page. Um, it's still very, very useful. Um, because it will house all of the information on there. So if you scroll down, you can rewatch that welcome talk from our Vice Chancellor, Professor Trevor McMillan. And then you can also have a look at the general information talks and the virtual tour as well. Just to say on the live activity side of things, so the streams that we've done today, as soon as we end them at 4 p.m., they'll still be available to go back and rewatch on both Facebook and YouTube, and they'll stay publicly available uh, for around about 30 days. They'll also be available to link through from the Applicant Hub page as well. So feel free to watch any um, of those sections back from earlier today in your own time. The talks from ac the academic talks and the subject talks will be live soon. It will just take a few days to process those and get them back on the website. So towards the end of next week, uh, sort of Thursday, Friday, hopefully before uh, they should be live on the applicant hub page to rewatch as well. So everything should be on demand uh, and you can go back and have another watch of it. General information talks, again, make use of these whenever you can. Um, there's just loads of good information around accommodation, careers and employability. Lots of areas from across the university uh, and teams have put all these on-demand talks together that you can go and watch. So, for example, if I go into accommodation, the student accommodation team have done a video there that I can just watch and find more in-depth uh, knowledge about our accommodation at Kiel there through that on-demand talk. And then... Uh, You've got our virtual tour, which is virtualtour.keel.ac.uk. Uh, here it is. It's split into four areas, our academic expertise and Keel investments, Keel campus and student life, our accommodation, and then also our facilities as well. So let's go and have a look at, I've never actually looked at this one. So we have a look on here and basically this is just built of videos, 360s, photographs, lots of different um, information around uh, all of the things related to the campus and the and the teaching so i'm here on our academic expertise and investments so for example i can have a look at things like the smart energy network demonstrator um, which is one of our sustainability research projects um, which is really really cool and i can find out more about that and have a look at some more of the the images as well that's the virtual tour virtual tour.keel.ac.uk um, and that's how you can have a look around there but again, the most valuable thing, in my opinion, is keel.ac.uk forward slash chat. And that is our Unibuddy page, which is here. Uh, and it's where you can chat to staff and students one to one as well. So pop in your level of study and whatever the area of study you're interested in. Let's go for medicine. See if we can find the song. There we go. And I can chat to uh, two of our students from medicine there as well. Um, so anything to do with that course or even just life at Kiel as well, you can drop them a message and they'll be happy to answer it. You've also got staff uh, in the same sort of scenario. So you can have a look for some staff and who knows, you might actually end up talking to the lecturer or a member of teaching staff who ends up teaching you if you do end up coming to Kiel. Um, so really, really useful page there as well. And there's also blogs that are written by students on a whole host of topics from uh, revising to finding accommodation to the best study spaces on campus. Just some really, really useful uh, blogs there from current students. But that is it. That is everything. So everything you're up to speed with uh, to get, make the most out of a virtual open day. Again, I hope you've enjoyed um, what we've put together today and uh, hopefully maybe I won't you won't this won't be in this format anymore we'll hopefully be back in person which is very exciting um as much as I've, I've enjoyed doing these uh and it's been a pleasure to host them hopefully we'll be back on campus with the next few uh, and you can have a proper look around uh in your own time uh so thank you to everyone behind the scenes as well to all the the um the students and staff who've, who've made this happen today it's been an absolute pleasure showing you around and again any questions members of staff across the university and students are always happy to help so that's it 
hope to see you on campus either this September or next September. And it's been an absolute pleasure. And I'll see you again soon. Bye.